This is Jocko Podcast number 298 with Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. Within weeks of their arrival, the seals of debt gulf were shaking off their initial jitters and even displaying some measure of proficiency. Signs of this were apparent in every aspect of their operations. On ambush, no one cleared his throat, coughed, spit, sneezed, or even sniffled. On insert and extract, the men stepped heel to toe to reduce the sucking explosion of mud walking, and above all, avoided the footprints of the man in front to keep from sinking even deeper. To improve their infield support, the SEALs befriended the pilots and crews of the Navy's helicopter squadron at Na Bay and overhauled the SEALs' denuded landing craft into an up-armored ironclad. Six heavy machine guns mounted to the gunnels, a 60-millimeter mortar bolted to the rusted deck plate, and a bunker-busting recoilless rifle pinioned to the top of the sandbag pilot house. It was so much armament that the men quickly recommissioned the LCM, the Mighty Mo. To it, they added a canopy to block the sun and rain, a two-burner stove for meals, then draped hammocks between everything that didn't pivot or fire. Essentially turned it into a houseboat littered with empty hot sauce, bottles, coffee cups, clotheslines, all aids to reduce the number of trips back to Na Bay and increase the amount of time they could spend in the mission area. To improve the quality of their encounters with the enemy, they experimented with a variety of tactics, false insertions that made the Viet Cong think the SEALs had landed where they hadn't, false extractions that made the Viet Cong think the SEALs had left, and probably most important, squad-sized missions that half the SEALs punch, but correspondingly increased their stealth and the amount of swampland they could cover, thus doubling their chances of Viet Cong contact. No small challenge in an area as empty of the enemy as the rung sat. And what did these innovations yield? A handful of captured documents and North Vietnamese currency, some freshwater wells, some rice caches, one so monstrous that it merited an airstrike. Then finally, after more than a month of frustrations, Det Gulf landed a jackpot ambush of two sampans that killed seven suspected Viet Cong guerrillas. The SEAL's reaction was the same as anyone who has just caught a hot streak. A little more than a week after their first coup, One squad pursued a tip from the crew of a hovering Navy gunship that had spotted several camouflage sampans not far from Mighty Moe's anchorage. Despite having already blown their cover in that area from several days worth of patrolling, the squad leader in full daylight, the squad landed in full daylight and fell in behind point man Billy Macon, a keen-eyed 28-year-old Texan, the father of a daughter and a five-week old boy he had never seen. Stepping alone into the middle of the sun-drenched clearing and spotting a Viet Cong bunker, Macon managed a single burst from his M16 before he was cut down by an eruption of machine gun fire that left him stranded. Hugging the ground to get under the rush of snapping bullets and splintering branches, the SEALs fell back on their training and clawed themselves into a rough firing line but one that was not nearly stiff enough to break the wall of lead that blocked their way to the fallen comrade. To Tom Truxell, engaged in the untested platoon commander's perennial two-front war, the enemy and his own doubts, it seemed that the only recourse might be to pull back to the river and to the mighty Moe's guns. That is, until one of his men fired a 40-millimeter grenade into the bunker's mouth. The shock forced a momentary flinch in the enemy's ambush, just long enough for the heavyweight Moscone to bowl a mad dash for Macon, who was carried to safety just in time to whisper a final message to his wife while the corpsman ransacked his tiger stripes to find his wounds. Considering that Macon's death was considering that Macon's death in combat was not simply the first for the SEAL teams, but that it was Also, nearly a 2% manpower loss for SEAL Team 1. No one would have faulted wires if he had forced a pause to assess the operation that had led to the tragedy. He didn't. The reason was no more complicated than the same one taught to anyone who has ever looked up to see the belly of the horse that just bucked them off. Wires ordered his men back back into their saddles and back into the rung sat. 
this perseverance would have payoffs. Within a month, the seals of Debt Gulf were expanding their operational repertoire from planned patrol and ambush to unplanned quick reaction counterattacks along the Rung Sat's choke points. In theory, it was an operational expansion that finally fulfilled the Bucklew Report's recommendation for Riverbank Raiders. In practice, it was a re- resurrection of the Navy's grapple swinging boarding parties. Encounters now included the inland pursuit and cornering of black pajama wearing attackers, firefights that varied from a few sharp rifle exchanges to 15 minute skirmishes. One of these against an enemy packed haystack that did not stop firing until the SEALs launched 48 grenades into it. Before long, the operational impact of Det Gulf's aggressiveness was considered so substantial that Admiral Ward approved its increase from two platoons to three, all but a guarantee of a corresponding increase in impact. While this blossomed, so too did the SEALs' confidence best evidenced by their swagger around Na Bay, but also by a wooden sign above the entrance to their tent, scrawled, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, because I'm the meanest bastard in the valley. Though the helmets and flak jackets of the un- of uncountable GIs would soon boast the same thing, by mid-autumn 1966, the SEAL's claim to meanest in the valley was undisputed. In the rung sat, no other unit was as lethal. And that right there is an excerpt from a book. And the book is called By the Water Beneath the Walls. The Rise of the Navy SEALs. And it's written by a guy Benjamin Milligan and this book is a comprehensive history book about the origin of the SEAL teams now that passage hit me because I trained throughout my entire career at a place called Camp Billy Macon out in the Imperial Valley of Southern California and I knew the story of Billy Macon he was awarded the Silver Star and they have that citation out there at the desert training compound they also have pictures of his platoon and BTF Tony Tony Afratti and I we used to inspect those pictures and we used to look at BM1 Moscone and he was listed in that platoon picture we used to talk about him and he was this massive guy we stood out in the picture and we used to think what would what would BM1 Moscone do right now in this situation but that really is about all the information we had about Billy Macon and his platoon and what they did in Vietnam. Some word of mouth stories that we'd hear from some of the older Vietnam guys, but that's about it. But this book spells it out so much more, and the book details the entire history of the SEAL teams, from the scouts and raiders to the naval combat demolition units to the underwater demolition teams, up to what we now know and where I served my adult life in the SEAL teams. Now, I normally don't cover history books on the podcast because I prefer to read first-person accounts of people that were actually there, people that understand what it's like to live through and experience things, not just research it. Well, this book is an exception because the author, Ben Milligan, was a SEAL, which adds a level of understanding and connection that comes across on every page of this book. It is also so thorough and extensive of history of the SEALs that it leaves no stone unturned and connects really to the soul of the modern day SEAL, connects us with our frogmen, forefathers, and I think this book should be required reading for all all seals or anyone even remotely interested in the seals so they understand where we came from and the sacrifices that were made to get us where we are today and it just so happens that we have the honor of the author Ben Milligan here tonight to talk to us about his time in the teams 
and his amazing account of the history of the Frogmen. Ben, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Jocko. Uh, let's get a little. Start off by getting a little background on you and where you came from. Before we get into the background and where the seals came from, let's figure out about where Ben Milligan came from. So, so where'd you grow up? Indianapolis, northeast side. And and what was the uh, situation you or both your mom and dad do? Uh, my dad was an ear, nose, and throat uh, surgeon. Uh, worked in a small uh, town in uh, Indiana uh, called uh, Anderson. Uh, it was a small uh, uh, a GM town. Uh, I think he was the only. It was him and uh, one other uh, ENT in town. So he was kind of like uh, minor celebrity status. <laughs> uh, there wasn't a restaurant that we would go to in town where. Um, you know, somebody didn't come up and say, hey, Doc, thanks for, you know, such and such. Hey, Doc, I got a sore nose. Can you help me out? <laughs> yeah. And at one point, I think every uh, single member in my family, except for my younger brother, worked uh, in my dad's office. So we kind of grew up, uh, you know, in the in the medical field. Welcome to welcome to Doc Milligan's. Can you have a seat <laughs> over there? Would you like a candy? That kind of thing? Yeah, kind of. <laughs> I was probably the, uh, uh, the worst of my dad's employees, but he was kind enough to keep me on. The worst example of nepotism. <laughs> what um? What about your mom? Did she did she work? Was she a house, uh, housewife? Or? Yeah, housewife. She uh, she looked after us. She was so three boys and uh, and one girl. So uh, fair amount of work. What number were you? I was in the middle. So I have an older brother, a younger brother, and then baby sister. Okay, so you're number two out of four. Right. What about uh? What sports were you were you playing growing up? Uh. I played soccer uh, badly. Uh, I, they, I think they kept me on the team because we, are, the, the school that I went to was so small. They, uh, they really had nobody else. Uh, yeah, but I, I, I didn't, uh, I didn't get to the SEAL teams through any athletic ability. I was a really good trier. <laughs> so after, uh, at the end of every uh, uh, soccer season, uh, when they passed out awards, they would always give me like the Mister Hustle or, <laughs> or the Most Improved or some other, you know, just sort of, uh, you know, underhand award. <laughs> what was the anything else going on in high school? What kind of music did you like? Well, I yeah, I, did, I ran track, so I was I was a decent uh, decent at track. But as far as music, uh, uh, typical stuff. Nothing. Uh, I, nothing crazy. Nothing crazy. Nothing hip. You're looking at the you know, like. Uh, the lamest guy that ever got through buds. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah. When you so you said you ran track or you ran cross country or both? I kind of did a little both. I, I did uh, uh, cross country uh, my freshman year. What's the longest race you run in cross country in high school? Isn't it? And it's only it's like three, three miles or something. Some, yeah, it's nothing. Nothing overwhelming. And I was pr- I was good at it. I, I probably could have <clears> done that. Uh, I but after my freshman year, how fast year, can you run a mile when you were in high school? Oh, uh, I think the fastest I did it was something like four fifty. 448 something like that but the only reason I, I I'm I think that was as good as I was ever gonna get I didn't uh, when I when I raced uh, after every race it was I mean I uh, the dry heaving everything else I couldn't I would get so nervous before the race that I couldn't I couldn't eat I, I wouldn't sleep the night before it was miserable what were you nervous about oh, I was just brutal was pain because I didn't have the natural talent to do this so I just gutted it out um, so you were nervous about the suffering you were going to experience. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Which made you suffer w- even more. Jocko, I wish I was tougher. <laughs> 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 and so the, what, 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 did you have any inkling about going in the military when you were in high school? Yeah, I, I, I knew that that was, I was going to do that. I, uh, I think I, I announced to my parents that I wanted to be a SEAL when I was 12. They didn't know what a SEAL was. How did you know what a SEAL was? Uh, I'd heard my older brother's friends talking about it, and uh, uh, prior to that, my grandpa had been a, a Marine in World War II, so growing up until I was about 12, I'd wanted to be a Marine. Uh, then I found out what uh, Navy SEALs were, and then I, I also uh, it sort of found out right at the same time that uh, after the Battle of Okinawa, my grandpa had volunteered. He was one of the few guys that could swim, and they were so desperate for uh, frogmen after Okinawa for the invasion of Japan that they had ransacked the ranks just looking for anybody that could swim, and he had volunteered for the UDT. So he was one of the handful of uh, uh, non-Navy guys that actually uh, joined. So he didn't do any operations as a frogman, but he uh, he was uh, attached to a UDT. So so you found that out, but... Found that, that out, and, and I was like, well, you know, uh, uh, impressionable age, and like, I, 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 I'm, I'm going to do that, so... What was your comfort level in the water? 
high comfort level. Uh, he was, um, my grandpa was, uh, um, I think we, uh, we were at the pool every, every weekend. Uh, swimming was a big part of our, our, our growing up. And then, so very comfortable, but I'd never raced in the water. Never, I'd never swam competitively. Like I said before, the school that I went to was so small. I think I had 54 kids in my graduating class. I mean, I played soccer because there was no football team. Mm-hmm. I ran track because we didn't have a wrestling team or anything like that. Had we had those, I probably would have done them, but, um, I did what I could. Uh, but when I got to buds, I, you know, uh, realized, uh, after Hell Week that I was easily the slowest swimmer that had made it through Hell Week. <laughs> like, I just didn't know what the hell I was doing. <laughs> so when, but you didn't you go to college after I did. you were done with high school? And yeah. where'd you go to college? Purdue. Purdue studied history. Is that what you knew you wanted to do? Did you did you did you always have like an affinity for history? Always, yeah. Uh, starting, uh, you know, my dad was always uh, reading to us. My grandpa was always reading to us. Uh, we would. Um, as a family, we would take trips, and often we were hitting a battlefield along the way. When I uh, hit junior high, though, right at that you know uh, consequential point in my life, my grandpa uh, every uh, every fall, every fall break, he started taking me to a different uh, a cup for you know the the long weekend. He would take me to a different Civil War battlefield or some other you know Revolutionary War battlefield. So I just kind of got uh, I just got addicted. Mm-hmm. So. It was just, I, I got caught his enthusiasm, I guess. So when you were going to college, were you actually learning and putting, at, see, when I went to college, I was just doing what I was told to do. I mean, I went, yeah. I was already in the Navy when I went to college, but I was just doing whatever I needed to do to get good <laughs> grades. I didn't care about anything. I just was doing what I needed to do to get good grades. I wasn't like, oh, this is so interesting. I, I don't think I said that one single time. Well, I was just like, do I need to memorize this? Cool, give it to me. That was my attitude. But it seems like you might have had a different attitude. No, no. I uh, If you uh, at least were trying to get good grades, you're better than me because I didn't care about that either. <laughs> Well, so I, I mean, I, you were just trying to pass. Well, my, so I had tried to enlist, uh, in, in the Navy, uh, my senior year of, uh, high school. I hadn't shown up, uh, after a soccer practice back home and I had gone directly from, uh, practice to, uh, the recruiter's office and I was getting ready to sign on the dotted line because I didn't want to go to college. I wanted to go right into the Navy. And, uh, uh, the recruiter to his credit, he, um, uh, stops me before I sign and he, you know, he points, you know, obviously behind me and he, he goes, do you know that woman? I turn around and my mom has both hands on the window and she saw it. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I took a pause, we went out in the parking lot, my mom and I had a conversation uh, and she begged me not to join the, the military. Nobody joined the military in our family since, you know, World War II. So when I got out there, I said I would go to one year of college uh, and after, if I did that one year of college, I would have their blessing. So when I signed up for classes my first year, I had no, I, I, I had no plan. I just <laughs> signed up for every class that looked interesting. I signed up for the history of World War II. I signed up for, uh, I, I mean, I, I, I just, I had no, I just signed up for all these history classes, and I went to the first one. I was hooked. And so you did kind of like your classes. I liked my history classes. Those were the only uh, classes that I paid any attention to, but I loved them. And I, I had I had great uh, professors, uh, the history and political science classes. So there, there's really no uh, military history classes or uh, courses or uh, left in the country. There's only a couple of institutions that do military history. Um, uh, so they've they've taken a lot of that military uh, history curriculum and they've kind of uh, farmed it out to different disciplines, p- political science being one of them. Um, and so I would, you know, just look for all these interesting classes, all the stuff that, you know, I was interested in. Um, I managed to carve out a degree and when I graduated in, you know, 2000, I, I, I don't, somehow I managed to graduate in four years. Um, I, then I, I tried to go to OCS. Uh, I had no idea what I was doing. I, I'd never met another SEAL. My application to go to OCS and then get uh, a, a BUDS contract afterwards was ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, they asked, you know, on the application, uh, now I know, you know, you need like an admiral or somebody to write a letter of rec- recommendation. To have my, your buddy Fred. <laughs> I had my high school soccer coach. <laughs> my application was pathetic. <laughs> Especially, that was in 2000? Yeah, it was in oh, 2000. Oh, yeah, in 2000. The competition for the officer billets is in insane insane it's insane so i just enlisted and the freaking soccer coach just didn't cut it (laughs) (laughs) such a bummer 
<laughs> it was a very nice letter. <laughs> so, so then you just said, "Cool, I'm enlisting." Yeah. Then wh- and my parents did you know? Mom, did your mom break down again? <laughs> you know, my parents were on a trip uh, when when this happened. Oh, uh, dude, when, when she's gone. Good yeah. Call. My, well, my, my <laughs> yeah, my parents were gone. Um, they knew how important this was to me. Uh, they knew that I really didn't have a plan afterwards. It's not like I'd, you know, been in some sort of apprenticeship to you know go to law school or anything like that. I wasn't prepared for anything. So uh, when that when I hit that roadblock, I called my parents. They were you know like I said they weren't there. I talked to my dad, and uh, my dad, to his credit, just said, "This is something you have to do." And so I went over and went to the uh, uh, enlisted recruiter, and I signed that day. And two weeks, uh, two weeks later, I was gone. That's freaking legit. And what year was that? Two thousand. So I, I signed up in uh, uh, early August of two thousand. I was gone by the end of the month. That was two thousand, right? Okay, so you show up in boot camp, mm-hmm. and you have that shock to your system. Did you say to yourself, "What did I do? Oh, My yeah. mom was right." Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I was a college graduate. <laughs> like, what the hell am I doing here? <laughs> yeah, but uh, folding underwear. Yeah, I, I mean, I I didn't have the worst boot camp experience. They uh, um, early on, they had you know uh, asked for if anybody here had. Uh, college experience and I had raised my hand so I got made the the division yeoman so I was able to kind of leave from time to time <laughs> carrying the mailbag and just carrying the mailbag for 45 minutes I would just march around the base <laughs> just, yeah so you get to what was your uh like pre-training getting ready for buds did you do anything or were you just hey whatever yeah I've been uh I've been following the um uh, the buds uh, pre or the pre buds training uh, uh, plan, uh, I, you know, certain number of pull ups, sit ups, uh, push ups, everything, and then running and swimming every day. So you felt like you were in pretty good shape. No, I, d- I, I didn't. <laughs> I I thought I was in okay shape, uh, and I'd been doing it for a year. And uh, um, so about four months before I actually uh, uh, joined the Navy, I had uh, linked up with the. Uh, the Purdue ROTC guys uh, that were all training to go to Buds. And when I linked up with them, their training was on a, a completely other level. These guys were serious. They had, you know, they'd met SEALs before. I'd never met met one. And <laughs> so I did four months of uh, uh, training with them. I, I, I mean, they, these guys were all in ROTC. I had a ponytail, I had a beard. I just, I was just a, looked like a piece of shit. <laughs> so when I showed up, they were like, who the hell is this guy? <laughs> you had a ponytail and a beard? What year was this? Two thousand. Yeah, it was. Oh, uh, yeah, nineteen ninety nine. Uh, but what was funny is uh, a year later, when I graduated Buds, uh, two of these guys were show we were checking into Buds the day I graduated. Oh, that's cool. And I burst into their room uh, to say hi, and they had no idea who I was. Did they make it? They all made it. Yeah, that's awesome. Do, was uh, any challenges in Buds? Anything that gave you a struggle? Uh, swimming. Uh, yeah, I had to. Uh, um, I, I expected that uh, swimming would would be just like it was, uh, like running was for me. Like you'd start uh, like running for for me if I was going to do a long run, go out at a moderate pace. That moderate pace, the further you go, would get harder to to maintain. And then by the end of the race, uh, you know you're you're uh, physically taxed, but you can you know gut through the the last bit of pain. I swam like that. I swam at a moderate pace, and by the end of it, I was I was pretty well gassed, um, and it wasn't enough. So I started going every weekend in buds. I was uh, linking up with uh, uh, Master Chief Nepper, uh, who I didn't know at the time. I mean, I just knew that he was you know a guy that would you know take pity on all the shitty bud swimmers. <laughs> and uh, so when everybody else was relaxing and kind of uh, you know licking their wounds from the previous week, I was at the pool with Master Chief Nepper, and I would not be here. Uh, or I would never have made it through if it wasn't for his classes. And uh, I mean, little did I know that, you know, he was, uh, I mean, he's, you know, one of the oracles of uh, SEAL history to for this sure. day. So, so you, gra- when did you graduate from Buds? Um, let's see, it was August of uh, 2000, yeah, August 10th. I, my, my 20th year was, or uh, 2001, 2001. 2001, yeah. Yeah, so you graduated August 2001. And then where'd you get stationed? 
Uh, I was supposed to go to SEAL Team 10, but I went to SEAL Team 4, East Coast. Just some paperwork mix-up or something? Yeah, the whole, half of our class was going to SEAL Team 5, and the other half was going to SEAL Team 10. And for whatever reason, SEAL Team 10 hadn't quite stood up yet, so they switched us to Team 4. So you... So where are you in September? So you graduate in August of 2001. Where are you? Where where are you actually standing when you when September 11th goes down? I was home having just completed uh, Airborne. <clears throat> so I I mean like everybody else in my class I'm I, I immediately went uh, went downstairs packed my bag and was ready to go and no call came. Thought you were going to Nam like I did. We all did. Man, yeah. I thought I was going to Nam in 1990 we when were, I got in. Man, we were going nowhere but disappointment. <laughs> so you're at SEAL Team Four. You, you you get into a platoon. What job you What job were you in the platoon? Uh, I was the a 60 gunner. It's pig Which, gunner. Pig gunner. Yeah. Freaking new guy. Yep, new guy. No, uh, no responsibility. Uh, <laughs> I was the uh, I was the intel rep of the platoon. Oh, um, yeah, that's right. They were like, "Oh, you went to college. Yeah, you, you can read." Right, <laughs> intel rep post. <laughs> right. <laughs> what kind of platoon? So, so you're at Team Four. You get into a platoon. How so, is it? How's it work up? You having a good it time? Was, it was all right. I like you know the there were some leadership challenges, but uh, it was a good platoon. I mean, we had a good chief. We had a good OIC. Um, we uh, we didn't have a great mission. We were uh, we were a marg, so we got attached to a. Uh, you know, a, a marine, um, what was it, an LPD or mm-hmm. LHA or something like that, and we were just sort of on call in the med. Um, you know, and but at that point, you know, both uh, uh, Afghanistan and Iraq were going on. It was just, you know, we were sitting sitting out in the in the med, just floating around. We didn't do anything until we we got called to go do Liberia. It was the uh, the Liberian Civil War, so we did mm-hmm. some hydrographic reconnaissances and stuff like that. You but got your lead line and slayed out. I did. Right on. I did, and I was. Uh, so we had done uh, probably half a dozen of these things, um, and then the the last one that we were doing was uh, directly in front of the um, uh, the U.S. Embassy in Monrovia, mm-hmm. and um, I was probably the closest swimmer to the beach, which meant I was the closest swimmer to the CNN cameras. <laughs> uh, they were out there. And if anybody knew my, my history with swimming, it probably would have pushed me further back. Uh, but so I'm, you know, paralleling the beach as we're doing this. And I know that, you know, the whole world is watching. And at some point I got wrapped up in my lead line. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh. And I'm tied up in this thing. I can't swim. The It's a really close shore break. So I'm getting hammered with waves. <laughs> I bounce my head off a big rock. I'm like, I've got to get out of this line. So I pull out my knife and I start cutting this thing. The wave <laughs> is coming up on me and I'm getting ready to get slammed with this thing and I don't want to stab myself while I'm doing this. And so I look around, I got no, I, I'm holding the, uh, the slate with one hand, I got the knife in the other and I need something to swim with. So I did the only thing I could do. I put my knife in my mouth and I started, and I swam through the stroke. like. How World War Two frogman is this? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's friggin' awesome! So you you get done with that deployment. That was kind of the highlight of the deployment. Was doing hydrographic reconnaissance in Liberia. Well, I'm, I don't want to brag, but yeah, yeah it's freaking <laughs> legit. <laughs> uh, hey, I did two ARG platoons out on the West Coast, and I've done so many <laughs> hydrographic reconnaissances. It's ridiculous, but. I guess I've never done like a, um, I did real ones, but they weren't in combat. They were like in Kuwait. We, it was real, like someone was right. gonna land there. I mean, but didn't get, I never put my mouth in my, I made my knife in my teeth and it, swam it, out. But I think you could probably agree it's not the reason you joined the SEAL teams. Not quite why I joined the SEAL teams. And that must be, so what'd you do after that? Uh, I had some, you know, sort of family challenges, so I uh, briefly got out until figured out where I was going to be living. Uh, when I finally found out I was going to be living in San Diego, uh, I uh, put my uh, uh, OCS package back together. I, mm. I really wanted to go uh, back to the teams and be an officer. Soccer coach, write you another letter of recommendation. <laughs> <laughs> I actually had a few <laughs> decent letters, and I was, uh, I had just gotten to San Diego. I I'd, I, I contracted uh, mm. in my, you know, during that year off, so I Blackwater Triple Canopy. Um, uh, but Wh- once where'd we, you go? Iraq. Iraq. Yeah. 
And what were you doing, just PSD, basically? PSD, yeah. Uh, but once we got into San Diego, um, I... Uh, like where where that, where were you in uh, where were in Iraq were you in what years? Uh, well, that was uh, two thousand four, uh, two thousand four, two thousand five. Okay. I mean, I, I was I guess it was two thousand five. I was back in the teams by two thousand six. So, what's PSD? Personal security detail. Yeah, gotcha. it's like doing security for yeah. somebody. So gotcha. that's what a lot of the contractors were doing. You're doing security for other government workers they, those government workers could be people working on telephone lines they could be cia people mm -hmm. they could be government people but it's basically security gotcha so that's what many of those contracting jobs were for guys that were in special operations just doing security gotcha um so you how long were you out for then uh, a year then you come back in Wait, what happened with your OCS package? So I, my OCS package was, uh, I really just needed my last uh, letter of recommendation. So I was in the uh, uh, the Group 1 commander's office for my for my interview. Uh, he was kind enough to, to give me an interview. And I had been getting ready for that interview for a while. And uh, the morning of the interview, I was uh, uh, contacted by SEAL Team 18 and said I was recalled. <laughs> so I was like, well, it's not the end of the world, but let's see if I can get this, you know, uh, OCS package signed off on. So, just so everyone knows, SEAL Team 18 is a reserve SEAL team. Correct. Where if you're in the, re if you get out of those teams and you want to stay connected, you can go in the reserves, and yeah. that's what that is. So you got recalled. How many teams are there? Oh, like all together? Well, there's eight SEAL teams. Uh, there were eight SEAL teams at the time, four on each coast, and then there's Dev Group. But then, uh, in addition to the uh, eight active duty teams plus Dev Group, there's there were two reserve SEAL teams. It was sort of a new concept they, they were trying. So they got eight teams. Plus two reserve teams. So 10 and then dev group 11. Yeah, I guess. Essentially. Way to, yeah, yeah. yeah, kind there's of. A, there's some other things, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, cause, so when you say team, that's like a technical thing. like Yeah, because you got SDV teams too. Right. Which, right. which are also teams. Gotcha. But the numbers though, because that's. Well, you got. SDV team one and SDV team two, right. so you got another two teams. All right, this goes <laughs> deep. You, you, so can't, you can't leave I, the SDVs out. I understand. The boys are working hard. They're yes, working sir. hard. Um, so I, I'm in the office. I'm, uh, I, you know, I, I, I knew that, you know, I, I'd found out that morning I was getting recalled, but was still hoping that, you know, the, uh, the captain could uh, maybe figure something out. So I do the interview. Interview goes great, I think. And uh, he's like, do you have anything for me? And I said, well, sir, um, not for nothing, but I just got recalled this morning. Uh, I was just wondering if there's anything you could do. You know, I'd really like to, you know, follow through on this OCS package and come back to the teams as an officer. And he just said, no, that sucks. <laughs> <laughs> so I found myself back in the teams. But, you know, it was the best thing that could have ever happened. I went to SEAL Team 5 and uh, jumped on a great platoon with great leadership and, you know, uh, we we followed you. Yeah, you guys relieved us. Not Correct. my task unit, but you guys went to Hobby, Habania. Yeah. Yep. So you rolled out to Habania, and you were a reservist that was activated? Yep. And they put you in a platoon? Yep. Well, that's freaking awesome. It was, yeah, it was great. Did you do any of the workup or anything? Yeah. So you did the workup, went on deployment, but you're a reservist, but you're in a platoon? Yeah. What was your job? Uh, RTO. Or uh, the radio telephone op. I was the comm guy. Did a little bit of breaching, but then you know, kind of taught myself how to be a JTAC. But that's an interesting thing to try and teach yourself while you're on the ground in hobby. And not only that, but you know, they, you know, I knew that the platoon uh, needed a comm guy. I've been to comm school, never been a comm guy, but they asked if I was a comm guy, and I said, "Yes, I'm the best comm guy." <laughs> I just taught myself how to do it. So it's <laughs> a good call. Yeah. <laughs> how was that deployment? Uh, it was great. What were you guys doing hobby in 06, 07? That was like the winter of 06 into 07, right? Correct. What, what, kind, what was your missions? What were you guys doing? We were doing a lot of, uh, you know, sniper overwatches and then uh, just doing, you know, going house after house, you know, uh, doing little uh, little house to house raids looking for Al Qaeda, just like you guys were. Yeah. So you're kind of living the dream. I was living, I was doing exactly what I thought I would be doing in, when I enlisted in 2000. So <laughs> it was, yeah. Yeah, that's good. I, I I always felt that way when I was in Iraq. I felt like I was so lucky to be where I was. And then I will say in Ramadi, it was a little next level because, you oh, know, yeah. when you're a kid, you, you kind of 
look, I, I was thinking nom. You know, my whole life I was thinking nom, right? But even, there was something even a little bit more, seemed like a little bit extra, was straight up World War II, right? You're, you're thinking World right. War II, you're thinking tanks and stuff. So in Ramadi, there was times where tanks were rolling down the street, rolling in, in through buildings, over walls. It was WWII. <laughs> And man, it was freaking awesome. Um, it, yeah. yeah, but you're right. I mean, it was. Uh, I mean, I I had that nom expectation too. And when we got there, it was, uh, it was a it was a ground war. The only thing that made it sort of nom like is the Euphrates River. Oh yeah, for sure. And we would use those sock R's uh, to insert. And you know, there's only so many boat guys on on the sock R's, and sometimes they're alternating between right or port and starboard side uh, guns. So if they didn't have anybody on, you know, a gun, you just stand up and you grab one. And uh, yeah, you're in a t-shirt and <laughs> rolling up the Euphrates River, and it was pretty. There yeah. was area an, a whole AO called One MC or MC One. I can't remember, but it was up north. Kind of, kind of northeast of the town of Ramadi, and it was on the on the north side of the river, and it looked like Nam. <laughs> I mean, it was ridiculous. And plus, we had the Marine Corps Hueys flying around. We called it Vietnam because it looked like it was Ramadi, but it looked like Vietnam, man. It was freaking crazy. Uh, <laughs> right on. And so you get done with that deployment, and then what? What do you do when you get home? Uh, at that point, I uh, I started. I'm thinking about uh, grad school. Okay. I was. I so was, you were a reservist. So when you got home, were you released from active duty kind of? Yeah, I went to, uh, but I, I managed to uh, parlay that into going over to WARCOM. So I worked for a couple of years over at WARCOM. Uh, and I, uh, my platoon chief from SEAL Team 5 was going over there to run the JTAC program. And, you know, I kind of taught myself how to do all that. Mm -hmm. So he, uh, he said, if you want, you can come over and work with me while you're going to grad school. And so we just uh, we just did JTAC stuff for the next two years while I went through and uh, got my degree. Wh and, where'd uh, you go to school? USD. Oh, I, I went to uh, undergrad there. Did you? At US USD. Gorgeous. <laughs> it's a nice place. Um, and, and then were you thinking, hey, were you still thinking about trying to put that OCS package in or? I was, I, I mean, I had, it was on the sort of the back burner. I was trying to decide whether or not I was gonna go uh, put the uh, OCS package to go back active or uh, do like an FTS package and uh, get a commission in the reserves. Oh, check. So I had uh, my first kid and once I had the first kid, I was like, I don't wanna leave this guy. <laughs> so I, uh, I went with the reserves, so I got a commission, so the day I, uh, left active duty, I uh, I got a commission in the reserves. Oh, so you did end up getting a commission in reserves. I did. You still have it right now? Well, I'm out of the res reserves now. Oh, okay. I, I left uh, left the reserves four years ago, or maybe a little more. So the, you you get done, and now you realize you want to stay home with the kid, and so then what? You you you're trying to put your life together on the outside. How's that go? No, great. <laughs> <laughs> like any uh, guy who leaves the, you know, their dream job uh, and you know suddenly finds himself doing something they never expected to do. Uh, it didn't go great, Jocko. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was, you know, like everybody, trying to figure out what my next, uh, uh, my next big thing was, uh, looking for relevance in any any area that I could find it, and um, uh, I quickly realized that in my business life, I was not going to be successful. <laughs> what businesses did you try? Well, I first off, I, I started with, at a textile manufacturer in Philly. We were trying to get back to family because uh, we had, you know, uh, I had a new new kid and probably another one on the way. So um, uh, my wife at the time uh, lived in uh, uh, South Jersey, so we we went there. So I got a job at a, uh, a textile uh, manufacturer in Philly, and uh, they were great people, uh, and I uh, really liked the company, and I was just terrible at it. <laughs> you know, I, I, they, they wanted to start, like, a tactical products line, and um, I thought I'd try, you know, business, and, uh, yeah, I didn't do well. <laughs> I mean, it didn't do terrible, but I just, like, I, I, don't, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> so I started thinking about this uh, right about then. Um, I was like, there's only two things that I'm, I can do. And, you know, uh, I don't want to leave the kid. Uh, and, uh, or I, you know, at the, at that time it was, you know, one kid had become two. Mm -hmm. Um, 
So I started thinking about this. What was the catalyst that made you actually do this? Get out your computer, open the word processor, and start typing. Uh, that was um, probably extortion one seven. So, uh, like everybody, I went uh, to you know, you know, quite a few of the funerals uh, after that, and uh, uh, I went to. Uh, JT's funeral, John Tumelson. He was uh, um, he was from was it Rockford, Iowa. Mm-hmm. So I went to his funeral, and uh, yeah, totally unexpected. But when I was there, I met uh, Jim Hornfisher or uh, James D. Hornfisher. That's his author name. But he is uh, he was a literary agent. Um, he was, but he was also a probably the the you know the greatest you know naval historian in the country. Um, he had written Last Stand of the Tin Can Sailors, Neptune's Inferno. Uh, so when I got to uh, JT's funeral, everybody's there, everybody's drinking. Um, I see this guy who's totally out of place. He's six foot five, you know, wears glasses. He's just kind of you know, not a team guy, clearly. <laughs> and uh, uh, one of my friends uh, quickly, you know, realizes that you know he has uh, he has the two biggest nerds at the event, and he introduces us. And uh, within thirty seconds, I knew that. Uh, um, this was a guy that was going to change my life. So we started talking naval history. We got uh, uh, got pretty lit up. I uh, kept his business card in my pocket for the next year. Uh, was kind of you know secretly uh, working on a on an idea for a book. And uh, after a year, I uh, sent him a cold email and just you know here's a chapter. Uh, want to take a look at it? And uh, he sent an email back and he said this is fantastic and. I spent the next six months putting a, an outline together uh, for what the rest of the book would look like. And he took that to New York and got a, got a contract. So they gave me a two-year contract. I spent you know, the next eight years working on it. So <laughs> they gave you a two-year contract, Yeah, and you just kept saying, hey, well, it's gonna, I just I kept got to keep going. I just I kept thinking they were going to. Yeah, they, no, it wasn't that. It was like I, I just, you know, they, they, wanted, uh, they wanted a product uh, that, I quickly realized I couldn't give them, so I, I knew that. What did um, they want? They wanted a they wanted a history of the of the teams, um, but they wanted it done quickly, like everybody. I mean, you can. Um, so I knew that if I did that, then the history that I was going to write was going to be like every other history that had been written on the teams, sort of just wave tops. Mm-hmm. Um, and I knew that it wasn't going to be written with any sort of intent beyond you know just my own interest in each of the events. I knew I that I knew the teams deserved something like this. I just didn't know how to do this, so I just kind of broke the whole thing down. I found a bunch of I, I found two or three books that I really liked. Uh, I read each of them uh, three or four times. Uh, one of them I went through and I literally outlined it. You know, not page by page, but like chapter by chapter. It's like this chapter is doing this, this chapter is doing this. Um, and I just sort of broke it down. How does this author, you know, I, and I found another author. How does this author uh, introduce characters? Um, how do they, you know, how do they just, you know, structure or how do they, you know, weave multiple storylines together? Um, and I just kind of taught myself how to do this. Mm-hmm. Did you? But I knew, I knew that they, that, you know, uh, this was going to take me a lot longer than two years. So when they gave you two years, what did you, did you just sign the contract and just? I signed the contract. Knowing just, that you would. Yeah, I did the same thing I did at SEAL Team 5. You know, I, I said, yeah, I'm a calm guy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I just, you said, yeah, I'll write this in two years? Yeah. How pissed were they when you kept missing the deadline by five years? <laughs> <laughs> they weren't. You know, to their credit, they didn't bother me. Uh, they would check in. Um, and the only thing that they really did was um, they, uh, they wanted to see the first chapter. So once the first chapter was finished... I sent that off, and they said, okay, this is... And I, it took me between six and seven months to write that first chapter on the Raiders. How long, How many hours a day would you work? Uh, I would start at 4.30, and I would work uh, until about 8. And then I would, uh, you know, do the rest of my day, and then I'd come home, I'd get my kids to bed, uh, and then... Once I once I put them to bed, I'd, I'd work as long as I could until I was just kind of smoked. And so you're probably getting like five, six hours a day on the book. Yeah. For. Yeah. 
yeah. I mean, I'll tell you what. We'll get into the book now. But before we do, the book is freaking. It's it's an incredible book, and the detail you go into. It's over 500 pages long. Uh, I'll read a, a fraction of that today. Um, I, I it was so hard for me to fi- figure out what to what what parts to read. Um, you, I, I guess I could have talked to you about it. Maybe we could have discussed it. But I just kind of <laughs> like there's every page has got really important stuff on it. Um, the writing's terrific. Clearly. And unmistakably, you sourced it from a lot of first-person accounts, you know, captured documents or, or information captured from documents, from official traffic, from interviews, from other sources. It reads like an action novel in many parts, except for the fact that it's all true, which makes it even better to read. So this book, I, I can't recommend this book enough. Uh, just a fantastic history. And it's not, it's not just about the SEALs because one of the premises of the book is that SEALs wouldn't exist if either really the Marine Corps or the Army would have stuck to and committed committed to the idea of having these kind of direct action raiders, which is what the SEAL teams ends up being. And everybody's got it, kind of got it now, you could say. But for many years, there was many attempts at doing this. And... They, they wouldn't work out for various reasons. Um, maybe a mission would go bad, or a war would end, or a combination of those two things. Or, you know, when you're in the army and you're a general and you got some, some cowboy looking guy running around, and you're senior to that cowboy looking guy, you think, I don't want this guy running around. I'm gonna disband his whole organization. Or you're in the Marine Corps, you do the same thing. Hey, you know, I was in the Marine Corps. Marine Corps is right and tight, you know? And now who's this guy running around with freaking long hair? No, I'm gonna disband that whole organization. And and that seems to happen a lot. There's one group, the Navy, where you're, you're in the Navy, so you're sort of, you know, if you're an admiral in the Navy, you kind of want to have some of these pipe hitters running around that can make something happen. And that's, I think, part of the, part of the genesis of the SEAL teams. So... <clears throat> book is fantastic. Um, let's get into some of this. So, here we go. On August 8th at 0900, both submarines departed sub-base Pearl Harbor and made it for the open ocean. It was, in the lead was the Nautilus with Carlson and 87 Raiders of B Company. Following almost a day behind was the larger and slower Argonaut with Roosevelt and the remaining 134 men the majority belonging to A Company. For eight sweltering days, the Raiders lived crammed alongside each other anywhere they could stretch each man a prisoner to to the heat, sweat, and stink of the one next to him. After 2,000 miles of the Pacific's omnipotence, slightly farther than New York City to San Diego, the Nautilus finally arrived at its target on August 16th. So these are Marine Raiders, group that have been put together to go out. They're conducting freaking sub-operations in World War II. Um, fast forward, and that's, you know, obviously I'm only reading chunks of the book, so it seems a little bit stilted or, or you don't recognize some of the names. Believe me, every person that's in this book is described. You, you give an incredible background on people, where they came from, how they got in the situation they're in. So when you hear me jumping, you haven't heard of a character. It's just because I haven't read, I'm not reading you the entire book. Fast forward a little bit. Sensing his momentum eroding like the ground beneath him, Carlson sloughed through the soft sand, hastening to gather his men before the sun rose. Obviously, they've been inserted at this point. If he could find the un, find and untangle his two reduced companies and point them in the direction of their targets, he might still have a chance. Because there had been no reconnaissance, however, no one knew for sure where or where where they were or where to go. With four miles of beach to the left and another six miles to the right, with targets, their targets could be anywhere if their targets were there at all. Worse still, one whole boat crew was missing. Without target locations or knowledge of enemy strength, the 13 men, with 13 men unaccounted for and possibly drowned, Carlson was blind and groping for answers in an ever brightening world, his men becoming ridiculously conspicuous along the white beaches in their uniforms of dyed black. So this is already off to a bad start with these guys. Yeah, they, uh, yeah, I, <laughs> I don't know what to say. I mean, I, uh, the, um, 
I didn't right organizing the book. I, I knew where I knew I, I knew where I needed the book to end. I knew that the book would end in Vietnam because in Vietnam it's in Vietnam that the SEAL teams become what they are today. Land focus, go anywhere, commandos. What he didn't know was how it happened, and I didn't have like, you know, uh, you, in order to you know decide what a book's going to be, you've got to have a you know not just an endpoint, you've got to have a beginning point. So I needed to find that first instance where the Navy um, wanted, or the Navy had that uh, uh, that desire to create some sort of rating unit. Now we all know that you know the Marine Corps is a department of the Navy. So the Navy has its own army. Uh, and so logically, the Marine Corps should have been able to field that first commando unit that worked directly for the Navy. The reason that they don't do that ultimately uh, happens you know, in the opening days of World War II and all happens because of this Macon Island raid. The Marine Corps doesn't want the raiders. Uh, they, uh, the Marine Corps wants what it's always wanted, or uh, not what it's always wanted. They want what they've wanted since World War One. In World War One, the Marine Corps uh, becomes every bit as uh, consequential as the U.S. Army. So the leaders of the Marine Corps, who all fought on the battlefields of the First World War, they feel like when World War Two happens, uh, they can finally uh, achieve the status that their service has long uh, uh, deserved. So they're not interested in uh, being the Navy's anything. They're the Na- they're interested in being their own branch of service, completely, uh, uh, you know, subservient to themselves. Uh, so when the Navy says they want to uh, spread the Japanese uh, attention away from the Solomons or uh, away from the South Pacific and do this raid, Marine Corps thinks, well, it's you know, it's not really what we should be doing, but we'll do it just because the Navy wants it. So when it, it predictably, uh, when they send uh, these raiders up there. Uh, with a, a commander that the Marine Corps really didn't want, they really didn't like Carlson. Uh, it, it goes predictably bad, and then the Marine Corps justifies the reason uh, that they never wanted them in the first place. It's it's interesting. Um, even when, and I don't know if you'll remember this because it might be a little bit. But you didn't come in until two thousand. Yeah, when I came in, the the Marine Corps attitude was well we don't need a special operations group inside the marine corps because all marines are special yeah, and that's the that was attitude 100 percent their attitude and, and they kept that like to the t when yeah. i was in that was that was just how they rolled was was through that um yeah i mean they they have had that attitude since the first well since world war ii but it's in the first world war that they they realize what they can be yeah which is a parallel army. <clears throat> you, uh, the 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 work that you did to research these these battles, and you go into so much detail with them. I mean, here we go going back to the book real quick. Um, for the next thirty minutes, A Company fought a suicidal enemy armed with four machine guns, two grenade throwers, automatic rifles, and a flamethrower. Each time the raiders managed to silence a machine gun nest, another Japanese gunner would step over the piled body surrounding it and bring it to life. Worst of all, unseen and inescapable were the snipers lashed to the tops of the palms. Not blinded by the sun and rewarded for their patience, each sniper sought out movement and took aim. We pleaded with Thompson to stay down, one man remembered years later. There were snipers within 50 yards of us. He did not, compelled instead to shuttle between his men, pointing out targets as he went. His Medal of Honor was awarded posthumously. We had Japs in front of us, above us, alongside us, to our left and behind us, remembered Corporal Young, exposed at the tip of the cul-de-sac. Even when they managed to fight free of the Japanese around them, their good sense kept them nailed to the ground. I lay as as, flat as I could and tried to shrink myself as narrow as possible, said Private Glenn Lincoln, playing possum under the palm trees and the scrutiny of two separate machine gun positions. In 30 minutes, nine Raiders from 2nd Platoon were dead. So was Thompson. So was Lieutenant Jerry Holtum, the battalion intelligence officer, a child of missionaries and the one Raider who could speak Japanese. Also killed were four radio telephone operators, each one singled out by the antenna waggling above his shoulder, which was connected to a waterlogged radio that either lacked the power to reach Carlson's command post or did not work at all. So, like you said, this is just a a, a disaster. This this it, situation. It's a disaster, but it you know it, it highlights you know 
even though each branch of service has uh, leaders that have uh, their own purposes for creating these units at various times for various reasons, uh, in each instance, whether it's raiders or rangers or uh, lerps or whatever, uh, the guys on the ground, these are, I mean, every bit as heroic and deserving of, uh, you know, our respect uh, as the, the seals that their legacies ultimately funnel into. So um, it's just you know, the branches of service don't support their efforts mm -hmm. uh, for one, you know, various reasons. And it, you know, it takes a long time to get there. But you're right. You said it, uh, you know, in your opening remarks. I mean, this, this history or this institution, the SEAL teams, could not have, uh, would not have come uh, to be, uh, it would not have come to be a land-focused commando unit had it not been for the gap uh, that the Army and the Marine Corps and the CIA uh, or the OSS continually provide over this 30-year period of history. So that kind of, as you mentioned, that kind of that that first raid, that Macon raid, kind of put a put a damper on the enthusiasm of the Marine Corps to to go out and make one of these units. Um, Fast forward a little bit, you say this in the book. In May 1942, in anticipation of the Army's need, the Navy issued a narrow call for volunteers to join something called the Amphibious Commandos. What made the call narrow was that it seemed to be directed at a single group. That group was, in the words of one reported, the 600 or so, quote, educated muscle men who had signed on as assistant instructors to the Navy's physical fitness program. These were led by the most educated muscle man of his day, Lieutenant Commander James Joseph Green Tooney. Am I saying that right, Tooney? Tony. Tony. Six feet tall, equipped with a heavy fist-shaped chin and handsome smile that every man, woman, and child in the country recognized. Tony was known, wait, did I get that right? Tony or Tooney? Tony. Tony. Tony was known as the great war machine turned heavyweight boxing champ who had not once but twice defeated Jack Dempsey. Unlike many boxers of his day whose training consisted of, in the words of one competitor, a haircut and a shave, Tunney had managed this feat by relentlessly conditioning his body during the day and by reading Shakespeare every night. After winning his sec second fight, Tunney had fought only once more, then quit the ring forever to follow what to follow that irresistible pull, as one contemporary reported note, reporter noted, to do something big in other fields. This had included lecturing on Richard III at Yale and inventing the Gene Tunney Exerciser, a long board equipment, a long board equipped with ropes and pulleys that would raise the feet and condition the abdomens it sold for $3. <laughs> Uh, biggest of all, he had swapped his old globe and anchor for the bronze oak leaves of a naval officer in order to rid his new service of what he considered its gravest threat, the pot belly. <laughs> I dare say that 50% of the officers enlisted men cannot properly stand at attention, said the newly commissioned Tunney in 1941, partly blaming their ill-fitting dungarees, which stretched too much and induced the wearer to stick out his belly and hold them up. Tunney reasoned that the problem was actually a threat to national security and would eventually lead, in his words, to moral collapse. Believing like all Marines that a strong physique undergirded a strong character, Tunney's initial efforts in the Navy had met on with only moderate success because sailors were not Marines, and as such had never cared much for either fitness or character. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I your, your dry humor comes through a lot in this book. Thanks. I had to cut, I don't know, probably five, six pages of Tony out. I, I mean, the one, the one problem that you, you face when you're writing a book like this is that you, research is really seductive. You can uh, go down rabbit hole after rabbit hole. You keep going, you keep going, you find article after article after article, and you want to you wanna cram all of this information into that, into that paragraph. Uh, and it doesn't take you anywhere. <laughs> so you constantly have to be asking yourself, what is this? First of all, what's the book? I, I kept a note card on my desk uh, when I started working on the book, and the, the note card had three questions on it. It was pinned to the wall. It said, what's the purpose of the book? Uh, what's the purpose of the chapter? What's the purpose of this paragraph? And if the paragraph is not in support of the chapter, and if the chapter is not in support of the, the book, then you're, not, you're, you're doing it wrong. So... Um, I mean, you, every character that you come across, you, you want to give them some sort of, uh, sort of introduction. Tunney's uh, consequential in that he uh, attracts all of these um, 
studs. Yeah, he brings all Just these freaking yeah. studs. <laughs> uh, but he doesn't have the program that's going to be able to contain these guys. Uh, so he attracts all of these, you know, you know, pro football players uh, to his program um, that have, you know, they all want to, you know, serve their country, uh, you know, in the most aggressive way possible, and they find out that they're going to be calisthenics instructors. <laughs> <laughs> so of course, you know what's going to happen. So Tunney collects all these guys, um, and then you know I think the anyway. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, it's it's the you know I, I've I've done a lot of reading about SOG and every basically I would say every SOG mission in Vietnam could be its own book. You just oh, one easily. every single SOG mission, and that's the feeling I get when when reading your book. Every one of these characters that you introduce could be their own book. Yeah. Just about every single character could be their own book. You, you just have to stop. <laughs> you, you, you've got to you've got to draw the line at some point. You'd be like, yes, there's a book here clearly, but we're you know we're we're going on to you know this objective. I never yeah. wanted to write a book with a thesis. That was never my objective. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to prove anything. Mm -hmm. But what I did find was that with a thesis, uh, with a thesis, I was able to connect all these disparate stories right. that never would have uh, formed a, a you know a comprehensive story. Mm -hmm. But with that thesis, by asking the question, how did the Navy come to create a land focus go anywhere commando unit? I was able to stitch all these other, you know, rangers and raiders and all the other stories of, you know, the non SEAL units into a book about the SEALs. So here's another character that you introduce um, that we all in the SEAL teams know. When 28 year old Phil Bucklew, a football star from Columbus, Ohio, had presented himself at an Army recruitment office immediately after Pearl Harbor to volunteer for the paratroopers, the recruiter had taken one look at his six foot two, 235 pound frame and said, I could, I could take two instead of you. Considering that the smallest soldier the Army could accept was a shadow heavier than 105 pounds, the recruiter is absolutely right. Disappointed to be passed up for the paratroopers and thus lose his tr chance to be dropped into a foreign land, Bucklew had settled for the Navy. Then settled again for ton for the Tunney program, uh, ostensibly the best place in the military for someone with his background. After playing for Xavier University in Cincinnati and then the Ram for the Rams in Cleveland, Bucklew had since gone on to raise money and recruit players for his own professional football team. Accomplishments that had demonstrated not only intelligence and toughness that Tunney sought, but also leadership and the risk taking of an entrepreneur. He was not the only footballer with hidden potential. Big John Tripson, a six foot five, bushy haired all American from Mississippi, from Mississippi State, had already seen more of the country than most Americans ever would, having traded his life on the South Texas Plains to play all pro tackle for the Detroit Lions. And Robert Herrick, a mountain of muscle from the mountains of Colorado, who stacked every bit as high as his Texas colleague, had enlisted in the Navy not only as a graduate of Colorado State, but as its head football coach. Essentially, it was a roster with more potential than Tony's program could tame. <laughs> Just a bunch of freaking beasts. Got it. Got to read this part too. So, at the call for amphibious commandos, Bucklew and nine other Titan athletes raised their hands when they reported to their next assignment. A chief petty officer with a knowledge of angling. And the Tunney regime took one look at the oversized arrivals and dubbed them the tuna fish. The name stuck. Um, you get a, another guy named uh, Halperin in here who plays a huge role in all this. Yeah, he's uh, indispensable. Uh, I mean, I everybody, you know, the the. Um, the temptation when you're writing about these guys is to introduce them as they come. You know, you, you come to Bucklew, you want to introduce Bucklew because Bucklew is, you know, one of the most important people in the history of NSW. You come to him, you want to give him a good, you want to give them, him the introduction that he deserves. But he doesn't become, he doesn't become Phil Bucklew, the consequential Phil Bucklew until Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So you've got to hold your fire and you've got to, you know, sort of convince the reader that if you just hold on, we're going to get there. So because the most consequential person person of this period is the guy you just mentioned, yeah. which is Buck Halpern. Yeah, you get this guy, Buck Halpern, at a mere six feet, 225 pounds. These guys were monsters. This is back in the day, too. This is freaking like World War II. Guys are not jacked like they are now. <laughs> like if you're six foot, six feet, 225 back in the day, uh, you were jacked, mm. 100%. Mm. Echo, can you confirm? Confirm. From the bro science perspective? <laughs> yes, sir. Okay, just making sure. <laughs> At a mere six feet, 225 pounds, Robert Buck Halperin 
was easily the smallest of the group, but stood out from his fellow footballers for a string of peculiarities, not the least of which a face not unlike that of Hollywood's Robert Taylor. Besides this, he was half a decade older than the rest and had a personality that was not only as dry as Cabernet, but also incomparably unflappable. Most peculiar of all, he had been raised and educated in the exclusive Chicago suburb of Oak Park, the second son of prominent Jewish immigrants. At the time, not exactly features that encourage friendships with working class white footballers, but try telling that to Halperin. Unlike the son of Jewish immigrants, Unlike many sons of Jewish immigrants, Halperin had been raised to speak no Yiddish, to practice no faith. A boy so adrift from any spiritual anchor that he adopted t- two regional substitutes as his sanctuaries. The first had been Lake Michigan, in which he swam so often and so well that he once caught the admiration of a waiting Al Capone, and upon which he had learned to sail, eventually reading the Windy City's wind so well that he had taken up competitive racing. The other sanctuary, a high holy place if there ever was one, had been the Notre Dame football stadium. Asked why a Jew would submit himself to such a Christian university, Halperin had flatly replied, because it was the best. <laughs> so this is another guy. Um, yeah. Uh, he, just a character. And he start. I mean, he starts like, you know, from nothing. He doesn't, he has no expectation. He's so old uh, when World War II starts. He's 34 years old when he enlists as a seaman in the uh, <laughs> In the, in the Navy. But his brother had been a, uh, a radiologist um, uh, at Pearl Harbor. And so, you know, after you see your, your brother, you know, you know, performing such service, what, what else are you going to do? You've got to do the same. So he, uh, he pulls every string he can, uh, gets himself into the Navy. And uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to uh, uh, give anything away, but he, I mean, he goes from, the Tunney program all the way to China. I mean, he becomes, you know, NSW's first ground force commander. That's freaking nuts. Um, <clears throat> last week of 19, August 1942, Buck Halperin and the rest of the tuna fish, plus 36 enlisted sailors, left the Solomon Islands where they were trucked more than 100 miles to a point where the lower lip of the Chesapeake Bay met the Atlantic Ocean. Here, the Virginia coast gave way to an isolated tidewater inlet called Little Creek and a dirt road based with dirt floor housing that made the Solomons look like San Francisco. Upon arrival, they were greeted by an Army officer, Lieutenant Lloyd Petticord Jr., a 29-year-old former commander of the Observer Group who now wore knee-high leather boots of a horse soldier and, in spite of his small stature, when standing at attention looked like a nail waiting to be driven into a rail tie. His personality wasn't far off. As one of the few soldiers who had participated in the Marine Corps flex exercises, he knew all too well the challenges awaiting the men. He now welcomed to the intensely difficult course he had just created, a course of soft sand runs, rubber boat races, and endless team calisthenics known as the Joint Army-Navy Amphibious Scouts and Raider School. At last, the Navy's volunteers for amphibious commandos were about to come them. That's sort of the beginning. And there's something, you know what's interesting? I don't know. I'm think if you do those uh, like psychological games where or psychological tests where somebody says something and it makes you think of whatever you know you have to say what it. But when you hear amphibious commando, who's not a hundred percent in on that? Thing? <laughs> <laughs> like when I think I knew what an amphibious commando is when I was five years old yeah. and wanted in. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I had the I had I collected these little uh, air fix. Soldiers, the little 132nd size little army men when I was a kid. My mom eventually threw them all the way, by the way. Brutal. Just a savage. <laughs> I had hundreds of them. Yeah. And I used to, you know, dream and talk and play with those things. But my favorite was the British commandos. They had little zodiacs and, and kayaks and little uh, beanie caps. Like that was the deal. And you see, the, that was when I was a little kid, that was like, yeah. Oh, yeah. amphibious commandos. <laughs> Ah, so again, I can't read well, the soul book. Yeah, I know, go ahead. but yeah, uh, Pettigrew, like he's a, uh, each of the people that I focus on in the book, um, I, I tried to drill down as, as close as I could. Uh, you know, you, there's, you know, you, you, the general rule of thumb is you start big and you go small. So you read whatever is available, you, the existing literature that's out there. Uh, 
and there have been a, there have been a couple of books that have been published in Petticourt's a character. So you kind of trace those down, uh, you know, Petticourt, Halpern, Buckley, whatever. You're 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 trying to get as close as you can to uh, the person that you want to write about, or the the person that becomes the consequential person of the moment. So you're trying to learn about them in such a way that you can find out the traits in that person that made them consequential, um, and whether the the traits that made you know somebody like Carlson uh, a failure or the traits that made Petticord or Buckley or Halpern a success. So uh, oftentimes you'd, you'd hit a wall. There's no place, you know, you're, there's no more information that's available in existing literature. So you've got to start digging into, you know, archival material. So uh, I had learned pretty quickly, you know, what archives around the country usually had the most stuff. So I would go to those archives and I would dig. Like and where is this? Is it a place you got to go to? Like yeah, so, uh, big libraries or something? Yeah. So the archive that I generally used about five different archives. Uh, the most, the, the best one was probably uh, the National Archives uh, in Maryland. Um, they, uh, they have the most stuff uh, and they have the it's accessible. Um, when you start getting to the military archives, not, not the army so much. The army archives is actually really uh, a world-class institution. I loved uh, going there. That's in Carlisle. The Marine Corps uh, archive in Quantico, another, uh, another great archive. The Navy Yard, uh, it, uh, or the, uh, the uh, Naval Heritage and History Command ar- archive at the Navy Yard. That was a bit trickier. Uh, they had uh, a for whatever reason, I think uh, a lot of it had to do with the fact that they had an active shooter there a few years before, uh, so security on the on the base was tight. But they would really, it's a very close held institution. So when you went there, uh, you know, digging through their stuff uh, could be a little complicated. You had to plan around it. Um, but you'd find stuff. You'd find, you know, I found. Uh, Letters the pedicure had written, and you you've got to really you've got to look at the letter, you've got to read it once, you got to you know highlight what's important, and then you've got to read it again and again and figure out you know what you can learn about him from the letter, the way he talks, the way he writes, the way he thinks. When you run into that, uh, when you can't you know squeeze any more information out of that, uh, then you're you're left with finding the family, and. You know, uh, in this case, I found Petticord's family. Uh, I tried to find, uh, you know, at least a family member for every, you know, person that I, uh, you know, focused on in the book. Um, had dinner with uh, uh, Buck Halpern's uh, son last night. Still close friends with him. Uh, but Petticord's family, you know, some of these people, they don't realize, like, how important their dad or their grandfather was in this history. And they have no idea why you're calling them. Uh, and they... You know, they, you know, they they would provide photos. They provide letters. Uh, sometimes they would let you come to their house and dig through their stuff. Um, but yeah, uh, Petticord was one of those that uh, I didn't expect to find as much as I did. But talking to him, I mean, you can get little details out of him. I found one photo of Petticord wearing those boots, <laughs> and I I knew that they were, uh, you know, the boots that uh, Army cavalry soldiers wore. Uh, and I, I didn't anticipate that they were boots that he wore, you know, through the rest of his career until I ran into uh, an old scout and raider uh, who was a 96-year-old guy, old Jim Barnes is what they called him. I was like, you know, I I'd sat down to interview Jim Barnes, and I, you know, what do you remember about Petticord? And the first thing that he remembered <laughs> were those boots. <laughs> Damn. Yeah, little detail. Uh, um. After this here, you, you detail, you go through some of the details of Operation Torch, which is up in North a- Africa, the Cebu River. Um, it, it's, it's a success, you know, it's a tough operation. Um, five of the 10 original tuna fish get the Navy Cross from that operation. And again, I'm skipping through some of that right now. Get the book, get the book and read about that freaking operation because <laughs> it's epic. Um, uh, the origination it, it, and you know we've said this a couple times but the origination of everything that goes on here is is um, you you have to tell talk about the Raiders you have to talk about the Rangers you have to talk about why 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 what happened to them and why they didn't become seals or right. at least the seal type thing this is a, a section here where you start talking about um, well, uh, the Rangers. Right. Go ahead. So the premise is, you know, 
that the Navy should never have had this capability. Uh, when I started trying to come up with a title for the book, I, one the, my options for subtitles were like something like the origin story of the Navy SEALs, a unit that should not exist, something like that, mm-hmm. something as you know, provocative like, mm-hmm. like that. And the reason they shouldn't exist uh, is because of the Army and the Marine Corps and the, and the CIA. All of these uh, institutions were better suited for this mission than the Navy was. Uh, so in order to, you know, explain the question that I, you know, ask at the beginning, how the Navy, you know, come to field this, you know, land focus, go anywhere, commando force, um, the way that's phrased is you have to understand why these other institutions didn't uh, become that first, why they didn't block the Navy from becoming that. And only in understanding why they didn't become that can you understand, really understand why the Navy did it, why the Navy felt like it had to do it. That includes the Rangers. Go into the book. The officer selected to command the Rangers, 31-year-old Major William Orlando Darby, born in Fort Smith, Arkansas in 1911, the same guerrilla-studded year as Lord Lovat and Russell Volkman. Darby grew up believing that he was destined for greatness. Of average size and looks, his greatness lay below the surface. As it as it is so often with tragic men, a war would be required to uncover it. Black-haired, blue-eyed, wide-mouthed as a duck, Darby had a ruddy face divided into equal parts, forehead and chin. <laughs> His left cheek bore a mysterious, brilliant red scar. Not particularly muscular, he nevertheless affected chest out, shoulders back posture in which his arms seemed always cocked to the rear as if never more than a moment away from snapping to attention. Son of a printer and a musician, the second child between two sisters, he grew up scouting the Arkansas woods and playing the saxophone. While in high school, his older sister died. In Texas, he married, then divorced. In spite of disappointment and tragedy, his attitude remained as it ever had been, good-humored and irrepressible. In personality, just like his posture, he was direct, forceful, and never vacillating. Had the military gene not dominated and given and driven him to a life of soldiering, he would have made a born salesman. He is the ideal commando leader, wrote Colonel Vaughn at the end of the course. He possesses the energy, keenness, and personality which produces the best out of those under his command. Graduated from West Point in 1933 at the apex of the bell curve, ranked 177 out of 346. He was originally assigned as a field artillery officer. Fast forward a little bit. If the ideal army officer was equal parts confidence, bravery, energy, and obedience, Darby was all these things, but perhaps too much the last. More than anything, he believed his men could and should perform any mission assigned to them from the most audacious lightning raids to the most ignominious rear echelon duties to the most spectacular seized seize and hold operations. Because of this, no one would be more responsible for proving the value of the Rangers or for their downfall. So you go into um, talking about their first experience, the Rangers' first combat experience, which was in Dieppe. Am I saying mm-hmm. that right? Yeah, Dieppe. That's, uh, I think I said France, the, 1942? Yeah, and that, uh, that uh, one... Uh, sentence that I give yep, um, that represents 20 pages of book that I had to cut out. <laughs> like I spent, like I said, the research is really seductive. And when you find something that is so, um, you know, what you think is meaningful or what you think, um, you know, sort of shows you the direction that this whole thing is going in, you, you I mean, the, the temptation is to really, really focus on it and drag your reader through this. Uh, you've, but you have to remember that, you know, you're, you're trying to get the reader someplace, and you don't want to front load a chapter with 20 pages of battle, <laughs> and introduce characters in this battle or uh, of this battle that really aren't going to take you anywhere. Yeah. God, they're all so epic. Uh, speaking of British commandos, Jocko's perhaps inspiration for being a commando himself. <laughs> you, you got this quote here. I'm just going to read one quote. My, the, this is what the Ranger said about the about the commandos that they went into Dieppe with. My God, those commandos can fight, remember one ranger after the battle. They'd kneel down or lie down and fire, then stand up, grab an apple off a tree, and start firing again. (laughs) Freaking Brits. 
Um, so you go through that raid. You go through another raid was even more dramatic. Victim of a winch that broke while lowering his landing craft, dumping him, his radios, and equipment back into the ocean. Darby nevertheless scrambled back aboard his boat, then led four companies plus one chaplain ashore. There, despite squelching wet boots, he and his rangers marched uphill for three miles, every man carrying a full loadout of ammunition, plus fighting knives, bayonets, climbing ropes, one stick of dynamite, and two mortar rounds. The two unluckiest also pushed a mule cart bulging with m- still more mortar rounds. When the rangers arrived at Fort du Nord, they found it was surrounded by concentric cir- circles of barbed wire as high as eight feet and as deep as 14. With every snip, each man's nerve Nerves cinched tighter. Just as they were about to reach the last ring, a machine gun barked and drove them to the ground. Darby, ever the artillery man, wasted no time. Roy, pull up your pull your company back a few yards, then hit him when the barrage stops. Lieutenant Murray had got had hardly gotten his men untangled from the wire when the first rounds thumped into the battlements. Thus persuaded, the French defenders abandoned their machine guns and retreated, chased by Murray and his rangers, shouting "Hi ho, silver!" away. <laughs> That's fighting against the um, the French, the Vichy French. Yeah. Fast I mean, forward a little. Go ahead. No, I mean the when you read that and when you uh, when you think about the Rangers, it just reinforces everything I said before. The seals should not exist. Yeah. When you have you know what is clearly a naval commando force, a go anywhere commando force, uh, as capable as the Rangers were in 1942. This is a capability that the Army had. They created it. They were smart enough to create it, and then they lost sight of the reasons that they created it, and or actually they didn't lose sight of the reasons. The, the reasons um, that they created it are the reason that they had the downfall. They didn't care about you know, the Rangers' commando capability. They were more preoccupied uh, with using the Rangers as a way to teach the rest of the Army how to fight. We want to integrate our Rangers with British commandos uh, because the British commandos are really the only English-speaking uh, troops on the planet that knew how to fight. They wanted to, uh, you know, George Marshall wants to take that experience and uh, pass it along to the rest of the U.S. infantry or the, the Army infantry. Uh, and so by the time that the infantry starts to, uh, you know, elevate itself to the, uh, the capabilities of the Rangers, then divisional commanders start using the rangers more as not uh, commandos to go, you know, raid a, uh, a, a an artillery position or a command post. They just start pushing them ahead of the infantry, uh, almost sort of, sort of like suicidal spearheaders. And when you know when the chapter ends, I mean, it's it's just it's so depressing, but so predictable. Let's get there. Uh, this is a massive mission. This is in uh, Cisterna. Y- y- you go through. I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna catch the last little bit of it. You go through the battle. You go through what unfolds. I mean, there's so many leadership lessons to learn in here. Obviously, I talk about leadership all the time. The amount of leadership lessons that are in this book is incredible. Um, kind of wrapping this up. Since he'd been blown off the top of a smoking tank, Dobson had somehow made it back to his men near the Cala Caprini house. There, while organizing another defensive perimeter, he had taken more shrapnel in his right thigh, now lying in a ditch next to a burning self-propelled gun whose artillery rounds continued to cook off around him. He passed his command to Captain Charles Shunstrom, a ranger since the Akinary days and Darby's tank killing comparison, and Darby's tank killing companion at Gala. Upon taking command, Shunstrom, an aggressive, as aggressive a soldier as the U.S. Army had ever produced, shored up his position with several companies of the 3rd Battalion and even attempted a flanking movement to either break free of the encirclement or, believe it or not, take the town. None of it worked. At 10.45, solid communications were finally established between Darby and Shunstrom's radio, the care of which was now in the hands of Captain Edwards Edward Kitchens, Kitch to everyone who knew him, who was set up in the 1st Battalion's makeshift aid station and whose feet were gradually becoming more and more encumbered by wounded rangers. At 11.15, Darby told Kitch to hold on and that the 4th Battalion was making slow but steady progress. 
30 minutes later, Darby reiterated his encouragements and even asked Kitsch to put together a rescue party for 3rd Division's reconnaissance company that reportedly had been captured in his vicinity. Maybe you can break up the thing and rescue them, Darby said, his suggestion as tone deaf as his original expectations. Operationally employed like infantry, Darby's rangers were now dying like them too. At the Calacaprini house alone lay some 16 dead rangers, another 22 wounded, and only five men still fighting, barely three loaded weapons among them. At 12.15, Kitch became so overwrought, overwrought and weeping that he could no longer make himself understood. Darby asked for another voice, and Kitch quit the house altogether, preferring to die outside in battle rather than trapped inside manning the radio. Grasping the receiver now was a hulking ranger, Master Sergeant Robert E. Halt from Brooklyn, New York, one of Darby's originals. Some of the fellows are giving up, Colonel, said E. Halt, his voice scratching out of the speaker box. We're awfully sorry. They can't help it because we're running out of ammunition. But I ain't surrendering. In his farmhouse command post, Darby became frantic. Don't let the boys give up, he pleaded. Get the old men together and lamb for it. How many men are still with you? They're coming into the building now, Ehalt replied, gunfire snapping in the background. We're out of ammo, but they won't get us cheap. So long, Colonel. Maybe when it's all over, I'll see you again. With a violent wham, wham, Ehalt's transmission would cut out. Darby squeezed the handset and steadied himself. Use your head and do what is best. You're there and I'm here. Unfortunately, I can't help you. It stung to say the words into the dead line, his 4th Battalion still a mile from Cisterna. But whatever happens, God bless you. God bless all of you. With the mention of God, Darby's voice choked, his eyes watered. Ehalt, I leave everything in your hands. Tell the men I am with them to the end. After a moment, he set down the handset. Bracing himself, he wrapped his hands around a telephone receiver and called General Truscott. It apparently was too much for them, he said, muffling his emotions, replacing the receiver in its cradle. Darby asked his staff to leave the room. As enemy shells beat a steady tattoo around the house, he crumpled into a chair, dropped his head into his arms, and sobbed. Several minutes later, Darby appeared outside, his shoulders straight and his chin thrust forward defiantly. He was still in command, but in command of what? No one quite knew. I hate hearing that. I, I, this, ep, uh, this whole episode is based off of a couple of sources, one of them being Shun, uh, Shunstrom's report that he wrote. I want to say three days after the battle, after surviving this thing, he was one of the few uh, that escapes. And on a series of, uh, and on the the radio uh, transcription that they were keeping uh, uh, at Darby's uh, headquarters. So you you can actually see everything that was said on that radio, and you can read it, and it's it's horrible. And you know, you know, I mean, no, you know, going into it, you know, where, you know, what is going to happen and where, um, it doesn't make it easier though. So despite these, um, these legendary heroics, like you said, I mean, the, the heroics of the troops are just undeniable just after world war two, all six army ranger battalions were disbanded and, um, you say here, specific, superficially modeled on Churchill's Butcher and Bolt commandos, the U.S. Army Rangers, by the time of their disbandment, looked nothing like them. This was, in the end, the predictable result of different parents. Preoccupied with the readiness of his frontline soldiers, George Marshall had created the Rangers not to perfect the art of Churchill's coastal raids, but to serve his infantry. 
First, by gaining battlefield experience that could be transferred to the rest of his troops. Second, by handing them off to infantry commanders who committed the Rangers to missions with impossible odds and then either blame them for their failures or diminish their uniqueness by using them no differently than regular infantry. Though no one could have guessed the consequences, it was, prior, it was a prioritization that produced a lasting gap in the U.S. military's order of battle for a unit that specialized in raiding one that could best be filled by a branch of service less preoccupied less preoccupied with its infantry. And there was only one branch that didn't have infantry. So there you are setting up, um, setting up that one branch that doesn't have any infantry. <laughs> yeah, at the time, I mean, there's only three branches. Uh, yeah. The Air Force doesn't exist yet. It's the Army Air Corps. So of all three, uh, the Army, uh, Navy, and the Marine Corps, Navy's it. And you can, I mean, you can see where this is going before you even get out of World War II. You can see uh, the cycle that's going to uh, that's going to continue all the way until Vietnam. Uh, commanders uh, are going to uh, identify a gap. They're going to create commandos uh, to fill that gap. They're going to commit them to action, often to disastrous results. And then they're going to uh, renege on their idea. They're going to pull the rug out from under these guys. And in every gap, every time that happens, it's often going to leave uh, you know, their, the, that unit's commando partners in the lurch. And always that commando partner is the U.S. Navy. And the Navy's just going to get more frustrated, more frustrated, and they're going to continue pushing their, uh, their units, their special units, into that gap. Yeah, the next, the next uh, part of the book is called uh, Opportunity. Chapter four, subtitled Draper Kaufman and the course that cracked the Atlantic wall then laid the first bricks of the legend of naval special warfare. Um, <laughs> here we go. He's the weirdest guy in the book by far. But yeah. Tall and thin, lanky even, with dark hair, a, f- a narrow face, and a chin that stretched down like a teardrop draper, Lawrence Kaufman also possessed poor teeth and spectacles as thick as sun marine glass. Given to bouts of indolence, he was absent-minded, a failure in any subject that not capture his interest, and alarmingly progressive on the issue of race, at least so thought his mother, a shrew on the topic. <laughs> as a young man, Kaufman had wanted nothing more than to attend the Naval Academy and command a destroyer as his father had. When poor eyesight threatened to torpedo his dream, he submitted himself to the doc- to doctor's orders, however medieval, and for one hour a day held a palm over each open eye. This, when his appointing congressman suddenly died, leaving his academy application in limbo, he told no one of his plan, escaped from his Connecticut boarding school, got a bunk at the Washington DC YMCA, and then walked the halls of Congress, slipping past secretaries and performing a rehearsed sob story until someone, anyone, gave him an appointment. Once finally accepted, he rode crew, acted in school dramas, and in cruel foreshadowing, spent 30 days on a prison ship for sneaking off campus. When he graduated in 1933, a year when Navy pinchers stalked the ranks looking for any excess ballast to pitch over the side, he was given his diploma and a physical disqualification from the Navy, a steep four-year price to pay for to achieve the rank of civilian. Thus betrayed his childhood dream, Kaufman packed his pride, shelved any ideas of glory, and settled for an onshore operations job in the shipping industry, his life suddenly devoted to endless manifests for onloading and offloading of cargo. So there's your introduction of, <laughs> introduction of Draper Kaufman. I mean, just so many characters, and this guy's definitely one of them, gets put on a six-month assignment to Europe while he's doing that, that shipping job. While he's in Germany, he witnesses Adolf Hitler giving speeches. He realizes that this guy's, what, he realizes what's coming. Yeah. Um, so fast forward a little bit. He decides he wants to go and, and serve in the American Volunteer Ambulance Corps. To be accepted in the American Volunteer Ambulance Corps, a adjunct unit of the French Army, one was first required to submit a down payment of $3,500 to cover living expenses and the cost of one ambulance. In 1940, that was almost the price of a house. Even more than alarming, volunteers were bound to follow orders of the French military. To a man with purpose in his boots and adventure in his guts, just the sort of Hemingway, Hemingway's the French cause had attracted in the last war, no price was too high. 
And you say, actually, it was too high. That was, little, <laughs> and he, he had to bar, beg, borrow, and steal to get this money. Imagine you, you have to come up with the price of a house to go and serve in a freaking ambulance corps where you're going to get bombed or blown up. That, that, Working for the French. Yeah. I mean, we all know the, you know, Draper Kaufman's sort of biography. I mean, every uh, not everybody, but we get, um, you know, if you go to Bud's, you're going to get the, the Bud's history class or the, the SEAL history class. At some point, somebody's going to mention Draper Kaufman. There, was no, there was no Bud's history class. There was no SEAL history class when I went through Bud's. <laughs> Just saying. I'm saying there wasn't. I mean, it was 1990, so. Yeah, I know, and uh, that's just gonna make me mad if we talk about it. So. Yeah. <laughs> no, but uh, if you come across any sort of, any history book that's been written, Draper Kaufman's a character. Uh, and they're gonna hit, you know, like I said, they're gonna hit the wave tops of his, uh, of his biography, um, you know, before he becomes, uh, you know, the um, a indispensable uh, character in the, uh, in the UDT's uh, Central Pacific campaigns. What they're not going to do is they're not going to put uh, that biography in context. Um, and when you really dig into it, like, you know, yes, we know he was an ambulance driver uh, on the Western Front in 1940. We don't know what sacrifice it actually cost him to put himself in that position. And the reality is so much more like me. I mean, you're right. I mean, he, you know, he you know, cashed in everything he had you know, to go do something that he believed in. Like, how many people do you know? I don't know anybody like that today that would, you know, you know give away your house. Risk. Yeah, like, and it was all because he was just trying to, um, he was trying to do what he thought was right. He was trying to, you know, serve his country, even though his country wouldn't take him at the time because he couldn't see anything. Um, <laughs> it's just, you know, the, you know, every character in this book, they have, um, you know, everybody wants to do something in the book. Um, and most of them don't get to do the thing that they want. Uh, but all of us, we don't know, you know, what legacy we're going to have. Uh, and we don't know, like, um, what thing that we don't want to do that we have to do is going to be the most important part of our lives. And that's what happens with Draper Kaufman. He doesn't want to do any of this. He doesn't want to be an ambulance driver. He doesn't want to be a bomb disposal guy in the Blitz. He wants to be a naval officer. He wants to be on a destroyer. They won't let him, so he does all these other things to try and live up to what his dad has done. <laughs> and he ends up being, you know, he becomes a, a legend yeah. because of it. <laughs> so just to dive into a little bit of Kaufman, what, what he did. On May 10th, 1940, Kaufman arrived at his post six miles beyond the protection of the Maginot Forts in the Saar River Valley, Valley in the northeast shoulder of France where, border, where the borders come to a point and jut like a salient into the ravenous mouth of Germany. The same day, Hitler launched 100 divisions through the Ardennes Forest. As he, as he had known it would, the Second War Second World War had begun. And again and again, for two unrelenting weeks, Draper drove to the front, picked up survivors, and returned the inside of his ambulance slippery with blood. The whole while, he sustained himself on bits of food and the horror of French cigarettes. The only sleep to be had was taken in snatches, never in a bed, and never with his boots off. Responding to the deliberate fire of German McGunners, Bosch barbarians, he called them. He and his fellow ambulance drivers began draping dark blankets over the side of their vehicles to cover the giant red cross emblems. By the end of his third week in combat, two ambulances had been shot out from under him and he had lost 10 pounds. <laughs> this is what he gave his a house worth of money to go do. On the afternoon of September 7, 1940, a 1, thousand German planes attacked London and surrounding areas, killing 400 men, women, and children, and wounding 1,200 more. The next day, 412 were killed, wounding nearly double that number. For 57 consecutive days, days London was hit. Had he arrived any earlier, who knows what the Royal Navy's reaction would have been to his request as it happened, as it always happened when opportunity meets courage, Draper arrived at exactly the right moment. The day Draper Kaufman volunteered for the Royal Navy, he presented himself to the Admiralty at nine o'clock in the morning. So he goes and volunteers to join the Navy. Um, but because of his eyes, by five that afternoon, young Draper Kaufman was a sub-lieutenant in His Majesty's Navy. The only one hitch, once again, he was barred from duty at sea. Several weeks into his new career, a German bomb landed just outside the hotel in which Kaufman was billeted. Had it detonated upon impact, Kaufman's story would have been buried along with the hotel, another footnote in military history, nothing more. As it happened, the bomb hit did not 
but did not detonate. Its only damage being a 30-foot tunnel gouged into the earth. Before long, an army bomb disposal team arrived, cordoned off the area, and set to work. With hand tools alone, the squad painstakingly dug a path to the bomb, enlarged the hole, and shored up the sides in case of collapse. The objective, reach the bomb without disturbing it, gently unscrew the fuse, winch the inert remains from the dirt, and accompanied by police and accompanied by police or sirens, by police car sirens and loudspeakers, unexploded bomb coming through, transport the carcass to a nearby cemetery. This, usually this method worked. In case it did not, the entire bomb disposal team was killed. The next day, Kaufman volunteered for bomb disposal. For eight months from September 1940 to May 1941, Hitler waged a war on the British people. More than 40,000 civilians were killed. More than 100,000 were injured. The instrument of all this destruction was the bomb. Many of these weapons were defective or, or deranged, as in they failed to detonate upon impact or were timed to detonate after a bomb disposal team had arrived. So that's what he ends up doing. He ends up doing this bomb disposal duty. Um, after a while of doing that, he decides he's going to go back to the States. Once he's back in the States, the Japanese attack. After two years of waiting, the United States was finally at war. In a few days, the mes- a message found Kaufman ordering him to get out to Pearl Harbor right now. Imagining that Japanese trickery extended beyond strategy and into engineering, Draper prepared for the worst. When shown the 500-pound bomb at Schofield Barracks, he sent everyone else to cover, then examined it, sketched it, and telephoned each nail-biting step back to his controller. It had been dropped too low, he determined, landing on its side instead of its nose. What he had visualized visualized as an old-fashioned oriental puzzle turned out to be the easiest job he'd ever had. I couldn't have set that bomb off if I had had a sledgehammer, he said later. To those who witnessed his, the bespeckled master push past the line of gawkers to single-handedly disarm the bomb, there were few actions as deserving of praise. Couple headlines. DC man takes live Jap bomb apart, gets Navy cross, ran the headline in the Washington Post. All Florida will rejoice with Rear Admiral J- James L. Kaufman on being the father of so worthy a son. So there you go. That's where Draper, Draper Kaufman comes from. Um, yeah, I, uh, Draper is. Uh, there's some folks in the um, that uh, have spent their lives looking at uh, uh, the history of naval special warfare, um, and they know more about this history than than even I do. I mean, they, you know, I specialized over the, you know, like I said, the period from World War II to the period of Vietnam. They have a, a, a even fuller account uh, than I do. Um, and one of the things that annoys them is that Draper Kaufman has risen to this uh, sort of, you know, like I said, legendary status. He's, you know, considered by many the, uh, the, the father of America's frogmen. He's not. He doesn't... Uh, um, he doesn't create the UDT. He doesn't create the Frogmen. Uh, he um, he happens to be uh, the pivotal person at multiple uh, points in that history. Um, but he he's not the uh, he's not the Godfather like uh, everybody or not like many people have suggested that he is, including his sister, who wrote a you know pretty decent biography of him. Um, but like I said, he is uh, he's, he's a consequential person. What's also interesting about him is that he is, uh, like everybody else in this book, is he is he's making decisions, um, or he he's uh, he's deciding to do everything he he does. He's not a um, he's not a victim of history. He's not riding uh, a wave like uh, um, like a lot of people you know would suggest we're all sort of doing, like the. Uh, there's a there's a metaphor that people use to describe the the transformation of the SEAL teams, and that's the evolution. We've all seen that uh, sort of uh, painting at, at Pease where you've got the you know the the naked warrior crawling out of the surf, and then you've got this sort of Vietnam guy sort of crouched and uh, you know wearing his uh, tiger stripe fatigues, you know all and and next to the uh, the the SEAL in Iraq or Afghanistan wearing the body armor and everything. That they call that transformation the evolution. The evolution sort of suggests though that this uh, that this transformation was one inevitable uh, and that uh, it didn't uh, require uh, the um, uh, the intent uh, that all of these uh, folks who have uh, this consequential role in our history um, had and they they clearly had intent I mean when Draper's going through his history 
or his biography, um, he's deciding uh, that he's going to go serve uh, in the French army. And when the, the Germans send him home after he's released from the POW camp uh, and they you know, make him sign this document that he's going to go back to the States and he'll never take up arms against the German empire again, uh, he uh, intentionally decides that he's not going to do that. He's going to go join the British uh, Navy and he's going to continue, he continually does this. Um, and just like everybody in the book, they are, they're not victims. They're, each of these characters, they all have agency, and they all decide uh, that they're going to do these things for whatever reason. Uh, mostly it's uh, the decision that they arrive at is to satisfy what they um, have decided is uh, uh, their version of relevance. There, there's a, a spot where you say basically um, Draper Kaufman is not really the godfather that people, some people, give him credit for of the frogman but such a consequential guy he is a consequential guy and you're right he's not the he's not the uh the father of america's frogman kelly turner is that kelly turner creates the udts nobody would have done it if it wasn't for kelly turner he wants the udts because the marine corps uh at every step they uh they frustrate his plans to use reconnaissance troops and kelly turner he's um uh Kelly Turner wants to control everything in his orbit. <laughs> and so he creates the UDTs to do just that. He doesn't, the, the demolition is sort of secondary. He wants a reconnaissance force that he owns. Uh, and Draper just happens to be the vehicle for, for Kelly Turner's, um, uh, you know, once. We pick, we do pick up with, um, with Draper Kaufman though. You say, as such, who better to start the Navy's underwater demolition course in the Second World War than the men who'd seen the most of it? The man who'd seen the most of it. A sailor for whom no barrier ever held and who was about to squeeze his biography into a syllabus like none that had ever existed. To create the type of amphibious engineer that he envisioned, envisioned Kaufman needed elbow room. Like pedicord before him, he found his elbows had ample space in Fort Pierce, Florida. To create such a unit, he would require students with, in his words, both temperamental stability and individual initiative. To that end, Kaufman insisted that candidates be subjected to very he heavy physical training. Very heavy, he emphasized again. As he knew from his own career, first in France, then in the Blitz, this type of experience would show students that they could push beyond their physical limits, doing without sleep and food and warmth, and still function without their arms falling off. More important, training of such intensity would create its, in its students a sense of purpose and unity like nothing except actual war. Fast forward a little bit. <clears throat> Short on time, eager to screen out the obvious people that would not make it physically, and long on his desire to simulate an experience that was as close to war as possible, Kaufman decided that all three problems could be solved by the same solution, one week of misery. Never reluctant to ask for help, he walked south along tent row until he came to the section reserved for the scouts and raiders. There, still six months away from being transferred, Pettikard listened to Kaufman's proposal. He had never been asked to compress the scouts and raiders eight week physical conditioning course into one block of uninterrupted training. Certainly men could be pushed, indeed nearly broken, but what Kaufman had asked to do was another matter. In the end, Pettikord agreed. What else could he do? This was Kaufman. The seas parted at his arrival. What Petticord did not know, no one did, was that he was about to help create the, sa the sacramental cup from which, from which nearly all future naval commandos would drink. You were wet, chafed with sand, just completely miserable, remar remembered Frank Kane years later. In the daytime, men melted under the sun. At night, they shook so hard from the wet and cold that their hip flexors swelled and cramped. Their teeth chattered like jackhammers. Shouldering boats, sloshing with water, they marched for miles in sand and dunes that collapsed beneath every step. Sodden fatigues adhered to the grit and sand, turning armpits, thighs, and scrotums into raw meat. If any instructor detected a student on the stealth and concealment problem as he wormed his, his chafed and dripping body to the plantation house, the man was punished by being sent to sit inside where swarms of mosquitoes feasted on his misery. 
In addition to simple surf drills, rubber boat training included hours of paddling while harassed by the nearby Air Squadron's F-4 pilots who would try to nail the floating rafts with sacks of flower bombs. Jetty landings and night portages were attuned by based com- ambulances and performed over boulders as broad as dinner tables, the endless surf smashing the panels and men against the rocks. Intended to simulate the long drain of campaign march before battle, this seemingly endless harassment ultimately culminated in a day-long mock skirmish known as the extended order problem or to the students' so solid day. Beginning before dawn, students raced off the ramps of their landing craft just as the beach erupted in thundering sheets of flame. For a whole day, instructors armed with charges unleashed a torrent of exploding columns of water and showers of mud and debris. The students' belly crawled on throbbing knees and elbows into hip-deep mud, swamps, and surf as the explosions chased them from cover and foxholes. Until Kaufman's regime, no Navy unit had been subjected to training course whose essence so closely resembled that of real war. The frantic harassment, the inescapable cold, the relentless exhaustion, not only did it prepare men for what was to come, it set them apart from everyone else in the Navy. Even in the early classes, as many as half the men who started did not complete the week. That was entirely the point. Modeling his project on the culture of the Corps Franc, Kaufman had set out to forge both an esprit de corps and the reputation that always accompanies it, exclusivity. If you haven't been through it, he would later say, you're not a demolitioneer. In August 1943, Kaufman volunteered for his own program. At 32 years old, with eyesight not good enough to qualify for his own demolition standards, He was hardly an ideal candidate. I think I have never seen a man struggle so desperately, Warnock said after witnessing Kaufman's performance. The moment he finished his 10-mile beach run, he passed out. During the ocean swim, Warnock thought he would drown. We all knew he wasn't a great athlete, said Frank Kane, and we thought, hell, if he can make it, we can too. Throughout the training, Kaufman listed but never sank, alternately encouraging and bullying his boat crew from start to finish, as one remembered with his bloody battle cry of Cor Franck. When men showed signs of cracking during another bone-trilling dip in the ocean, Kaufman turned it into a joke, annoyingly repeating the same mocking phrase, the water he boomed in his strong mid-Atlantic accent is never cold. The Monday after Kaufman completed this week, he was ordered to report to Captain Clarence Gulbranson, the base commander of Fort Pierce. Swollen from head to foot, with fingers like sausages ready to burst, he crawled out of bed and staggered into the commander's office. What's this I hear about 40% of your classes either being in the sick bay or quitting, the captain barked. I don't think you have any idea what you're putting these men through, Draper. I do, Kaufman responded. It was hell. When Kaufman's trainees completed Hell Week, the name his week of misery misery inevitably took on, their demolitions training program progressed to its next phase. Two weeks of explosives, two weeks of reconnaissance, and three weeks of practical exercises. So there you go. Freaking Hell Week. Yeah, created by... (laughs) I mean, we, we look around, I mean... Uh, how many team guys do you know that would fit his bill today? I mean, we kind of think that we sort of created ourselves. Uh, I mean, we have a lot of people that uh, uh, sort of came together to create this program, and they're not, they don't look like us. I mean, they were sailors, uh, ship fleet sailors, I mean, that, that put this thing together. And somebody who's, you know, the most unlikely uh, person, I mean, Draper Kaufman is not what you would think of as a modern day seal or modern day frogman. And in fact, you don't want to be. He just, I mean, he's, he sort of continues to do the thing that he doesn't really want to do um, because that's the right thing that he, you know, it's the, it's, the, it's the thing that's going to accomplish the mission that he's been given, which is to demolish Hitler's Atlantic Wall. And he doesn't know how else to do it. So he, you know, he squeezes every drop of his biography into this curriculum. Uh <laughs> Fast forward a little bit. Actually, fast forward a, a pretty good chunk going into D Day. And again, you're you're 
your detail and the, the research that you did to get here is just, it's unbelievable to read. With terrified soldiers frozen in place, neither advancing or retreating, Freeman and Kaylee, Kihaley sprinted between posts, yelling obscenities and kicking the infantry men away. Once clear, Freeman gave the signal, tossed a purple smoke grenade, and Petty Officer Bass pulled the fuse. Fire in the hole! At 6.55, only 22 minutes after the landing, the whole area exploded in a roar that drowned out the battle's din, shooting skyward a mixture of water, smoke, wood, sand, and steel high into the air. The defender's response was vicious. As soon as the smoke and debris settled, the fire from the hills became unbearable. As Mingledorf, the Georgian with a hole in his leg, crawled hand over hand to the seawall in safety, a round slammed through his helmet into his forehead, killing him instantly. With the obstacles blown and the beach cover gone, Petty Officer Bass, a former CB from Durham, North Carolina, resisted the urge to run and instead found Seaman Farrell alone, still writhing from the hole in his knee and with a fresh wound to his right eye. Bass bent down to cradle the boy to cover him, and as he did, a bullet tore through his back, entering just to the right of his spine and blowing a hole out his right shoulder. Sergeant Murphy, one of the Army's naval augmentees, found them both and dragged them to the seawall. Wounded himself, and with nearly everyone in his crew either shot or dead, Freeman was unstoppable, blasting obstacles, clearing out infantrymen before his charges blew, helping his wounded to cover. Though they had been cut to shreds, Gap Assault Team 1 had completed its mission. Their 50-yard gap was clear. And that's just one little uh, chunk of the detail that you give on all these heroic acts that are going on. By mo- fast forward, by morning, by morning's ed, with the help of Hall's destroyers, the Gap Assault teams had partially cleared five of their 16 target sections along Omaha Beach. By nightfall, the total was 10. For the NCDUs, an accomplishment that came at a cost prematurely estimated at two dozen dead, at least that many wounded, and 15 more missing. These last had either been blown clear of their landing vessels and drowned or, in the words of one writer, had run off to fight with the army. In fact, some had done just that or at least abandoned their section of beach. As a handful of planners had expected, the most difficult aspect of Rommel's Atlantic Wall had been the beach and the underwater obstacles, a problem that had been overcome only because of the Navy's commitment. First in identifying the issue, next in commissioning Kaufman to solve it, then in sharing those lessons with the Army's combat engineers. Ultimately, however, the Navy's greatest contribution had come from the NCDUs themselves. In addition to the presidential unit citation, Admiral Hall had gone on to recognize the demolitioners by recommending them a trunk full of individual awards, individual awards, including six Navy crosses, one of which went to Chief Petty Officer Bill Freeman. I kicked myself ever since that I had didn't recommend him for a Medal of Honor, Hall said later. I never heard of anybody who did a greater job than that fellow did. Responsible for getting the Army past the underwater obstacles on Omaha Beach, the NCDU's achievement was, in the end, made possible only by their training at Fort Pierce. There they had learned not only the technical skills of underwater demolition, the explosives, the pull fuses, the minimum safe distances, but also, as Kaufman had insisted, the ability to push past the limits of normal human endurance to withstand cold, hunger, raw skin, exhaustion, even the chaos of combat, the kind of fortitude that made winning war as possible only our vigorous training held us together one survivor said afterward but what about but what about after that with the collapse of the Atlantic wall the mission of the NCDUs had been accomplished and therefore no unit in the US military was in greater threat of disbandment or at least would have been had it not been for one final hang-up the Navy's planners were loath to disband a unit that had just performed so effectively after all the war was far from over and there was no shortage of needs for sailors so conditioned to the combat that lay ahead. Boom. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, I don't know about you, but nobody ever connected uh, Hell Week or the reason for Hell Week to Omaha Beach. But I don't think that we would have that crucible today if it wasn't for that. Mm -hmm. Uh, It justified everything that Kaufman did. I mean, we uh, y- uh, later in the war, you see uh, y- uh, lots of people get pulled over to the UDT. 
whether they're CBs uh, or Marines or even soldiers in some instances. Uh, and those, you know, they, do, they don't necessarily go through Hell Week. If it had not been for that experience, uh, it's likely that we would not have this, uh, like, that, that crucible. Mm-hmm. And without that crucible, what would the SEAL teams be? I mean, they'd be another commando force, but would they be uh, everything that we are today? I mean, that's the defining moment of training. Right. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Well, you called it the sacramental cup. <laughs> <laughs> it is the sacrament. I mean, yeah. we all have these. Uh, I mean, uh, there's institutions all around us, whether those institutions are the U.S. Constitution or their uh, whatever uh, your Catholicism. I mean, that your faith has these little institutions built into it. And, you know, if you're going to take the catechism, uh, there's all these sacraments that you've got to do. And. What's more, uh, w- what's a bigger sacrament in you know the becoming of a seal than uh, than Hell Week? Yeah, not one. Um, you get into next uh, Tarawa, and what happens at Tarawa, which is a total nightmare. Um, I don't know if you had the chance. We we had a guy, um, Dean Ladd, that was on this podcast, and he was a Marine Corps. Wow, uh, I think he was a. I think it was a first lieutenant by that time wow. uh, that did a bunch of islands, including Tarawa, got gut shot Tarawa 800 yarders from the beach. Two Marines disobeyed orders to leave him and move forward and dragged him back to a boat. He survived, ended up going back. But um, yeah, you detail what happened there, how bad it was. And basically, if you don't know, anyone that doesn't know, the, the Marine Corps hit reefs on the way in and the boats got hung up, and so the guys had to get out and walk with no protection whatsoever through the ocean, 800, it was around 800 yards to get to the beach where there was, wasn't, you know, once they got to the beach, it was hell as well. So, and we've always known that Tarawa is the moment that, you know, the, the need for UDTs is identified. We don't exactly know the reason though. I mean, cause the Marine Corps, they come up with the, the solution or what they perceive to be the solution before the Tarawa battle even commences. And that, like I described, is the, the landing vehicle tract or the, the LVT. It's a technical problem. They have a technical solution for it. Uh, the problem with that is Turner doesn't like their solution. Uh, Kelly Turner uh, sees the cancer or sees the, the, the coral as a cancer. It is going to complicate everything uh, as far as all the the rest of the campaigns ahead of him. He doesn't want to deal with this. He wants to he he wants that coral out so he can get his Higgins boats to the beach, and the only way to do that is to find him. Yeah, and, and what's interesting too is after Tarawa, the Marine Corps solution was, you know, like you said, it was just more. Yeah, more. You just okay. So we're going to lose X percentage of boats on the way, and cool, more. <laughs> We're going to lose this many LTVs on the way in? Cool. More. Bring us more. That yep. was their answer. And Turner was saying, hey, actually not a good answer. We, right. let's, let's figure out how to solve this problem. Yeah, Churchill's quote, you know, we've, we've run out of money. Now it's time to think. I mean, it, you could just you could say, you know, just as, uh, just as much when it comes to logistics. There, I mean, there's nothing that compares with the U.S. military's logistics and manufacturing might going into this. But we still have limits. You can't. These LVTs, they take up a ton of space on all the ships that the Navy's going to use to transport them. The, the Higgins boats, they, they're easier to carry. They're faster in the water. Uh, you can time everything from naval gunfire su- support to uh, aircraft uh, coming in to support the landings if you have a faster vehicle to get them from the ships to the shores. Um, and that's what Turner wants. He wants to be able to get his ships as quickly to the beach as possible. It's the safest way. Uh, it's the easiest to get everything there. And the only way to do that is to find the coral and get rid of it. We start training now, but under Turner's direction, we start training. We're training in Hawaii now. In May, a fresh batch of NCDU recruits arrived in Maui. Per the direction of Kohler and Kaufman, the men were told to abandon the bulk of their gear, their green fatigues, their boots, their May West life jackets, even their helmets and sidearms, and slip into a pair of black Maui swim trunks and dive masks their rough rubber edges sanded down to prevent them from biting into their face. What followed were nine seemingly endless days of training on how to systematically map an underwater landscape and blow it up. Rocks, coral, night swimming, blast, no rest, no sleep, suicide stuff, one trainee remembered. For fewer, 
for no fewer than six hours a day, recruits lived in the water, perfecting their strokes until they could swim a mile before breakfast. Their only day off was Monday, when possible. Seeing that this was the first time many of them had handled explosive fused or tied primer cord into a trunk line, accidents were routine. Fingers blown clear off or hanging by bloody shreds of skin. Asked how long he could swim underwater with 100 pounds of powder, recruit Knorik replied, with 100 pounds of powder, I could probably stay under forever. <laughs> so this is, I, I highlighted that point because this is a point now where we're starting to see you know, the idea of the naked warrior. They're getting rid of all their gear. They're just wearing trunks. Um, Saipan is where we get this recon, like a, like a legit recon going on. The closer his swimmers got to the beach, the more nervous Kaufman became. At 100 yards, he tried to turn them around, but most of them kept going. At 50 yards, some began to pivot back, but some didn't. Closing to within 30 yards of the shore and 40 yards of the guns, so close that they ceased swimming and dug their toes of their sneakers into the sand, pulling themselves along with their gloved hands. When that last line finally did run out of water, each man backed off slightly, turned left, then side-stroked along the beach for 25 yards, edging his mask out of the water with every breath, breath careful to remember the locations of any gun positions under circumstances, not an easy thing to forget. On the swim back, each man ignored his exhaustion and worsening leg cramps and stayed as close as possible to the bottom. When the, they neared the reef, Kaufman reboarded his mattress and offered a nearby swimmer a tow. Get that damn thing out of here. This is the, you, you go over this earlier, all the, the little rafts that they had were getting shot up. On the other side of the now surf-slammed reef, each swimmer waited for pickup. When the landing craft arrived, the coxswains took turns motoring each man and either drop, dropped them a Jacob's ladder or reversed engines until he could grab hold and pull himself up. Throughout this cumbersome boarding, a period packed with vociferous cursing said one survivor every man aboard fully expected a mortar round to drop square into the boat as soon as the last man was loaded Kaufman tallied his numbers and realized that in addition to the officer killed on the air mattress two of his swimmers were still missing pulled in separate directions by his instinct to rescue and his orders to rush back to the fleet Kaufman looked around at his blue tinged black striped men and chose the more painful option with the fleet waiting for his information Kaufman ordered his boats back to the APDs when the men of UDT 7 arrived back at the Humphreys they discovered something remarkable though several men had been wounded some with serious internal injuries from the mortar blast not a single one of their swimmers had been lost in fact the only men that had been killed had been the ones who had remained on the lcprs as they had waited for swimmers to return kaufman's udt5 swimmers had been slightly less less fortunate with one killed several more wounded and two still missing but it was nothing compared to the bloodbath that occurred just one week before at normandy so this is another methodology of, and, uh, of executing these things, and it's it's sort of a metaphor for you know what actually happened the the entire history. So the you know the Navy uh, intentionally creates all of these units. They create NCDUs, they create uh, the UDTs, they create the Scouts and Raiders. All these units are created for a specific purpose. They're committed to action for a specific reason. Uh, but once the Navy creates these things, the Navy can't necessarily predict how far the individuals. That, are, that belong to these institutions are going to push them. They're going to push those envelopes. So Kaufman, you know, when he's driving his men toward the beach or he's pushing his men to swim, he also is trying to stop them. He's trying to stop them 50 yards from shore. They won't. They keep going 25 yards. So you know, the, the SEAL teams are created by the Navy. They're created by the Navy for the Navy. But the, you, know, you, you can sort of see it just in that moment. Um, the SEAL teams become so much more because of the SEALs themselves. So the SEALs don't create it. We, we don't. We're not responsible for our own institutions. We think we are, but we're not. But we are uh, responsible for what that institution ultimately became. Yeah, you know, there's an interesting tie-in that you make in the book, and I don't, I don't remember if it's in my notes to cover us. I'll just mention it now. Um, the Navy, <laughs> the Navy, just by nature of being disaggregated and being spread apart, especially back in the day, there was decentralized command unlike really unlike any other organization absolutely and that that spirit of decentralized command of like hey you go and you make you take the fight to the enemy you get in this ship or you get in this submarine you go overseas and you take the fight to the enemy that's you have mission type orders right and that's that's the way the navy had had to exist back in the day and that vein and that 
that DNA remains. And that's why you get these guys that are very proactive and will 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 be default aggressive out there on the battlefield. That's the, that's exactly right. Default aggressive latitude only works if your default uh, orientation or uh, default setting is aggression. And if you read any uh, like naval history book during like uh, you know the Napoleonic Wars, or if you read you know the Patrick O'Brien Master and Commander series, like you're you're never you know connected to your chain of command. Whereas the army uh, always is. Always is. Yeah. So that uh, you know as technology has improved or has, as technology has gotten better to connect commanders to their troops in the field, that chain of command has only thickened. Whereas in the navy. I mean, we have all of this history behind us, uh, or the Navy has all of this history behind it, of latitude, of mission-type orders, of relying on the aggressiveness of the individual commander. You just have to trust your guys. Mm-hmm. But you have to be specific about what you want. Oh, for sure. So Otherwise, you get rogue. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, you do talk about what the UDTs brought back from that, and what they brought back was good information, good intel that they could then form into uh, make a better battle plan. The invasion of Saipan goes smoother. Um, Fast forward a little bit. By the fall of 1944, the Navy's underwater demolition teams were the most indispensable of all U.S. military's special operations units, a facet directly attributed to the Central Pacific planners who would no longer go anywhere without their reconnaissance reports. The UDTs were an essential part of our amphibious organization for the remainder of the war, wrote Turner on the last day of combat on Tinian. It is... It is questionable if we could have made our landings except after the great losses, except after great losses if we had not had these teams to prepare the way. This assessment was immediately echoed by Admiral Connolly, who concluded his invasion in Guam by declaring that without UDT's discovery and demolition of some 640 obstacles along 3,000 yards of beaches, including the nearly car-sized coconut log cribs filled with loose coral, the landings, quote, would, could not have been made. There, in spite of orders forbidding them to do so, three demolition swimmers, including Gunner's first mate, Gunner's first mate, Gunner's mate first class, Henry L. Green, had grown so convinced of the UDT's worth that they had planted a white butcher block sized sign at the water's edge with the following message, U.S. Marine, welcome to the USO, greetings from UDT-4. Hearing this, Admiral Connolly had summoned the team's commander to his stateroom in order to hand him a starch counseling, but instead had neutralized his own admonitions by stopping the young officer at the door, declaring, wait till I tell Turner, Turner, he'll have those Marine generals eating crow. (laughs) Um... It's so childish, but it's, yeah, it's I mean, so childish. But that's yeah, I mean that's, that's what it how. is. I mean, how many times have you and your service you you know interacted with you know um, you know a sister service? And I mean the rivalry exists. Yeah, like it's a you know it's a brotherhood you know on the battlefield. But still, we're you know always chasing our institutional prerogatives or trying to you know push the boundaries yeah. of uh, uh, you know our our institutional authority. Yeah, and what's interesting is when you get into the senior ranks, there becomes real. There's a real tension between the services and the and the amount of money that they get, right. and and it's a becomes a real thing. Um, but yeah, <laughs> you you say here to recognize their contribution for taking of the Marion, Marianas Turner showered the UDTs with awards, more than sixty silver stars, three hundred bronze stars, reported the largest mass recommendation for sailors and Marines in the war up to that point. Given the importance of the job, Connolly would have pinned Navy crosses on on the commanding officers of UDT three and four, but ended in the end settled for silver stars, each of them presented by none other than Admiral Kaufman, Draper's father. As for Draper himself, rumors circulated about his nomination for the Medal of Honor, an accolade his father, chairman of the awards board in the Pacific, lobbied against for fear of the medals association with recklessness. In the end, Draper received a Navy cross, his second, pinned on by his father with a comment that allowed the photographer to catch the serious young man in a laugh. Thank the Lord you found a clean shirt. Yeah, that's a relationship I could have spent a lot more time on. Yeah. I mean, he's, you know, Draper's dad is out there, you know, in the fleet. He's he's a Commodore himself, and, uh, you know, he knows exactly the risks that his son is taking, and he does nothing uh, during the entire war uh, to either 
convince Turner, uh, you know, to have the UDT take less risk. Uh, he he just he, he's as uh, you know. I I, I don't know uh, as a father, and I know you're a father too. Like I don't know that I'd be able to to keep myself uh, disciplined enough to to not interfere. Get but him, he does. You'd get him orders to uh, the Washington D.C. Uh, admin spot. <laughs> yeah, I just don't know how. Whatever that impulse, uh, you know, that, the, that those guys had, I, I don't know that it's, it exists today. But either that, you'd make him a freaking boat crew leader at UDT four, <laughs> <Maybe>. <laughs> just freaking ready to get some. Maybe. Uh, this is just you, you jump into this next part, chapter six, the contest for the guerrilla war in China and the organization that had no damn business fighting in it, the U.S. Navy's Army of Sailors. This is just freaking buck wild, this whole (laughs) section. I mean, you get this guy, born Milton E. Roberts in 1900 in Jerome, Arizona. Miles spent his first years in a mountainside mining hub called by the New York Sun in 1903, the wickedest town in the West. He was only a child. He was the only child of a lumber cutter who was nearly thirty years older than his mother. Before Miles was even eight, his father was dead, which was something of a blessing, as it had given given his mother an opportunity to move and remarry. Then in Seattle, his stepfather Miles had received from his stepfather Miles had received the last name he would live with, but not much else. At fourteen, Miles ran away from home, and you just set up this background with this guy. He enlists in the Navy. He ends up doing taking some test to get into the in Ireland to get into the Naval Academy. He gets in, goes to the Naval Academy, um, gets and then he gets deployed to China for a five year tour. Ends up, um, you know, doing operations in the Yangtze River. This is the warlord period. He learns about leadership, diplomacy, geography, small boat handling, how to shoot his way out of a holdup. Unlike most Westerners, uh, picks up various coastal dialects. So this dude's speaking freaking Chinese or Mandarin or whatever. Um, he, he's brilliant. I mean, I, there's nobody. I mean, like I say, you know, I mean, we got our history not just from you know frogmen. We got it from you know just fleet sailors. And this is, I mean. <laughs> Did Milton you ever Miles. see the movie Sand Pebbles? Yeah, this what? is Sand Pebbles. Yeah, this is Sand. I, 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 so Sand Pebbles, go watch it if you haven't seen it. I know you haven't seen it, Echo Charles, because it's a classic. <laughs> it's an actual good movie. There, yeah. There's no, there's not many like CGI explosions in it. But yeah, this is Sand yes, Pebbles sir. all day. We had the movie Sand Pebbles on one of my ARG deployments. This is back before internet or anything, so we just had videotapes. We would watch Sand Pebbles over and over again, um, and that's what this guy is doing. He's in. So he's ends up running these freaking gorillas in China, yeah, which is nuts. He, um, he's, I mean, nobody knows about him today. Like, he's, he's completely forgotten to history, but, it, I mean, he's every bit as consequential, at least as far as uh, the Navy's uh, journey from, uh, the, you know, the ocean to, to the land as, you know, say somebody like Lawrence of Arabia. He doesn't have the the style of somebody mm-hmm. like that, which is probably you know part of the reason that he's forgotten. And you know his book, A uh, Different Kind of War, is you know it's 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 not you know seven pillars of wisdom, <laughs> but um, you know the, the, he he wrote that thing when he had been diagnosed with uh, uh, with uh, prostate cancer. So he was racing against the clock to to try and get this recorded. Oof. And he was you know he knew he only had maybe a year uh, to live, and he's you know drafting this thing. He's typing up little sections of it. Uh, his wife. Um, you know, is is uh, cutting these sections out to reorder them, and he's pu- and she's putting these things together with scotch tape. Uh, I actually found that record uh, in the the National Archives; it still exists. So he talks about, or uh, his his wife uh, wrote a the forward to the book to say, you know, how this was done, how it was cut, retaped together, and everything God. like that. And then to see that, to find that in the National Archives, to hold you know these retaped together pages pretty incredible but you know like i said this guy he is the navy's version of lawrence of arabia i mean he's the it's freaking he, crazy yeah insane um and, he, and he's a flag officer yeah and he's involving himself in the entire war in these little mini skirmishes and ambushes it's i mean he he's almost uh killed three times just by assassins yeah it's nuts it's, nuts. it's a freaking crazy story and he loses his mind in the process yeah yeah oh <laughs> uh, you say this along with his promotion to admiral king elevated se- uh, SACO, which is the Sino-American Cooperation Organization, this is this group that they got running all over China, to Naval Group China, an act that likewise elevated each camp to a formal, and they got all these camps, they got all these camps set up. He's running this network of camps. Um, uh, 
an act that likewise elevated each camp to a formal naval unit and invested Miles with the authority of a group commander, increasing his roles to 600 officers and 2,400 enlisted men, about 300 more than allotted to a World War II battleship and a commitment by the Navy that was further augmented by various numbers of Marines, Coast Guardsmen, and radio operators. To supply all these men, Miles received two planes, their engines rarely idle, to which ferry loads from Chongqing to the various camps. The gas alone for these planes gobbled up as much as half of Miles' monthly tonnage allotment over the hump, but for the first time in the war, Sacco camps began began receiving at least a portion of what they deserved. So this guy is running a freaking crazy guerrilla war. Um, he's running an army. He's a he's a naval commander who's running an army like uh, like we talked about earlier. <laughs> he's running. He has no communication with these units for the most part. So he's 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 getting these commanders, mostly Marines, uh, that are that are coming to him. He's giving them a spine of sailors to go work with, and then this Marine commander and these uh, Navy sailors are trucking sometimes three months at a time to get to their station in China. They set up a camp. They start training Chinese guerrillas, and then they commit them to action. Um, and because he has no communication with them, he has to rely on the aggressiveness of each of these uh, leaders. In some cases it works out, in some cases it doesn't. So really all he's doing at this point is just managing his, his talent pool and assessing whether or not they're sending back you know, aggressive enough reports about the operations that they're undertaking. Uh, anyway. Yeah, you, you, you cover it. I mean, it's just... It's inc- it's an incredible story. Again, that's and, probably and ten so, books in its, its own right. It's ten books. Like and and, <laughs> and the thing that like was uh, I was blown away with, and I, I focus my uh, attention of this chapter on Camp Six because Camp Six is really the only unit uh, in Sako that is run by uh, a member of Naval Spe- Special Warfare. Every every other camp, uh, except in rare instances, is, is run by a Marine. So the the legacy of those camps is you know. Uh, you know, understandably, you know, a feather in the Marine Corps cap. They should be uh, nothing but, you know, impressed with the legacy of the the Marine Corps led units. But uh, Admiral King, towards the uh, towards the tail end of this period, you know, they're running out of Marines to send. And not only that, but the Scouts and Raider program is going away. Admiral King doesn't want it to go away. He wants to send, uh, you know, sort of quasi marine sailors to backfill uh, the marine commitment to Sacco. So he repurposes uh, the Scouts and Raider School, turns it into the Amphibious Rider School, and is trying to get as many uh, marine type sailors into Sacco as possible uh, to justify this course. So we don't have to get rid of this course after uh, the end of World War II. Uh, and Camp Six uh, becomes sort of the repository of all of that experience. Buck Halpern, who you mentioned at the beginning mm-hmm. of the book, the uh, the Jewish uh, uh, Notre Dame quarterback, he gets sent there. Uh, Buck Hal- uh, uh, Phil Bucklew uh, comes comes west and starts uh, reading, leading reconnaissance uh, and raiding operations. Uh, but yeah, Camp Six is the um, Camp Six is the first. Uh, instance of naval special warfare really going ashore, and they do everything. They do raids. They do uh, ship attacks. Uh, by the end of the war, Halpern is literally leading from the saddle uh, on a horse uh, and pushing his guerrillas into action. It's incredible. Yeah, yeah. It's it's freaking. It's just a great story. And again, it it, it you know um, I've often said that. We, you know, when, when I got in the teams, I don't know when you got in this. Still, so wasn't there was no doctrine when you got in the teams. There was no doctrine when I got in the teams. You couldn't, if you wanted to know how to do uh, uh, an assault on a target, you you couldn't look it up. Someone had to tell you. Your platoon chief or your LPO was going to teach you how to do it. It wasn't written down anywhere. Whereas the Army and the Marine Corps, you can look up exactly how to do a target assault. It tells you step by step what to do. So we don't have any doctrine. We have more now, but that's one of. Uh, one of our biggest weaknesses is that we don't have any doctrine. Hmm. One of our biggest strengths is that we don't have any doctrine. <laughs> and and that's why you get a freaking guy that's like, oh, cool, what are we gonna do? We're gonna on a course back, raids, that's, that's what's happening? Cool, let's figure out how to do it. And, and again, that decentralized command, the default aggressive attitude, that's, that's, in, that's gotta be in, that's the DNA of the SEAL teams. Okay, yeah. And it's rooted Absolutely. back to Camp Six. Camp Six, nothing like it. <sighs> Fast forward, 
The end of the war should have been the happiest day of my life, wrote Miles afterward, tasked with an impossible mission and yoked to impossible partners. He had nevertheless achieved something greater than ever been asked of him, a Navy-run guerrilla army and intelligence infrastructure that had stretched from Indochina to the Gobi Desert. Assisted by Marines, his sailors had trained as many as 100,000 Chinese guerrillas, rescued airmen and missionaries, blasted open Japanese tanks, blown up some 158 bridges, derailed some 66 Japanese trains, sunk 35 Japanese ships, raided uncountable Japanese camps, and led at least one cavalry charge on camels. Best estimates at the time placed the number of Sacco inflicted casualties at around 26,717 killed, 8,702 wounded, 600, 346 captured. Of the roughly 2,500 Americans who served in Seiko, five were killed. That's amazing. That's amazing. That's amazing. And this isn't even con- c- considering the strategic impact of <sighs> Sacco because you know, they're tying down a million Japanese troops the entire time. Yeah. Troops that could be fighting on all those islands right, that the Marines sure. are slogging across. For sure. But they can't. A million. I mean, there's, you know, when you think of there's 30 or 40,000 Japanese on these islands, when most yeah. of these islands, somewhere around that number, you know, if you have an extra million soldiers to throw into that mix. As was true of every successful general in history, Miles' success had come at the price of his sleep, his health, his family's happiness, and even his sanity. For his sacrifices, he had been heaped not with praise and press releases, but with troubles, bureaucracy, and overweening scrutiny. In the end, Seiko, along with the Navy's guerrilla warfare effort, received a reward as glamorous as an obituary. As Miles bitterly concluded, the month that followed the surrender of Japan was the worst through which I lived. Uh, After hosting a dinner for many of his Seiko officers, this is after the war, this is right after the war, Miles began a rambling, seemingly endless lecture on what the atomic bomb would mean for the U.S. Navy's future. As men awkwardly drifted out of the room, Miles continued unaware when every man had left and when the lights had been turned off. After the camp doctor confined him to his stateroom, Miles jumped from the window and took off sprinting through a rice paddy. Chased by a group of American advisors and Chinese guerrillas, he escaped past them all and stole a jeep. As he rattled past his pursuers, he was heard muttering over and over, I must get to the drill field. Block the road, God damn it! that's an order, he shouted. Shouted the camp's doctor to the driver of a six by six truck. When the Jeep reached the roadblock, Miles jumped out and ordered the truck driver to move. The doctor countermanded the order and told Miles to return to his quarters, whereupon Miles accused everyone of lying to him. You're on the sick list, the f- doctor finally managed. What are you saying, doctor? I'm all right. I don't think you are, Admiral, the doctor replied nervously, and, and have to officially inform you that you are on the sick list and have been relieved of your command. As the words drilled into Miles' delusion, the doctor could feel him shaking like a leaf. Finally, Miles relented, aye, aye, doctor. He hopped back into the Jeep, returned to his quarters. Next morning, he was placed under house arrest and his razor confiscated. In Washington, Metzel met Mrs. Billy Miles and informed her that her husband had a complete mental breakdown and that they could only hope he had not suffered permanent brain damage. No, they yeah. broke him. I mean, he, you know, he 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 literally left everything in China. Uh, when he comes back, it takes months and months before he regains his sanity. But he, uh, in, you know, this whole theater of warfare was. I mean, and and it's uh, the just dealing with the Chinese on a daily basis. I mean, so many uh, other people have tried. Uh, Joe Stilwell tries to deal with Chiang Kai-shek. He, I mean, he's frustrated his entire war. He leaves not in disgrace, but at least in, in massive frustration. Uh, Wiedemeyer has the same uh, headaches with the Chinese. But what Stilwell and Wiedemeyer don't have to deal with is uh, an oppressive, uh, the oppressive army scrutiny. And that when the army gets there, I mean, they see China as clearly, you know, their area of operations. Uh, and it is. I mean, there, you can't argue with it. I mean, it's it's a it's the land. I mean, just like if the army decided that they were going to uh, seize control of the South China Sea, the navy <laughs> would certainly have something to say about it. But when they get there, you know, the navy has this infrastructure in place, and they don't know what to do with it. Uh, so they try to, uh, you know, pr- 
progressively take control of uh, Miles's organization. And um, in the end, uh, Miles loses out. The Army takes control of it. Uh, and the only thing that stops them um, from really seizing control is all of the trouble that Miles has had, which is geography. They can't seize control of this thing. Miles uh, maintains his command over his organization for the remainder of the war. <clears throat> so the problem is the solution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's it. Um, you, I got to mention this this section here. At the time of the Japanese surrender, Rudy Bosch, a 17 year old <laughs> volunteer with the Amphibious Rogers, looked up from the middle of the training exercise in the swamps near Lake Okeechobee to hear the class instructor announce, "Stop what you're doing. The war is over." Told to return to Fort Pierce, Bosch and his classmates were then given a single final order: tear it down. What followed was the sacking of three years worth of construction. Mess halls, classrooms, offices, ranges, towers, before a backdrop of flaming white tents, tents that had once proudly lined the roads, sheltering the nearly every the nearly every special group in the US military from the Rangers to the UDTs. The Rogers, who had not gotten a crack at China, took out their frustrations by demolishing everything with their bare hands. By the end of the week, the only thing that suggested the past experience of a naval base was the pool. Last to go were the men themselves. That's it. War's over. Yep. And with it, the the Rogers too. And uh, yeah, we didn't even talk. We're, we're, give us a quick brief on the Rogers. Well, the Rogers are the uh, the sort of the natural uh, culmination of uh, the Scouts and Raider program. So the Scouts and Raiders, uh, they're the uh, the. The name sort of doesn't make sense. I mean, they, the the scouts and raiders seem like they would be, you know, reconnaissance troops and commandos. They really weren't. Scouts and raiders are a joint unit uh, created at the very beginning of the war. It's an army navy unit. Uh, the the idea is uh, we need uh, army scout boat officers to uh, take army beach marking troops ashore, so the army can. Um, uh, you know, signal the landing fleet, signal the landing craft so troops can get into the right beaches. Uh, this is what they do in North Africa. Uh, the problem is after North Africa, the Army starts to lose interest in this, and, and there's, uh, they, they, they stop creating uh, their portion of the scouts and raiders because there's, they, have, they have enough, you know, beach-marking troops for the remainder of the war. So they basically leave the, uh, the entire schoolhouse in the hands of the Navy which, you know, now the Navy has all this curriculum and they have no prohibition on what the Navy's portion of the Scouts and Raider program can do. So uh, naturally the Navy starts, you know, taking not just the, the transportation side of the mission, but they take the, the entire beach marking side of the mission. So uh, they have troops that are quasi, you know, commandos that are trained to do beach marking. Uh, but, you know, at this point in the war, um, or in 1945, uh, when... Uh, Sako has been created, um, they realize that they can use these troops uh, not just for beach marking anymore, but for straight up commando operations. They have the Army's curriculum, they have all the experience of working with uh, Army commandos, so they train their sailors in everything that the Army commandos have been trained with, and they, the plan is to send these, uh, send these units to China, and that's the Amphibious Rogers. So the Scouts and Raiders uh, naturally, they, they, I have a picture, I think, in the book of uh, the, there's a sign, you know, that says Scouts and Raiders, and then underneath it, the Amphibious Rogers. Within months, there's no more Scouts and Raiders sign. It's the Amphibious <laughs> Rogers. So, but not, not the best name yeah. <laughs> for a commando unit, but the idea was that, uh, you know, the, these were the, the Navy's pirates. You know, right. the Roger right. was the, Roger. the Jolly Roger. Yeah. These guys are supposed to be the swaggering, you know, bushwhackers <laughs> of, the, of the Pacific. Um, uh Chapter 7, the U.S. Navy's post-war plight and the sailor raiders who led her back to significance in Korea. Um, again, there's just so much detail that you put into this. It's fa- absolutely fascinating to read. You end up highlighting, now we're in, I'll fast forward to, we're in Korea, um, Target Baker. This time, the scouts were accompanied by a boatload of Marines who, upon landing, established a hasty perimeter, then flashed seaward the signal for all clear. When the remaining boats hit the shore, the Marines secured a beachhead, then scouted inland for the tunnel entrance. As they did, two trains appeared and did the job for them, revealing the location of the two rail tunnels. To the southernmost, the scouts put to flight one sentry armed with nothing but a wooden rifle and a bayonet. 
After securing the southern tunnel, the UDT swimmers slogged some 2,000 pounds of explosives 300 yards past the beach where they stacked pack after pack into the tunnel's mouth and under a bridge. At 0305, the UDT swimmers pulled their fuses, initiating a hasty six-minute retreat to the beach and the boats, followed by a concert of oars through the surf. At 3.30, noted the task force diary, charges exploded. 20 minutes later, the men of SOG climbed back into the, ba- into the bass, which was the ship, and into history as the Navy's first successful raiders of the modern area era. For joy and for many of the Navy planners, it was just a start. Yeah, that was a tough chapter. Sorry, that was a tough chapter to sort of figure out what where the center of gravity of this thing is. Like what, because the, I mean, just the the number of raider organizations that the Navy sponsors during this period. They sponsor uh, the Marine Corps UDT group, which is uh, the Special Operations Group at, at the time, the SOG. Um, they they, spon- they sponsor uh, UDT led British commandos. They sponsor uh, Army uh, raiders. They, I mean, everybody is trying to figure out how to. Uh, you know, um, do sort of what the uh, Koreans were doing to the U.S. military at that point, which is bottled up in the Pusan perimeter. There's, it's, it's like, uh, you know, we've been watching a Pusan perimeter moment in Afghanistan. Their uh, uh, lack of leadership, lack of planning, um, uh, lack of resourcing, uh, you know, forces uh, the uh, army or the uh, the U.S. Uh, forces back into this this small pocket, and they're doing everything they can to sort of not necessarily break out of it, but at least uh, you know not do nothing. And the not doing nothing is trying to uh, you know cut the uh, North Koreans' uh, supply lines. And and the one advantage that uh, they have when the, with the Korean Peninsula is all of these arteries, all of these roads, because of the the spine of the the, the North Korean geography. Is they push everything to the to the edges of the uh, of the peninsula, so this is the first time the Navy really sees you know this huge opportunity to start you know sponsoring raids ashore. That's the first time that the the UDT, which is the only special operations uh, unit that survives disbandment in World War II, uh, that's the that's the moment that they cease to be just beach marking or uh, just reconnaissance troops and demolition troops, and they start going ashore. But they, you know, like every other instance, uh, they are going ashore not alone. They're going ashore with the Marines, uh, with British commandos, CIA operatives, partisans, uh, and they're slowly uh, learning. Uh, this trade. Mm-hmm. You go into uh, chapter eight here, tells another story of the Rangers and the Army, resurrection of the Army Rangers and the guerrilla raid that failed to forestall their second death. Um, just, just another one of these. Uh, you got a guy named John Hugh McGee. Mm-hmm. <laughs> These characters, all of them, mm-hmm. they're freaking epic. Uh, I, I mean, what this guy did um, is just incredible. Um, his career, <laughs> you look at these guys' career. Um, and some, and I mean, at least in John McGee's case, I mean, he, he's a totally, uh, I mean, he, he maybe has the worst World War II experience of anybody. Yeah. Uh, l- gets, l- let me just jump into that real quick. Um, a year later, McGee was at the epicenter of history, hopelessly commanding Moro troops in the Philippines against Japanese bombers in the snake-choked malarial hills around Del Monte Field, Del Monte Airfield, at kilometer one seventeen of the Sayre Highway, becoming the only American of the eleven who fought to there to survive the war. After six months of resistance, on May tenth, nineteen forty-two, McGee swallowed his pride, obeyed his superior, and with a humiliating blindfolded salute surrendered himself and his American and Filipino troops to imperious Japanese officer wearing a kimono. Many of the Filipinos were tied to stakes, shot, and buried in pits. The Japanese soldiers never bothering to confirm they were dead. At 33, McGee's dark brown hair had already faded into an iron gray. For the next 25 months, McGee survived beatings, trench foot, dysentery, malaria, mosquitoes, cages, and slavery. For nourishment, he and his fellow prisoners were fed a meager diet of rice and a few vegetables that occasionally included yams, dog meat, wafer thin candy bars, and cigarettes. The last two purchased with a monthly allotment of 40 pesos that the Japanese could turn into a lever to pry prisoners' submission. 
So sensitive did the men become to their hunger that when fearful of transfer, they gorged themselves on every scrap they had hidden. One man even devouring a litter of puppies born the same day. Along with his Catholic faith to which he cleaved, McGee sustained his mind on a series of escape plans into the Philippine jungle, even making use of a urinary tract infection that kept him up at night to memorize the guideposts of the constellations. To each plan was attached an obvious colorary, obvious to him anyways. Once escaped, he would raise and lead an army of Filipino guerrillas against the Japanese. For two years, he plotted, mentally choosing men for work details, not for strength, but for their knowledge in gunnery and logistics, men around whom he could build the guerrilla army in his mind. On the night of June 12th, two years, one month, and two days after his capture, he finally got his chance. While anchored off the east coast of Zamboanga Peninsula on a prison transfer ship, McGee palmed off his rosary beads to a friend, dropped every stitch of his ragged clothing to the deck, then tiptoed over his sleeping comrades, placed a naked foot on top of the railing and dove into the racing current. Through an initial volley of the, through an initial volley of bullets and past two other prison ships, McGee drifted for miles until rescued by a native, by a native in an outrigger who paddled him to land, gave him a t-shirt, which McGee turned into a loincloth. Ashore, two native boys eventually found, fed and clothed him, tied it, undersized sneakers to the bottom of his feet like heelless slippers, then pushed and pulled his emaciated frame over jungle trails lit by nothing more than a torch as bright as a cigar tip. And and you go on from there, but just you have to kind of realize what's happening <laughs> with this guy and where this guy came from. And, um, and what he wants. Yeah. He, he spends the entire war, you know, essentially just neutralized. Yeah. Well, it's it, so he's in prison camp for two years. When he finally escapes, he wants to go run a run a freaking yeah. an army, a, a guerrilla army. Well, there's other people that have already been running a guerrilla army, and they and now they outrank him. They have the experience, and so he kind of gets sidelined the whole time. His war is just a series of disappointments. <sighs> yeah. So he and and when he gets back home, you know, to he finally meets the daughter uh, that his wife uh, he meets he meets his daughter who he's never met before. And uh, his reaction is immediately to volunteer for service back in the uh, in the Pacific Theater. And the day he gets back, the day he takes command of uh, his his troops, uh, they drop the they drop the bomb. And the entire time, I mean, that he's been you know neutralized this entire time, facing these series of disbandments. His little brother has been one of Merrill's uh, Merrill uh, Merrill's Marauders' uh, most effective uh, battalion commanders, which is a really frustrating thing for this poor guy. The psychology behind that. Yeah, so when he finally gets to Korea, uh, and, you know, he has this uh, new opportunity to prove himself, all he wants to do is create the, you know, the, the army that he had built in his mind, and he gets there, and, or, anyway, you have the... There's a... There's a so they go they end up he ends up putting together kind of a, a group McGee's Rangers is that he, correct he, accurate statement I mean he he's the uh, um, he's the indispensable person when it comes to army special operations in Korea everything sort of flows out of him uh, he has all of these ideas at the beginning of the war and he he puts them all in writing and um, so everything from the uh, the army Rangers are uh, reconstituted based off of his recommendations. Uh, the partisan command is created uh, based off of his recommendations, uh, and he wants to sort of uh, combine these these units together. He's got this idea; it's sort of unformed. It's not uh, it's not exactly what you know, it's not a mature idea uh, um, uh, in, it, at the beginning of the war. It becomes you know you you see when you when you look through the structure of the institution that he had uh, sort of created, you see like uh, like a the, siege of soda form, yeah, like almost. the components are yeah, there. Yeah, like they're there. Like you can see, and and every time that he constitutes this thing, he uh, the navy is a critical part of his ideas. You can't do any of the types of things that he wants to do unless you have significant navy support, navy transports. Uh, anyway, so uh, the problem is, you know, the the army. Uh, has moved pia- moved past all of his ideas. They, you know, they uh, they entertain him. They entertain the, these ideas for a period, uh, and uh, as you see throughout uh, uh, his service, the army plucks these things off the table one at a time, leaving him uh, to go back to you know the states, not in disgrace, but not not to fulfill the thing that he wants. 
he got these he's got these ranger groups together again and here's a here's a section where the rangers are his some of his mcgee's rangers are going out they're on an operation i'm going to jump into the middle of this operation after a moment of intense argument watson ordered back one of the koreans they had left their radio watson ordered back one of the koreans koreans to get the radio who not surprisingly refused until watson threatened to beat the man himself Scrambling to the clearing, the Korean soldier seized the radio by the backstrap, then dragged it behind him, bouncing, rolling, smashing over rocks, and leaving a trail of broken knobs, handles, and antenna. Bastard's got his brains in his ass, seethed Watson as he watched. When the runner reached the trees and presented the radio, everyone could see that it was destroyed. With their only hope for survival buoyed upon the ability to communicate their position to the Navy's fighters and helicopters, the radio's destruction meant Virginia, that's the name of the team, Virginia's was not far behind. Had Watson wanted to repay this cruelty in kind, his rage was instantly short-circuited by the shredding sound of a machine gun fire and the terror of communist soldiers lunging across the body-strewn clearing. Without a word, as Thornton recalled, the Virginia survivors plunged into the trees and careened down the hill in a wild melee. Stumbling, rising, running, and falling again, hoping with every bruise to break through to the valley floor before the enemy cinched the noose around their necks. After running for what seemed like a half a mile, the men collapsed into the relative protection and shadow of a ravine. As their lungs pumped miniature fog banks into the cold air, their ears caught the growing but unmistakable hum of hum and chop of two helicopters echoing through the valley. When the first helicopter made it back to the clearing, its pilot edged into a hover, kicked out a bundle of supplies, then leaned out his window, coming face to face with a volley of muzzle flashes. Banking hard, the pilot escaped and ambush, the ambush only barely. With the clearing obviously overrun, both pilots rolled, rolled their helicopters into an anxious racetrack, search around the mountains, flying so low that Thornton could easily make out each pilot's face. Without a radio, even without even marking panels, the Virginia, Virginia survivors waved frantic arms but betrayed not a sound since any noise would only alert their hunters, not the engine-deafened pilots. For 30 or so minutes, the pilots searched, then ascended and retraced their path to the ocean. Virginia was alone, except for the blowing wind and the rustle of the leafless trees, remembered Thornton. There was silence, lonely, empty silence. They, they go on the run, you, you highlight, you, you go through some of that, and then finally fast forward a little bit. On April 10th, 10 hallucinatory days since the mountaintop battle and just two to three miles from UN lines, the last remaining members of Virginia mission were cornered in a cave, captured and ransacked, then beaten and bound with wire so tightly that Watson's arms soon swelled to twice their normal size. For the second time in his life, this veteran of the Darby's Rangers was a prisoner of war. As fate would have it, captured while escaping from a disaster as consequential for the Rangers as Cisterna had been. And this guy Watson, you you um, you you introduce him later, and you have to get the book to f- see what this guy's about. But let me give you a little something. <laughs> so this guy get, gets captured in the 29 months since his capture. Corporal Martin R. Watson, a soldier no guard or prisoner believed was actually a corporal, had set an example for captivity that to this day was, has never been exceeded. 30 days after he was captured, for 18 of which he had been starved in a cave to make his 240 pound size somewhat easier to handle, Watson and a South Korean comrade had knocked out a guard with a rock and made for the surrounding mountains where they had survived for five days until their pursuers had disabled them by rolling a grenade into their hideout. Never medically treated, except with some shreds of brown paper to cover his wound wounds, Watson had nevertheless escaped again, this time by wriggling out of his rope restraints and jumping free of a moving truck as it slowed around a bend. This time he survived a week before inadvertently walking right past a wide-eyed North Korean patrol. For these attempts and one other, plus an attempt at suicide with a piece of broken glass, he had been relentlessly beaten with rifle butts and boot heels and periodically starved and always, almost always isolated, once in an unsheltered hole for 72 days with rations described by the record as sparse. 
rightly suspected as an OSS spy and saboteur. Watson had also been subjected to almost daily interrogation by North Koreans, Chinese, and even Russians who had drilled him on his exposure to the Gestapo in World War II, but especially on the organization's methods and tactics of the paratroop unit to which they knew he belonged. Watson's response to these and other questions had been a mixture of stony silence or intentional contradiction, responses that had invariably earned him a switch across the eyes, a pistol barrel across the face, or hours of kneeling with his nose pressed against a wall, and then a stone on his head. Throughout these deprivations, Watson had never lost his bearing or conviction. Once standing during a packed camp lecture by a British speaker from the London Daily Worker to say that he didn't know what communism was and he didn't care to find out. Nor did he and his fellow POWs want to listen to this traitor, commie, son of a bitch. For this affront and as his example to other prisoners, he was eventually frog marched before a military tribunal informed of the armistice, then sentenced to death by firing squad. He still didn't talk. In the end, after having been starved from 240 pounds to 120, his was an example that earned him the final distinction as the second to last UN POW to be released across the Freedom Bridge. On the other side, he learned that the rangers he had so steadfastly protected from exposure no longer existed. As far removed now from the army's interest as was the man who had resurrected them from the grave, a man whose accomplishments had disappointingly matched those of his past. About the same time that Operation Spitfire had been unraveling, Colonel John Hugh McGee, the Korean War author of the Army, Rangers, and Korean Partisans, had presented himself for the third time to the Quonson Hut maze of the 8th Army's headquarters in Pusan, intent on securing a date for a partisan advance into North Korea, a date for which he had long been waiting. The reply from his superior had been simple, never. After a year-long tour, McGee left Korea as dejected as he had left the Philippines, never again to have a chance to lead a partisan army on a campaign of liberation. On top of everything else, he was branded the scapegoat for the failure of Virginia and Spitfire, failures with consequences beyond a battered reputation. Yeah, that, uh, I mean, the... The way that the Army is treating special operations in this period is um, similar to the way that they dealt with them in, in uh, World War II. They are created the Rangers. They attach them to divisions for control. Uh, in each instance, the divisional commanders, they don't see much distinction between the Rangers and their own infantry. So they treat them like infantry. And usually they use them as their front-line infantry. And uh, predictably, they get mauled. And then the commanders justify their own belief that they were just like infantry. So the only thing that really could have kept the rangers of the army uh, from disbanding them would have been the sort of raid that uh, uh, McGee sends Watson and his team to complete, which is a, a penetration raid, a, a deep, uh, you know, a deep penetration raid um, behind enemy lines to destroy a tunnel uh, for. Lots of reasons. Uh, the the rug gets pulled out from under the, this team before they even go, uh, and their chances of, of success before they even launch are diminished to n almost nothing. They still go, and like you read that passage that you read, I mean, the survival, the lengths that they go just to survive, uh, are incredible. Um, and this mission is almost completely lost to history. I mean, when I started researching that mission <clears throat> and researching Watson, I. I didn't have a lot to go on. There's really only a couple of accounts about it. Uh, and I had, you know, based off of what I had done, uh, the research I'd done for, for my World War II chapters, I sort of knew, or I sort of suspected that there would be like some uh, post POW report about Watson. Couldn't find it well, the first time I went to the archives, but uh, 
I, I knew that these reports were roughly, you know, two pages. Whenever anybody was recovered from a POW camp, the military would interview them. They would put uh, the, the circumstances of their capture uh, and the circumstances of, uh, of uh, their captivity in these reports, and, you know, they'd you know, lock it away in, a, uh, in an archive someplace. So I knew that this report probably existed, so I uh, contacted the archives. Uh, they confirmed that the report did exist, and I, you know, being in Illinois at the time, it wasn't super convenient for me to go back. I expected that, you know, you know, the, the two pages wouldn't provide a ton of detail anyway, but I asked them, could you take a look at it uh, and then send me the pages that, uh, you know, his, his, uh, of, of his report. They, the, the archivist was kind enough to do it. She went and she looked at the, the account and she said, yeah, the, the account's in a, you know, a file, you know, labeled such and such. It's the, uh, the record of American uh, POWs in the Korean War, but it's 750 pages. So I can't scan it and copy it and send it to you. I was like, well, can you just find his section and then send me those pages? And she said, no, it's 750 pages. It's not been cleared. You'd have to put a FOIA request in just to go through it to make sure that there's no you know, classified information. So I put the FOIA request in. Uh, they go through, but they still won't send me the, the two pages. Anyway, I sort of forget about it. I've sort of moved on to uh, another chapter. I figure if I'm going to find anything on the Virginia One raid, and it's going to be the you know the center of gravity of that chapter, I'll find it eventually. But I, I, it's sort of like I said, I put it on the back burner. I've already moved on, so I I come to the archive uh, several months later, and I remember I put this FOIA request in. So I, you know I do a double check on it. It's the end of a long day. My back is aching because of all the pictures that I've taken. You have to stand over these uh, these tables and you know take picture after picture. And when I leave these you know the archive after a day of research. I've got like three thousand images. My, you know, it's 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 a you know, it's not fun. But at the end of the day, I think I've got about thirty minutes left. I find the archivist. I'm like, hey, can you, you know, find this report for me? I'd like to take a look at it and see what it is. She comes back with the seven hundred fifty pages. I open it up. It's not seven hundred fifty pages of American POWs in the Korean War. It's seven hundred and fifty pages on Martin Watson. Uh, and no one has ever gone through it, uh, not since the day uh, that they took the reports and put it in the archive. And it is, it's a gold mine. I, I mean, it had everything from his police reports, uh, the circumstances of his captivity in, uh, in Cisterna, because uh, he was part of Darby's Rangers in yeah, World War II. crazy. And then the fact that this person, he's present not just for, you know, the, the consequential moment of the Rangers in World War II, but the consequential moment of the Rangers in the Korean War. Um, man, it's amazing. Account after account of all the people that, you know, it's not just his interview. It's not his, just his post-captivity interview that's in the 750 pages. It's interview after interview by his fellow captives. Uh, and they all have the same story about this guy. He is incomparable. And he gets a bronze star <laughs> after, his, you know, after his captivity. Uh, and he, he gets a promotion to sergeant. I mean, I couldn't, I, don't, I mean, maybe Freeman... <laughs> In some instances, maybe Halper and a couple of others. I mean, nobody that I come across in the in the writing of that book is more deserving of the Medal of Honor. I mean, the the lengths that he went to for his own uh, uh, for his own men uh, on, on that hilltop in the Virginia One mission, and then the lengths that he goes to just to survive uh, in the POW camps and and to escape numerous escape camps. I mean, but yeah, he's. I mean, I I've do you never, have your next book identified yet? I got a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> the problem with the 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 the, um, uh, the record is there's that there's no dates. Uh, and I've thought, you know, you could write a book about Ma Martin Watson. I think you would have to make it fiction, though. Mm. You'd have enough uh, material to write that, that book, but you couldn't write it with the same level uh, of specificity that I wrote this. Mm -hmm. Because you, you need the chronology to tell that story. And the chronology Don't is you just think you could piece together cr the chronology from the other the events that he's actually in? And you could. I've thought about it. And you would have to find, you'd have to uh, go through each of the reports uh, and, and track down you know the you know the 100 150 guys mm -hmm. and see who's still alive to see if they can put you know some chronology to it you it would i don't know i have i've thought about it um, what happened to him after the war after he got out of the army after he was yeah. meritoriously promoted to sergeant yeah right god uh, he is uh it doesn't have the it's it's not the best uh uh epitaph he's um he ends up 
uh, having some trouble. I mean, like like I write in the book, uh, his interwar period between uh, his uh, release from um, uh, the, the German POW camp in World War II and the, uh, his entrance back into the army, it's punctuated by some 76 arrests <laughs> by the, uh, the Connecticut police. <laughs> Uh, and yeah, ranging from fighting to drunkenness back to fighting to resisting arrest. I mean, he has no, uh, I mean, he, he clearly has, you know, post-traumatic stress, but he's also, you know, that's just who he yeah, was. Just, He'd grown just up in this sort of like rough and tumble gang type environment. Um, and, you know, he's, 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 you know, he would be a nightmare to command, but, you know, also, you know, incomparable in combat. Uh, but after the war, uh, he he marries. Uh, it doesn't doesn't go well. Um, he's you know completely you know uh, broken from the war. He ends up uh, having a couple of kids um, uh, and then moving to Alaska to work on a pipeline. Uh, his son, who I uh, have become you know friends with, uh, is every bit as big as his old man was. I mean, he's uh, he's just a, you know some equally a, a monster. Uh, but the nicest guy that you'd ever meet. Um, but he, I think he met his dad, you know, maybe two dozen times in the course of his life. Uh, and then his, he passes away, I believe, from lung cancer. He smoked his entire entire life. And uh, the password that his son uh, would have to use to get into his hospital room uh, was courage. Hmm. So... <sighs> Korean War ends. Um, uh, your next section is Arlie Burke, the Bay of Pigs, and the launching of the Navy's limited war seals. Um, you talk about Arlie here. During the period of the CIA's preparations for the covert evasion, invasion of Cuba, the U.S. Navy was led by Admiral Arlie Burke. The 58-year-old CNO, whose most conspicuous feature were a tight shock of curly bleached hair, a fist of a chin that fell into a loose and swollen neck, and a sizable bulk that had long since settled into his hips, a trait that gave, said one witness, a C-roll to his stride and to join his shape, the impression of an upright base or a freighter. <laughs> so there you got Arlie Burke. Um, not an attractive man. <laughs> yeah, and here, here's an important part, and this is one of the one of the parts where we start connecting this DNA of the SEAL teams to the the DNA of the of the U.S. Navy. In 1943, when Burke finally arrived in the South Pacific to take command of Desco Destroyer Squadron 23, Desron 23, the Little Beavers, he pinned himself to a drop leaf desk in the sweltering belly of his command ship and crammed into his head a year's worth of combat reports, every battle from Coral Sea to Savo Island. Appalled at the micromanagement of destroyers in which the permission to launch torpedoes against an already discovered enemy fleet was denied for, for four immutable minutes, Burke crafted an entirely new doctrine of employment. Instead of spreading his destroyers around the fleet's larger ships as nighttime submar submarine pickets, all dependent on permission from above to break guard duty to engage the enemy, Burke proposed to concentrate his ships at the head of the fleet and to govern his skippers, skippers under what has since been called the doctrine of faith, an unprecedented delegation of authority in which an enemy sighting would be immediately followed by a coordinated torpedo attack without orders. The use of all caps was Burke's. To convey this attitude to his sailors, Burke issued them a 12-page mimeographed memo whose very first lines read, if it will help kill Japs, it's important. If it would not help kill Japs, it's not important. Keep your ship trained for battle. Burke's list of non-battle related orders was succinct. There were none. Corrections to this section will not be permitted. It took less than a month to make his point. <laughs> so that's Burke. You you go through this thing and and Burke is running the Navy and you know clearly he's an aggressive guy and believes in decentralized command. Um, you you do a great job of covering what happened at the Bay of Pigs, how that ties into our history and the SEAL teams. Um, 
Really pretty interesting story the way that unfolds. And, and you know, it ends up with, well, it's a horrible situation, but we do gain some experience that we then take, we work with some of these, some of these Cuban nationalists that helped us out as well. Yeah. And this is the toughest chapter. Well, that's not, not the toughest chapter. Each of the chapters presented, you know, various challenges when it came to researching and, and trying to like, you know, craft the narrative or trying to figure out, like, like I said before, wh- what's the what's the point of this chapter and how does this, uh, how does how does this serve the story or how did this push us forward? And you know, what aspects of uh, of you know Burke's personality or Burke's own history, uh, how is that relevant? And Absolutely, you're you know you hit the nail right on the head when it comes to you know Burke's uh, you know emphasis on latitude and decentralized command. But the other thing about Burke that's really important or it's, that's essential about him is that he uh, uh, refuses to allow the other branches of service to define what the Navy is. And you know in the revolt of the admirals or in that period um, during uh, the uh, you know the, the interwar period between World War II and the Korean War, you know the the other branches of the service are trying to tell the Navy that you know we need to really dearm ourselves and become sort of just a you know more of a you know a, a merchant marine, which to Burke is anathema. He has no interest in uh, commanding a, a Navy that's just a support or a transport unit. To Burke, the Navy is nothing if it's not an, uh, an instrument of offensive warfare. Uh, and so he's constantly, when he becomes the CNO, and he becomes a CNO for a period long, uh, two years longer than even the, the closest, his closest competitor. It's a, normally a two, two-year job. He's the CNO for six years. No one has the influence on crazy. the U.S. Navy that Arleigh Burke does. So when he becomes a CNO, He's constantly, the entire time, he's constantly looking for opportunities to push the Navy uh, into, you know, a more offensive role. So he champions this uh, this limited war capability. You know, he sees enemies all over the, the globe, and he's trying to figure out how the Navy can, you know, can either uh, bring forces to bear, launch Marines, launch missiles, launch, uh, you know, naval gunfire. Um, and, and that, you know, uh, orientation uh, ultimately... Uh, creates creates this unit, um, but like I said, writing the book creates you know uh, you know presents uh, you know structuring and research challenges. Uh, you know every chapter is hard to write. Um, this chapter though, this was probably the easiest chapter when it came to write the first draft uh, because there's been so much uh, produced about Arleigh Burke, M- numerous books. A couple of them uh, are pretty good, um, with you know lots and lots of corroborative detail in them. And then you know just finding you know his fingerprints all over those uh, those documents uh, that create the SEAL teams. They're all over. I mean everything, all the all the documents that uh, his office is creating. But then you can see his little scratches and his, his pen scratches in all these documents because he he writes with uh, I think it's a green pen, hmm. and you can see him still on the documents when you go to the the uh, uh, the Navy Yard today. Um, the problem with this chapter. Uh, particularly the Bay of Pigs part is just finding the material because it's you know the CIA is still involved and you know I can't tell you how many times I tried to get documents out of the CIA it's a black hole you just can't get them so I finally was able to track down the actual Cuban frogmen uh, that uh, uh, that participated in the raid and all of them were just you know com- totally generous with their time so you know the book is written almost sequentially there's a couple of chapters that I wrote out of order but this chapter in particular is the one that just sort of kept me up at night until the end so like I, I know there's more material out there and I've got to get it into the book and uh, I mean short of going down to Miami uh, and, and meeting with the the actual uh, or because the, they closed the museum they closed the Bay of Pig Museum um, but I managed to find them, and their accounts are in there. Yeah, it's a it's an epic epic retelling of that. Um, again, that's why you got to get this book to read these sections because I'm not covering it all today. Uh, but we do get Kennedy. We get Kennedy, who now is really focused on this idea, the small war idea, the counterinsurgency idea, the guerrilla warfare idea. He's all over it. He starts pushing people in that direction. He needs someone to run. The, the Special Warfare Center at Fort Bragg, which is where the Green Berets come from, where they get, it's like their schoolhouse. Um, he ends up talking to one of his friends, his one of his military aides, who, who recommends a guy to run it, this guy named Colonel Bill Yarborough, who's a char- another character in the story. 
At the change of command ceremony, his, his soldiers observed him as he was. Average size, chest out, shoulders back, a rooster of a man, his narrowed eyes and pursed lips locked into a stoic gaze as revealing as a Roman bust. Son of an army colonel, married to an army brat, with a son on his way to an army commission and two daughters on their way to army husbands, Yarborough was a, the very picture of army tradition. 48 years old now, in pressed slacks and blouse boots with no prior special no prior experience in special forces, nothing on the surface seemed to indicate anything besides a conventional background and a preference for more of the same, but that was just the surface. Beneath his obvious soldierly bearing was hidden an ambition for a military organization as unconventional as had ever existed. Born into a military family and predictably funneled into a West Point education where his only step out of formation seems to have been as a cartoonist on the school newspaper. Yarborough's early army career was, in fact, fact, a litany of nonconformities. Four years with the Philippine Scouts, one of the most unconventional assignments in the U.S. Army. Two years as a parachute test officer, during which his creativity had burst open as wide as the thing he was testing. This had manifested in everything from redesigning the paratrooper's pants to boots to promoting his untested unit by acting as a stunt double for a Hollywood movie for which he was afterwards, afterward nicknamed Showbiz and in creating a silver badge that looked like an ice cream cone shaped parachute flexed with winged angels that was ultimately adopted as the symbol for the entire airborne. In World War II, Yarborough survived incomparable five combat jumps, five com campaigns, two combat commands, one of which had fought alongside Darby's Rangers at Cisterna and later earned a unit, presidential unit citation and one crash landing. And except for a brief sidelining resulting from an outburst against his division commander, Matthew Ridgway, it was an almost unblemished record of direct action with a record, a record with honor so compelling that any normal soldier would have coveted its repetition. Yarborough wasn't normal. <laughs> what was the outburst about Ridgway? Remember? Yeah, I'm trying to think. It was, uh, it was, a, uh, it was an errant drop. Um, I believe in Italy. Mm. Uh, an errant drop of the parachute troopers, or an errant drop of a bomb friendly fire situation. No, of paratroopers. Okay. Yeah, they they landed them uh, in a in a place that they shouldn't have landed them, and he uh, returns from that, and he uh, he does something that you just can't do in the army. He he you know lets his boss have it. <laughs> and Matthew Ridgway is not. Matthew Ridgway is another, you know, hero of the story, but, you know, uh, maybe not a hero of the story. He's a hero. Of, he's an American hero, but he's an executioner of the Rangers in Korea. But he's also the executioner of uh, Yarbrough's uh, sort of uh, rise to infantry or uh, uh, paratrooper greatness. He, uh, he short circuits his career, sends him back to the States. I think uh, the only way that Yarbrough gets back into command is through uh, Mark Clark. Um, but, yeah, it was... Um, uh, yeah, Yarbrough, Yarbrough, Yarbrough. He is uh, uh, probably next to Kaufman. I don't think I met anybody uh, who was as tough to just sort of pin down. Like, what does he want? Because, I mean, his, his whole background seems to imply that he's, you know, just this conventional, right. you know, soldier. But he has no interest in it. And I, you know, they, I, I couldn't find, uh, you know, the letter or the document uh, to, you know, suggest, you know, why he um, was sort of turning his back on that and why he, you know, bought in so, you know, full heartedly to this uh, idea of counterinsurgency. But nevertheless, it's there. Mm -hmm. He becomes the biggest uh, disciple or apostle or whatever you want to call him of counterinsurgency, of, you know, winning, uh, you know, the, the the hearts and minds of the people uh, and then turning them or at least denying them to the enemy. Mm -hmm. And uh, the way that you did that is not through combat. It's through all the stuff that nobody likes to do. Ditch it, digging, well yeah. know, digging. Yeah. It, it becomes real obvious. His, you say here, Yarbrough's first action as commander of the Naval Special Warfare Center and top trainer of special forces was to initiate a top to bottom review of training and curriculum an effort to match his men with their mission. So here we go into, fast forward a little bit. Before long, the Special Warfare Center began to feel less like a commando course and more like a college campus, complete with courses in bridge building, sanitation, animal husbandry, blacksmithing, crop raising, pig pen construction, swine inoculation, leaflet creation, field irrigation, seed planting, and rice cultivation. 
Not all of Yarbrough, and, and of course there's resistance. Not all of Yarbrough's staff approved of the changes, particularly said Yarbrough, the old jockstrap commandos, the ranger types, gallant bloodletters and fighting machines to be sure, but men who were anything but diplomats and rejected any suggestion that they ought to be. They were, he continued, men devoid of the more humane qualities, compassion, pity, and mercy. Men who bristled at the idea of lying on their bellies to teach an illiterate tribesman on how to aim a rifle. So he's got a totally different idea of really what the Green Berets should be. And he's got another little, he's got another little different opinion too. Here, fast forward a little bit. To convert his men to his new philosophy as warfare, my religion, he would one day call it, in which battles, the battle's objective was not the destruction of the enemy, of an enemy's army, but the winning of indigenous minds and sympathies. That must be the precursor to hearts and minds. Mm. Yarborough enjoined every one of his officers above the rank of captain to accompany him into the Pine Barrens for what he called his talk in the woods. As long as I am charge of special forces, he would say, there will be no womanizing, no drunkenness, no wild parties, no adultery. There'll be no troublemakers, no wild men. That stuff is out. There will be moral standards, disciplinary standards, appearance standards. The rules are going to change, he would promise. There will be a new start. So he's coming yeah, hard. He's coming hard, and uh, the, this that chapter in particular. Uh, so I've talked about some of the challenges of other chapters, and you know, either you know, finding material or figuring out what the chapter is about and how that chapter served the the larger story. the The story of the special forces uh, presented a problem, but I was not prepared for. Um, every chapter took about you know, between six, you know, around six, seven months to write. Uh, when I got to, and, and, and they all followed a similar pattern, you know, whether the, um, whether the, 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 uh, the, the unit was um, a, a Navy unit that we're talking about where it's uh, being created, uh, committed to action, and then it, it's retained in, in the order of battle, or whether it's an Army or Marine Corps unit that is, uh, created and then disbanded. Uh, there was there was this pattern uh, that, that was sort of predictable. You know, Navy unit created, Army unit disbanded, mm -hmm. or Marine Corps, whatever. When you get to uh, and and it fit with you know my understanding of my thesis, which was um, the Navy's continuing to fill this gap in in the order of battle, and um, that held until the Special Forces. When I get to the Special Forces, like my thesis sort of like. <laughs> started to crumble and I had this moment of like panic where I was like it, I mean the only thing I can do is just ignore the, <laughs> the entire existence of the special forces because it's I mean it doesn't fit with what I've been doing for the past you know seven years um, and when I you know I, obviously that's not what I did uh, I the, because it's not the right thing to do because you're telling a history you have to you know understand the you relationship just, you can't just change history to you figure can't. story i mean you i mean there's <laughs> so many times if you're writing history that you know the temptation is there you want to you know make the facts fit your narrative that's not that's not honest and it's not what you're supposed to do so i ended up having to take an entire year uh and did nothing but you know really learn the history of uh, the Army Special Forces, which is a fascinating history. But it also, you know, revealed uh, within, you know, three or four months that it wasn't the fact that the Special Forces was, you know, created, committed to action and disbanded. It was that they were completely reoriented to a non-commando type mission. And no one was more uh, consequential in that um, uh, shift than Yarborough. Yeah, they, they end up, the gap that all these other raider units would fill and then get disbanded, he didn't go into that gap. He went into this other gap. He went into this other gap, and the, and, and there was a gap that was created uh, by President Kennedy. Mm -hmm. And uh, and trying to connect those two people, I couldn't figure it out until I found that article about Spartacus, about Kennedy watching this movie. You know, he gets a, Oh, yeah, he tell, gets a tell that story. I, I'm not going to cover it, but tell that story. In the, in, the, in the months leading up to... Um, uh, his inauguration. He's uh, um, he's been elected, um, but he hasn't yet uh, become president. Uh, he gets a, his his brother tells him how great uh, the movie, uh, the Kirk Douglas movie Spartacus is, and he you know uh, his you know uh, incoming Secretary of the Navy uh, happens to be going as an extra ticket. You know, Mr. President, I like. Would you like to go? 
So he goes, and uh, the movie's already started. The theater owner sees Ke- you know Kennedy come in, stops everything, brings him upstairs. They have a cup of coffee together. Everybody, all the other theater goers are just waiting for them to start. <laughs> so he goes down with his cup of coffee, uh, restarts the movie, and he watches this thing, and he comes out, and he's, I mean, it's a, if you've ever seen, you know, Spartacus, it's a, you know, um, it's the epic. I mean, when I was a kid, I saw it. It was, I mean, I've never seen anything like it in, um, and it makes an impression on him. And where, you know, it, it's a it's a slave army um, that, you know, is fighting across uh, Italy and they're you know, liberating other slaves and they're turning them into gladiators. And that's what Kennedy wants to do. Yeah. And he sees in this movie, he sees an answer to his problem. You know, we're going to turn these, you know, legions of, uh, you know, third world, you know, uh, um, people into, you know, our army of freedom. And Yarbo b- bought into that. Bought into it. Oh, yeah. <sighs> Meanwhile, fast forward a little bit. Um, chapter 11. At 1 o'clock on January 1st, 1962, a Monday, SEAL Team 1 was, without fanfare of any kind, unceremoniously commissioned on Naval Amphibious Base Coronado, right where the neck of San Diego's Palm Treed Resort Island met the flat seven-mile-long sandy isthmus called the Silver Strand. Located on this base, a peninsula of military-grade right angles that jutted out into the sparkling waters of San Diego Bay, the team's physical footprint was little more than a single World War II-era Quonset hut. The team's authorized strength was for 10 officers and 50 enlisted men, most of whom had not yet been pulled from their West Coast underwater demolition teams. The man most responsible for recruiting, equipping, and training these men was their 29-year-old commanding officer, Lieutenant David Del Judas. Raised just outside of Newark, New Jersey, by Italian-speaking, working-class parents, Del Judas was of average height and athletic build, and like nearly every other frogman, (laughs) well-tanned. As an (laughs) officer, except for you, (laughs) as an officer, At UDT-12, he had been selected to lead a 10-man detachment to Vietnam on a two-week trip up the Mekong River to deliver landing craft to Laotian troops, troops that the Army Special Forces were already training for combat. Briefed on the insurgents and the menu of reptiles that he and his men were sure to encounter, they had seen neither, just 100 miles of mud-browned river. Now, Del Judas was in charge of a unit that had been created in no small part to return to that river, but to what end, no one quite knew. So there you go. SEAL teams get commissioned. Um, <clears throat> and, and this is when all the history finally, you know. Starts to collide. It collides, yeah. It, it, it culminates in this. And, and you know, the, 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 the individual it collides in is uh, Phil Bucklew, who is, um, who's been there uh, at the, literally from the beginning of Naval Special Warfare. And he, you know, I'm, there's there's a reason that you know the, the Naval Special Warfare Center is named after this person, mm-hmm. the Phil H. Bucklew Center for Naval Special Warfare. Yeah, I mean, it wouldn't. <laughs> I mean, he uh, he doesn't create you know the the scouts and raiders. He doesn't create the UDTs. He doesn't uh, create the SEAL teams. Um, but he's there for these critical moments uh, to help the SEAL teams along. And his his ability to form relationships, his ability oh, yeah. to write, because yeah. he was obviously, and he's super humble, and and is able to get his, convey his message apart. Con- yeah, I convey mean, his message in such a way that really there's only one answer, but he never gives the answer. It's like he allows people to discover the truth for themselves, which yeah. is the best way to get people to discover the truth. Better than I could have said it, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had that in there. <laughs> yeah, he writes these, uh, well, we'll, we'll get to it. Phil H. Bucklew. When he had left his house on December 7th, 1941, Phil Hinkle Bucklew was a six foot, two inch, 235 pound former fullback for the Cleveland Rams whose major concern that morning had been to choose one of the four football contracts burning a hole in his pocket. With thinning hair and a heavy jaw, a curled lip and downturned eyes, not to mention a torso as thick as a tree trunk, Bucklew at 26 looked 10 years older than he was and was 10 times as mean. While intimidating from a distance, 
Bucklew up close actually possessed a personality that accomplished the opposite. He had never attracted to his orbit enough players to found and coach his own football team. The or sorry, he had even attracted enough players to his orbit to found and coach his own football team, the Columbus Bullies. A team on its way to another league championship had the Japanese not exploded the afternoon as they did. If I would have known about the Columbus Bullies, my task unit, task unit bruiser, might have been the task unit bullies instead. But <laughs> one of those things. Um, in the Sicily campaign, he had checked it. Check the beach himself, and fast forward a little bit, then signaled the fleet from the bobbing shell of a blackened kayak while scre- screaming balls of fire skipped off the water around him. In the weeks before Normandy invasion, he skimmed to the coast and collected density testing bottom samples to up to 20 yards from the shore, then evaded a flotilla of six enemy trawlers and a crash of bullet snaps from uh, MG-42 machine gun by escaping into the night and fog. On the smoke gray dawn of D-Day, Bucklew and his LCT scout boat crew led the first wave of floating tanks to Omaha Beach, fired ear-splitting rockets and twin 50 cal machine guns to silence an enemy pillbox, then spent the day throttling through red clouded water and mine-topped obstacles to pluck drowning soldiers from burning landing craft. Fast forward, for his service in World War II, Bucklew received an unheard of number of commendations, a bronze star for North Africa, a silver star for Salerno, and then, then a brace of Navy crosses, one for Sicily, another for Omaha Beach. Not even his friend and fellow footballer Buck Halperin had been awarded as many. Naturally, such a record had opened doors to more unconventional opportunities, including two and a half years in Korea, more than twice the length of a standard war tour, where Bucklew had doubled as the Navy's representative to the CIA and led the Beach Jumpers, a Navy unit created to collect and jam the enemy's electronic communications or periodically mimic them to sow chaos in their transmissions. So there's just some of the stuff that you talk about that, that Bucklew's got going on. And that's, a, that's another one of those units, too, the beach jumpers, right? Another one of these random units that the Navy puts together. Mm-hmm. Freaking just get some. Mm-hmm. Um, so he's got to write this report. Where, talk about why he had to write this apart, report. Uh, he had to write the report because uh, the original commander um, <laughs> got sent home. And the reason that the original commander of the, uh, uh, the commission or the survey team um, uh, <laughs> we don't know if he was sent home for a health problem or, uh, as one person said, for closet drunkenness. Um, <laughs> but they, I mean, the, the, the point of this report that they're sent to, um, to create is to figure out what the hell the Navy's supposed to do in Vietnam. It's not a, it's not a theater that uh, any naval commander is eager to, you know, insert himself into. Um, there's no Arlie Burke uh, at the helm of the Navy at this point, so uh, the the character of uh, you know naval leadership is slightly different, maybe not as aggressive, um, but they still want to you know see what the Navy can do. So they send the survey team, um, but the the people that they select for this survey team are almost um, you know they're, they're sort of uh, um, uh, they're wa- they're weighting the scales a little bit. I mean they send. Uh, David Del Judas, who is, uh, you know, he's the uh, commanding officer of SEAL Team 1. Uh, they send uh, Phil Kaler, who's a former uh, UDT guy from uh, the Pacific Theater, you know, Silver Star winner. And they send Phil Bucklew as the second in command, who is, you know, nobody has had a more inland uh, naval experience uh, in you know, outside of the SEAL teams than this guy. Make him the number two. Uh, the commanding officer gets sent home, uh, putting Phil Bucklew in charge of this report. They spend the next uh, six weeks, two months, uh, you know, hopscotching the country, trying to figure out what to do. And um, the report that he creates is entirely his. I mean, uh, he lets no one else take the responsibility for this report. He drafts it himself. Uh, he types it himself. Even he doesn't have a yeoman do it. He Did does you see it. original copies of this thing? Yeah. It's freaking legit. And it, and it, it took a, a surprisingly long time to find it. I couldn't find it anywhere. Like and you I, have images of these things, right? You take pictures of all these things? Yeah, I have images of that. And I, um, yeah, I don't, uh, I don't have any of the original documents. There's um, left everything at the archive which, where it should be. But you didn't smuggle any out. <laughs> I'm not saying that the temptation wasn't there because some of the archives that I, you know, went to, um, you know, they're. Uh, some of their record keeping, you know, has a little bit uh, to be desired, and you want to protect, you know, mm-hmm. this history, you know. Uh, but no, I never, no, that it, it's all there. But yes, found the report, and um, uh, 
Yeah, holding it is a little weird. Holding a lot of these documents because you you know you haven't touched or most likely no one's touched some of the stuff yeah. since they were you know <laughs> printed off or typed off or whatever. You have here, according to Bucklew, this is the report. According to Bucklew, the battle required something not unlike the riverine force used in the American Civil War in which, said Abraham Lincoln, Uncle Sam's web feet had fought not only in the deep sea and the broad bay, but also up the narrow muddy bayou and wherever the ground was a little damp. (laughs) What a great, I mean, he quotes freaking Abraham Lincoln in this report. This guy's crafty. For an unconventional example, in a modified amphibious environment, Bucklew could have drawn attention to his own legacy. He didn't. He never did. So the humility. Lincoln's fleet was example enough. In practical terms, his solution for the Navy heretofore failure was a comprehensive overhaul of the entire counter-infiltration effort. And you talk about this idea of counter-infiltration. As opposed to counter-insurgency. As opposed to counter-insurgency. They they wanted to keep the the infiltrators the the communists from pushing into South Vietnam it's a blockade I mean that's it's a traditional Navy mission Navy doesn't understand counterinsurgency Navy is much more uh, comfortable with uh, with a, a blockade <laughs> right and and so therefore according to the report more Navy bo- boats more Navy boarding teams more riverine checkpoints submarine nets navigation lights a system for checking cargo manifests and enforcing enforcing curfews and in exchange for all this more Navy re- representation in four core planning on the question of whether the Navy was missing the boat on counterinsurgency the winning of the locals loyalty through civic action and leading the indigenous troops, Bucklew's report was comparatively silent, especially given the date, just 86 days since Kennedy's assassination. Though he recommended increased boat supports to special forces camps, he already judged the Green Berets' efforts as slow and time-consuming and therefore ineffective. Fast forward a little bit. In its 46 pages, the report used the term counterinsurgency only two times, or sorry, only three times. A somewhat nebulous field, Buckley would one day call it. Four fewer mentions than the term counter-infiltration. The report's preferred mission. Appearing a total of 10 times was a variant of the term raiding. A tactic that could, said the report, engender more fight back spirit. Amongst the rag sailors, though those were the uh, South Vietnamese trained riverine sailors, but would require companies of pursuit raiders, preferably Marines or Rangers. And who would accompany such, and who would command such raids? On this question, the former scout raider turned Seiko guerrilla did not blink. The overwater transport of raiding and landing forces should be a Navy responsibility. Yeah, that, I mean, that, that part alone, I mean, the fact that he doesn't even mention SEALs in that, I mean, Clearly the Navy thinks like I mean if there's not like a little you know uh, You know that when the teacher you know pounds on the chalkboard yeah. and says hey You might want to remember this yeah. for the test like that's what he's saying like yeah. hey Don't you guys think that you want to be doing this mission <laughs> and the army and the Marine Corps is like Nah <laughs> Crazy uh, Nine days later on February 25th 1964 the Bucklew report the name by which even McNamara would refer to it was officially distributed to leaders across the Navy, MACV, and the Joint Chiefs of Staff, eventually rising to the Office of Secretary of Defense. It was handled, said Bucklew, like a hot potato. Actually, it was more like a gauntlet, a challenge to the Navy's leaders to not only directly fight an inland river war, but to fight it in a way that mostly deviated from the consensus strategy of counterinsurgency. Over the next two years, this challenge would propel the Navy toward the development of new vessels, new organizations, and most importantly, new missions, including the reports most recommended, raiding beyond the riverbanks. So there it is. Um, From there, the seals start creeping inland. That's what starts happening. Um, and and here's the the intro that I started this this podcast out with. Um, debt one, seal team one, debt golf, Billy Macon. That's what's happening. Um, from there, they start they start making adjustments to training. Um, right. This is the Navy has set up the seal teams. They haven't created, I mean, they've created the SEAL teams, but they haven't uh, determined what the SEAL teams are going to be. They've raised them like yeah. any parent is going to raise a child. Yeah, they like planted a seed. Right. But the child is ultimately going to be the one who decides what his future is going to be like. And they, you know, all of this has come together into this last, you know, last two chapters. Like, 
here we are. Uh, and, and, you know, they, they have trouble in the beginning. They are almost sent home. They all, the seals almost completely missed the war. Anyway, the, you, uh, some, so, so that the, the guys start coming back from those Vietnam deployments. And like I said, they start making adjustments because they're, they're creeping more and more inland. Um, I, I like this, but some of these things, some of these things just warm my heart because because <laughs> I'm so connected to them, right? So here we go back to the book. Frustrated with the enemy's retreat from the Rungsats riverbanks, Det Gulf had already started pushing further inland. So far, in fact, that SEAL Team 1's replacement platoons were now anticipating almost nothing but helicopter insertions. So we're, we're, we might not even be in the water at all, not even next to a river. To better prepare for this inland land warfare, SEAL Team 1's Anderson had ordered Guy Stone, a former Korean war soldier and forward observer who had left the army to become an enlisted SEAL, to create a six week long pre-deployment course in basic infantry tactics. With a training camp carved into the Chocolate Mountains some 100 miles east of the Pacific Ocean, Stone had trained his Team One comrades in every skill of soldiering that he knew, everything from contour navigating to mortars, every skill a step closer to Navy infantrymen. To the commanders now convened in Coronado, such developments seemed to justify an official revision to the Navy's, to the SEAL's Navy-imposed operational boundaries. In other words, what Del Judas Anderson and Early were describing as direct missions outside of a purely naval or maritime environment. As they already knew, there was only one other available area that could present a Navy unit with that kind of opportunity, an area contemporary descri- contemporary, a contemporary described as the war's true bastion of iron, the Mekong Delta. Yeah, I don't, I, I've had some, uh, some Vietnam SEALs on here, but that connection to our West Coast desert training facility, that's it, man. Like, that's, you go out there, and you know, I had Roger Hayden on here, who was a, a Vietnam. I know Roger. Yeah, just uh, well, that's right. You worked at Warcom, mm-hmm. but he was, you know, he'd start talking about being out there at the desert training facility, and like uh, they set up the point man course where they put booby traps and targets and all that. Like that's what I did when I got SEAL Team One. You went out there and you did the point man course. Everybody did the point man course. Mm-hmm. That came directly from these guys in Vietnam. So th- these things are. Um, <clears throat> You can still you can still you can still have that thread. Yeah. <sighs> Gonna push forward a little bit. Get into some um some of these stories that you 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 get from the fighting that the SEALs start doing as they push in. And this is the this is where the reputation really starts to stand strong. I'm going to jump into the middle of a mission here. Realizing that the enemy was already moving to cut them off, Gallagher decided the only thing left to do was fight. This decision made, he directed his men to make for the only cover around a lone peasant's house, but just 20 uncomfortable yards away from the nearest tree line. When they reached it, their first job was to calm the family inside. Not an easy task for any home invader, and one in which the squad was only partially successful as two children quickly escaped, sure to eventually tell the Viet Cong their position. Next most important was to check the wounded. Yaw's entire left side was starting to freeze up and fix whatever was wrong with the radio. The same troubleshooting checklist of cleaning connectors, swapping out handsets, changing batteries, plus a healthy amount of cursing and praying. This troubleshooting, however, was only partially successful. When Chur finally got the radio back online, the only other person who could hear him was Jack Rowell, the radio man for 7A, and they had problems of their own. At a little before 3 a.m., Peterson and Squad 7A considered themselves in a very difficult position. Everywhere they looked in the surrounding tree line, there was movement. At one point, Peterson had even seen torches, what seemed like hundreds of them moving toward their south. But as they were now finding out over the radio, it could have been even worse. Once Gallagher and 7B's situation was learned, Peterson was quick to count his blessing. First, he had none of Gallagher's casualties, except for the lerp who had shot the man Peterson had meant to interrogate. Every one of his men still had a full loadout of ammunition. Next was his position. Clear fields of fire in every direction, and the cemeteries burned for cover. 
even concrete vaults if the enemy brought in his mortars. Most important of all, Raoul's radio was now working as it should, putting the squad in reach of Army Slicks and Navy Sea Wolves, who were, at that moment, on their way to 7A's rescue, or at least they had been. Recognizing 7B's overwhelming need, Peterson quickly made two decisions. First, he ordered Raoul to relay 7B's position to the helicopters, effectively putting his own squad at the back of the line. Second, and this decision was made by default of the first, 7A would now fight the encircling enemy alone. Just as Peterson's decision was made and the helicopters began diverting south, a group of some 30 Viet Cong fighters, as if sensing 7A's sudden vulnerability, stepped clear of the eastern wood line, spread themselves into a screen of skirmishers, and started forward. The first wave was coming, and no one knew what was coming behind it. Having been forced to fend the, spend the first few minutes at the farmhouse calming peasants, dressing wounds, and fixing the radio, Gallagher, despite shards of metal in his legs, was now checking each man's field of fire and telling him to hold that fire until he gave the order. As men organized their positions with easily accessible stacks of ammunition and grenades, they scanned their sectors for any sign of movement. They didn't have to scan line, scan long. Soon, between the rice bales, there was movement everywhere. Look at them all, said Boynton. It looks like hundreds of them. But as best he could tell, hundreds who, by their milling around, still had no idea where the Americans were. Right about the time that Boynton was making that assessment, Hook Tur received what they had been quietly desperate for, the check-in procedures from Lieutenant Commander Myers of the Navy Sea Wolves, who rattled off the loadout for his flight of two helicopters, wings racked with 2.75-inch rockets and machine guns then gave his altitude and vicinity a racetrack in the sky far enough away so as to not reveal 7b's position in response tour gave a physical description of the rice paddy and 7b's location in it along with the rapidly deteriorating situation multiple wounded and enemy everywhere the next call was the lead pilot of the Army's flight of slicks, who, upon hearing of 7B's situation, replied he would not be able to help as it was a, quote, violation of squadron policy to land in a hot LZ, end quote. What happened next is a matter of some dispute. One account suggests that the Sea Wolf pilots may have shamed their army peers by offering to pick up the seals themselves, or at least the wounded. The Navy fuselages could only handle one or two men. Another explicitly claims that the Sea Wolf commander told the army pilot, you're going to go down or I'm going to shoot you down. Whatever the truth, within a few minutes, the matter was resolved and Gallagher told Tyr to tell the helicopters what he wanted. At a little before 3.15 a.m., the moon behind him, two Sea Wolves started their attack run across the rice paddy. As they closed with the tree line, someone in the squad, there is some dispute as to who, stepped out of the farmhouse, ripped the pull ring on a Mark 13 signal flare, and tossed it in the grass. Within a second, the flare ignited a bonfire-sized glow that told the pilots exactly where the seals were, but also drew the bullet snaps of every muzzle now blazing from the tree line. As the seals flinched beneath the fire and responded with their own, the world above them exploded with the womp womp of the two gunships strafing the enemy's muzzle flashes with their rockets and four machine guns. With the landing skids directly above them, the combination of rotor blades and rocket exhaust nearly ripped the roof off the farmhouse. As the Sea Wolves unleashed this chaos, several seals got online and followed suit, launching grenades and shredding through belts of stone rounds they had so... As, so linked the noise was unbelievable wrote one man afterward and it looked like something not of this world behind this cover the army pilot reluctantly landed his slick and gallagher directed the firing line of seals to begin bounding back toward it while the firing line covered mike boynton transformed himself into an ambulance cradling men from the hooch to the helicopter then helping to shoulder yaw to a seat crammed between the pilot and co-pilot Finding Gallagher limping away from the firing line, his rifle still in hand, and compressing a fresh gunshot wound, and leaning into the rotor wash like it was a driving rain, Boynton picked him up and heaved him so hard into the helicopter's open door that he flew right out the other side. That accident forced Boynton to run all the way around the helicopter and repeat the effort, finally stashing Gallagher all the way in the back. Once everyone was finally loaded, the pilot eagerly applied his collective pitch control lever 
until several knocks on the helmet forced him to look back. Hey, we still got men on the ground, Boynton yelled above the, the noise. At this, the pilot depressed his collective just in time for Roy Matthews, the barrel of his stoner glowing hot red, to dash from the hooch and clamber aboard, rounds now clanking against the fuselage. This time, the pilot's liftoff sent a shudder throughout the entire helicopter, prompting Yaw to crane his head toward the dash where he saw an RPM indicator flashing red. While gaining the next 100 feet of elevation, the helicopter shook like it would suddenly drop out of the sky, a feeling that only intensified when every gun still connected to a living communist finger started firing and surrounding the slick with green tracers. It was a barrage that had resulted from the near simultaneous liftoff of the sea wolves because they had somewhere else to be. Yeah, I mean, then you you go into um, talk about how how they go now and take care of Peterson and yeah. and Seven Alpha. Um, I mean, the, the uh, I, if I had written any slower, this would not have been written because the uh, you know the, a lot of the guys that you know, gave me the stories from this thing are no longer here. Ron Yaw just passed away a couple of months ago. Min just died. Bob Gallagher just died. I mean, all of this history is. You know, very, very slowly, but it's happening. I mean, um, one of the last things that uh, um, uh, Pete Peterson, well, w- one of the last interactions I had with Pete, because Pete was more than uh, generous with his time to do interviews with us, but one of the last things that he did was um, I sent him a galley copy uh, of the book before it had published uh, to get it in Bob Gallagher's hands so he could see this. I wanted, you know... Um, Every you know all the folks that I interviewed for, from Seventh Platoon, the one person that would not be interviewed was Bob Gallagher. He, um, uh, that said, I still was anxious for him to know, you know, the legacy and the contribution that he had, you know, not just to the SEAL teams, but to, you know, establishing, you know, what ultimately the SEAL teams became, the mission that the SEAL teams have. Um, so sent the copy of the book to Pete. Uh, Pete drove it over to Bob's house, um, and Pete, you know, didn't get any information on whether or not he actually read it. But um, after Bob passed, uh, they found the the copy of the book in his house, with a note inside that said to uh, pass this book on to his best friend. <laughs> so hopefully, very hopefully, he uh, he was able to at least see this. Yeah, well, then that's a good indication. Um. You say here when this was done, he submitted awards. This is Peterson submitted awards up through CTF 116's chain of command. Bronze stars for just about everyone, every member of Seven Bravo. A silver star for Boynton and for Gallagher, a Navy Cross. An award that he had to justify to an awards officer with multiple statements, but who responded by saying that the evidence could actually support a Medal of Honor. Uh, I, I hope it does. I mean, I, I think there, it, it would be, that would be really great if. Uh, this could act as something of a record for maybe an adjustment of some of these awards. We'll see. <laughs> yeah. I mean, right now I think we got Gallagher and Watson. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, um, uh, yeah. And, you know, w- one of the, you know, great things, uh, or one of the most interesting things about that uh, episode is that Peterson submits himself for nothing. Yep. I mean, how many, uh, how many officers or how many people do we work with, you know, over the you know course of our careers that, you know, their preoccupation was, you know, what awards they're going to get out of this. Uh, awards are um, are one of those funny things that, you know, they, they don't always necessarily, uh, you know, say what the person, you know, deserves. They often say, you know, how good their chain of command was in recognizing, you know, what they, you know, what they got. 100%. Awards are crazy. Awards say just as, uh, they say as much about uh, the person that submits them for it as it does about the person himself. I mean, I had, I had a guy, I saw a guy on here, Dick Thompson, um, got, got into a helo to, to like set up the spy rig or something during a bright light operation. Ends up, the helo just takes off. He's getting ready to go on leave. He's getting ready to go on liberty. So he doesn't even have his weapon. He doesn't have his gear with him. And the helo takes off to go on this bright light to go and rescue down guys. 
They can't get in. He ends up throwing a rope out, rappelling down, grabs the crew chief's gun, rappels down, no gloves, burns his hand, gets in there, rescues people, recovers body from two different helicopters. It's completely, it's completely. Oh, by the way, he, he dropped down. The rope ended, and he drops into a 150-foot canopy and just drops, just lets go, and just falls through the freaking jungle canopy to get in there. It's it's totally insane. He gets done with that. I mean, there's no possible way he should have lived, number one. And no no way should he have actually rescued guys. He lives, he rescued guys. He gets like a bronze star. <laughs> it's freaking totally insane. And, you know, here's the other thing um, about, and what's what, and you, you, you lay this out very clearly, um, a very important thing about this SEAL Team 2, 7th Platoon, what really, they were doing great operations, but what really made it important was that they were doing these intel-driven raids. Then they were gathering intelligence, they were exploiting that intelligence, and they were doing follow-on raids. So right. this set like a, a standard. Um, it, set, it, it creates our cycle of operations. Right. And what's important about that is, you know, we didn't, I, I I try and tell everybody that I meet that the SEAL teams, uh, we didn't in- invent ourselves. We didn't, uh, everything good about us, we took from somebody else. If anything, the SEAL teams are just an aggregate of all the best pieces of all these other units that have come before us. Um, and the, not just Navy units either. We took the best parts of the Rangers, we took the best parts of the Raiders, and we combined all that. And when we didn't know how to do something, we found the best person to teach us how to do it, and they taught us how to do it, and we took it. Um, and same thing when it comes to this cap, the cycle of capture kill. I mean, we, I mean, we sort of stumbled upon it, and I think um, uh, you know, with guys like Pete Peterson and Bob Gallagher, who are really um, you know leveraging the information that they can get from other units, and then aggregating that to to drive their own operations. I mean, a guy like Bob Wagner, who's you know uh, he. Is create essentially single-handedly creates the PRUs, and the, the the PRU is the best part about that is is this cycle of operations that they get, and that the SEAL teams sort of notice, like well, we can do that too. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, the use of interpreters, the use of the locals, yeah. but the use of the locals not to build a guerrilla force, but to just to gather intelligence and yeah. then go do hits. It, and it's just, I mean, it's like, you know, it's, it's no different than what, the, you know, uh, the police do in every major city across the country. You arrest somebody, you shake them down for information, and then you go get the next person. It's a cycle of operations that just keep perpetuating itself. So um, you've got in- incredible sections in here. And again, this whole book, we, we barely even touch the surface of what you've got in this book. But I, I want to finish off with this section here. <clears throat> It says this, last section I'm gonna read. In March of 1969, the Rand Corporation, a semi-private think tank that specialized in research and analysis for the Department of Defense, published published a report titled, The Navy SEAL Commandos, a case study of military decision-making and organizational change. As far as I know, the first academic level study of the SEAL teams. The report's author was Francis J. Bing West, a former Force Recon Marine and Vietnam War veteran whose investigation had begun a year earlier. And by the way, you can read a bunch of his uh, books right now. He wrote a bunch of other books. He wrote books about uh, Iraq. His investigation had begun a year earlier and whose research had produced a raft of documents, dozens of interviews, and the firsthand observation of several SEAL missions into the Rung Sat and the Mekong Delta. So he went and observed what SEALs were doing. And this guy is a Force Recon Marine himself. From this research, West had produced an 18-page report whose introduction provided a brief description of SEAL training. Training he estimated at a cost of around $14,000 per man, plus an overview of the SEAL's commitment to Vietnam, at its height a commitment that never exceeded 150 SEALs, or roughly 1,150 fewer than the in-country height of the Green Berets' total complement. It was a commitment that stood out in even starker relief when placed next to the author's obvious admiration for the SEAL's progression from lackluster coastal raiders to the war's most aggressive direct action commandos. Admittedly, commandos who had no 
had had no business becoming such and had thus drawn the interest of the same preeminent think tank that it created the US military's nuclear defense strategy. Intended as a study on organizational change, the report's true purpose had been to discover how the Navy could have possibly succeeded in creating a land-focused commando force, a force that even the Viet Cong had reportedly dubbed the men with green faces, a color not normally associated with the Navy's traditional medium. It was a puzzle of personal importance to the officer, to the author, as the Marine Corps the far more likely branch of service had never succeeded in creating anything similar. Quote, how the concept was shepherded through the Joint Chiefs of Staff and Congress, I am still trying to determine, the author wrote. For the mission of the SEALs exceeded the charter of the U.S. Navy. As best as he could tell, the legality of this infringement had been tolerated because of its negligible size, but later had been allowed to widen because of a series of factors, none of which at this point should, be, should come as a surprise. The first of these, now here, here you start talking about how we ended up with, this, with the SEAL teams. The first of these, at least in the Mekong Delta, submitted the author, had been the neglect of the U.S. Army in general and the 9th Infantry Division in particular to push their commando-type units to the same to, quote, develop the same aggressive attitude towards ambushing that the SEALs had, end quote. It might further be added that neither entity had adequately prepared those commando-type units to make such a transition in the Delta environment, a claim best evidenced by one attempt to conceal the river insertion of five LERP soldiers by having them copy the SEAL method of jumping from the back of a moving boat, but that ultimately resulted in the drowning of all five men. The second factor that accounted for this infringement, the report continued, had been the Navy's senior officers, whose tours, by comparison, were mostly dreary affairs, a condition made more noticeable when, quote, in the presence of generals, end quote. To compensate for this, the Navy's leaders had allowed the SEALs more latitude than they had their other units a black market trade-off that had produced a steady supply of anecdotes for the Navy and thereby, quote, saved the pride of the admirals, end quote. That's an interesting concept. Mm -hmm. Like the, the, the admirals wanted something to talk about. <laughs> yeah, right. Ultimately, the author decided the most important factors, factor in the SEAL's infringement was owing to the SEALs themselves and the culture that weighed upon them. Drawn from a notorious selective training program that produced few qualified candidates, the SEALs naturally had had to find a mission that kept casualties low, a circumstance that might have pushed them, like the LERPs or Force Recon Marines, into a reconnaissance role that they had anyone to pass had they had anyone to pass intelligence onto. So you're saying there, look, if you've got a small number of people probably one of the safest missions you can do is, hey, we're gonna go and do reconnaissance where we're not supposed to be seen, we're not supposed to come in contact with the enemy. And and his and Bing West is saying here like, mm, they could have gone in that direction. They could have gone into this reconnaissance role had they had anyone to pass the intelligence to. They hadn't. <laughs> Nor had there been any great pressure from the riverine force to engage in any sort of Green Beret style advisory duty or civic action. So they didn't go in that direction either. They didn't go where Yarborough went. Hey, let's go raise a bunch of, of uh, local guerrillas to fight. Organizational orphans with no larger force to support or control them and possessing, quote, no love or, or admiration for the Vietnamese, end quote. The SEALs had set out into the swamps not to prove themselves. Their training had already done that, said the author, but, quote, because not to go not to go would have been inexcusable to the others they had developed a collective value system which emphasized physical hardiness and courage and they liked to fight <laughs> that's just a beautiful thing so 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 the seals seals didn't have this 
Um, you know, you might talk to an Army Green Beret talking about, hey, I like my little people. You know, the, the SOG guys call them little people. They're, they're forming relationships with the locals. This is a quote. The SEALs had, quote, no love or admiration for the Vietnamese, end quote. <laughs> That's crazy, right? And then, and then just to do that one more, to say that one more time, they weren't doing anything to prove themselves. They were doing it because, but, quote, because not to go would have been inexcusable to the others. They, he's talking about the others, like it's inexcusable. If you don't go, you're not a SEAL. You're not a SEAL. It's inexcusable to the other SEALs. They had developed a collective value system which emphasized physical hardiness and courage, and they liked to fight, end quote. So when the tactics of patrol and and ambush had proved unproductive, nobody, not a SEAL, meaning no blue water superior officer, had ordered them to try something else. They had just done it. It was an exceptional adaptation. The Marine veteran author made a special note to point out that his fellow Marines had failed to mimic and by following the previous logic, for reasons that blamed them for this, a sequence of attribution and blame that, if the preceding pages have proved anything, was not a sufficient explanation. Quote, what strikes me as most remarkable about the SEAL story, the author concluded, is their performance and their ability to learn and adapt in a decentralized, sub-optimizing environment, end quote. Though all true and commendable, it was also an explanation that it considered only the record that came after 1966. Missing was any analysis that probed deeper than that top layer of history whose soil had fertilized this inland evolution. The Army's and Marine Corps' preceding 30 years of whipsawing interest in raids and raiders and the Navy's perennial preoccupation with justifying its worth in offensive combat, a preoccupation that it combined with the Navy's traditional latitude and the UDD's traditional adaptability to create what several unidentified SEALs soon described to a documentary filmmaker as the war's unsung soldier. And, quote, what we consider without question the best troops that the country has. End quote. Both descriptions notable because they didn't use the word sailors. And just short of the Reader's Digest appraisal that had dubbed them the war's, quote, super commandos, by the end, these would be assessments that were next to impossible to dispute. (sighs) You're you're kind to uh, end on. Uh, Bing West report. That was one of the first uh, things I found. I found that at the uh, UDTCL Museum's archives. When I started this book, it was one of the first places I went to do research. And the archives at the UDTCL Museum are a little uh, disorganized. Uh, in some cases, that uh, provides opportunities that you didn't expect. <laughs> and one of those was Bing West report. And I had found it. Uh, I read it uh, when I got it, but I hadn't thought about it. It had, you know, it had provided enough uh, um, kind of food for thought that it just kind of stuck in the back of my head, stuck in the back of my head for at least eight years. And so when I was, you know, nearing the end of the book and I was trying to find a way to, you know, kind of summarize everything that had happened, um, you know, it it suddenly dawned on me, you know, I'll I'll go back to that report. And I knew that it had been written by Francis J. West. I didn't know it was Bing West. (laughs) It's like, oh my gosh, it's Bing West. Like, and I've read, you know, books by Bing West. And not only that, but in a way that, you know, it made this thing even more, like, uh, uh, just strange that it happened. But uh, on one of the last ops that we did in Al Ambar province, we had uh, gotten, uh, my uh, platoon had been ambushed on a, on a rooftop uh, uh, sniper overwatch. And uh, one of our, one of our seals, Mark Robinson, had shot through the through the head. He uh, took a bullet, a seven six two round from a PKM through his right eye, and exited the back of his head. And we were cut off from support. We couldn't get any. I was trying to get aircraft down to support us. They wouldn't come. They wouldn't come because there there was so much, uh, you know, machine gun fire. Uh, and we were trying to. Our, uh, uh, 
get the uh, other seal uh, element to uh, fight to our position and they were they just were uh, they were on foot and trying to get there as quickly as possible so uh, at one point uh, I asked for a you know a, a marine QRF and the marine QRF was separated uh, from us uh, at the FOB by this road that we we called IED Alley we'd never known a vehicle to drive on this road and it had not gotten IED'd and uh, one officer uh, who was there a major he uh, jumps in a Humvee, grabs another Humvee, and they start trucking down the road to, to get to our position. They get to us. They provide cover for the helicopter to get in. Uh, and we, Mark actually you know, it, it walks himself to the helicopter. Uh, remarkably, he's still uh, around. He's a Lake County cop now. And, yeah. uh, um, but what makes this you know, story even more remarkable is that the Marine major who came to our rescue was Owen West, yeah, Bing crazy. West's son. As soon as you started telling that, I knew exactly where the story was going. I was like, this has to be Old West. This has to be a big I mean, It's just incredible. Like the, the, uh, and, and Bing was, you know, the, the fact that Bing wrote this report, <laughs> Bing had this uh, interaction with the SEAL teams in 1968 That's and then crazy. writes this report in 1969. Super I mean, humble report, too. I mean, incredibly it's so humble. super generous. And I, I mean, you have so many opportunities to, you know, draw attention to other things and he doesn't. I mean, he's, he's, he's truly impressed by this organization. What, you know, we, you know, as a, uh, as a sir or as a, as an institution have not done, which I think we should do at every opportunity is recognize the, uh, the influence that all of these other units had on our creation. You know, soldiers, Marines, Rangers, uh, recon, everybody, they've all contributed to, to who we are. In some sense, our history, I think it's, I mean, and especially if you frame it in this way, it's not our history. It is our history, but it's a lens that you can use to, to look at the entire history of American special operations from World War II to Vietnam. Uh, we wouldn't be here without them, and in some ways, they would not have changed into the units, or they wouldn't have uh, permanently created these units had we not set an example for them to also follow. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, it, it, and, and you know, <laughs> the, the thing with Bing West and the, just that humble report that you can, you can, I mean, the Marine Corps is just so professional in so many ways. It reminds me of Dave Burke, who was a Top Gun pilot, F-18 pilot, Marine Corps fighter pilot, um, Ended up being the senior instructor at Top Gun, um, F-35 pilot, F-22, but just a total sure. stud. Um, and he worked with us. He was a fac with us on the ground in the Battle of Ramadi. What's really interesting is, you know, he came from Top Gun. He was the senior instructor at Top Gun. I mean, you, you're not, you're not going to get any more professional of a human being <laughs> as a Marine that is the senior instruction instructor at Top Gun. And I was talking to him about when he came to one of our briefs for the first time. This is where we're in the Battle of Mahdi, we're doing a brief, some kind of an operation. And he was just telling me right away, he was just so impressed with what, with just how the brief was. Just how the brief was. You know, this is young Lieutenant Leif Babin and, and Chief Tony Afratti getting up there and talking about what we're gonna do. Me giving the commander's intent. And like, I remember him telling me that. This was 10 years later, he probably told me that. And just that humility to think, oh, these guys are doing something that is that is squared away and and for Bing to be able to recognize that and write that while the war's still going on um, that's pretty impressive and and you know you say that he he didn't really probe deeper than the layer of history that's prior to 1966 but um I'll tell you what that left plenty of room for you to do just that <laughs> with this book and and this book, which provides so much history, so much information. Um, Thank you. And you know, you know, one thing that is awesome about the Marine Corps, and I've talked about this on this podcast before, and I actually talk a lot about it with clients, because the Marine Corps has an incredibly powerful culture. Uh, I think it might be the strongest culture in the world. A absolutely, I couldn't agree more. I, yeah, I, uh, I, I, I've said it you know time and time again like pound for pound there is no institution like the US Marine Corps their uh, their ability to um, they they require um, much more from everybody from from their uh, their troops than every other branch of service the trade-off though with with that by requiring as much is uh, a level of responsibility that nobody else gets in the military 
and the result is it's initiative and courage. And that initiative and courage is part of it's part of their culture. And if you f- you know, I, I I thought about this for years as I was doing this podcast and interviewing people. And what the Marine Corps has is this culture that is rooted in the stories of their history. And I think that what you've done with this book will strengthen the history of the Frogmen and the SEAL teams, and it'll anchor our culture to a past that is filled with these qualities that we want, these qualities of bravery and heroism and and adaptation and evolution and pride from our successes and humility from our failures. And I think this book connects us with the individuals who paved the way for us that we are lucky enough to be associated with and lucky enough really to call our brothers and make this incredible group of individuals that we call the teams. And it's an outstanding book and I think you've done a real service to the community by writing this book. And anybody, if you're in the SEAL teams, absolutely just order this book immediately. There's an audio book version which is outstanding as well. Get this book, anybody that has any interest in any military history, in the history of all special operations, just get this book. There's so much information in it. It's it's immaculately researched, and I just I couldn't be I couldn't be more impressed with it, man. And I'm look, I feel I feel somewhat bad because I write books basically from my own head, and it feels like I I have a much easier task than you do. Mm-hmm. I don't have to read anything. I just write what I already know or what I lived through. And uh, for you to dive so deep into this, it's just outstanding. And and I think it's it's um a huge a huge a huge service to the teams man thank you so thanks ben echo charles you got anything well i think we covered it you know it's good to see you <laughs> thank you it's nice yeah. to see you again yeah, yeah that's right hey ben um where can we find you i know you got a you got a twitter right is that is that pretty yeah. much your your social media extent uh i have a twitter and an instagram i probably should create uh facebook because i think there's you know a few older people that would yeah like this. I, what's your what's your? I know your Twitter is Ben H Milligan, right? What's your what's your gram? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm new to this, so please bear with me as I'm as I'm getting better. Uh, B Milligan three. B Milligan three. Yeah, I, B Milligan, and then I've got three. I've got three little boys, so that's a uh, okay. Yeah, so. and um. Do you have a website or anything? I looked. No, I, I couldn't don't find have a anything. Website. I mean, I, I mean, I'm not. I'm just like the. Um, <laughs> I'm the most incapable <laughs> person when it comes to social media and promotion. What I always say is the same personality traits that make it possible to write this book are the same personality traits that make it hard to promote it. <laughs> so I, um, I'm doing the best I can. I, I appreciate you bringing me on here. Uh, the, uh, yeah, I couldn't have done this with, without lots of people helping out and including everybody that, you know, came together to you know get this to Admiral McRaven. Um, you know, to to get that uh, that blur from him, and then um, you know, I just couldn't have written it without just uh, uh, my you know the support of all the people around me, including the the three little guys that I wrote this for. So, well, hey man, once again, th- thanks for your thanks for your service in the Navy. Great, thanks for your service <laughs> to the teams. Thanks for doing what you did, um, and and really truly. Uh, Honestly, man, I can't thank you enough for writing this book, and it's it's just it's just an outstanding document. I hope everybody gets it. So much to learn, and so much respect to be paid to the forefathers that brought us to where we are today. Thanks for shining a light on them for us. Thank you. And with that, Ben Milligan has left the building. Uh, Echo Charles, yes, sir. Need to uphold the legacy of the teams <laughs> by getting better. What do you got for us? All right, first, off, first off, side note, me and Ben have history. Mm-hmm. One of the first people that I met in San Diego when I moved here. Yep. Because of a through, connection yep, between Cake Nuts. Through, yep, through, through uh, my Hawaii people, you know, that came to, be, to eventually become SEALs. 
He was one of the first. People he didn't remember you though. Well, at here's all. the thing: we zero. both, zero. We both were no, 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 well, no, no, no. Zero is inaccurate. Zero is inaccurate. He was like looking at me. I was like, I was like, mm, maybe a little something. Then later on the break, yeah, we we reconnected. Yeah. Boom. Once you described exactly the situation, because he didn't remember you. Either way, we're all trying to get better. Which is weird. You know, when someone's got such an eye for detail and yes. he doesn't remember you at all, that's got to hurt a little bit. Yeah, especially I mean, all, all, the, think, <laughs> all the research he's done and like all the stuff that yeah. his brain you is like even, capable you of. You don't even make mustard in didn't his even, brain. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> oh, didn't even Jack. make mustard. Dang, bro. Uh, Either way, we're, we're connected now. We're rough pretty day. much boys again, so it's all good. And, you know, we are trying to get better, as you mentioned. Yep. So, boom, yep. we're over here. We're working we out. Do? We're working out. We're reading. Not as much as Ben, but we, well, most of us, not as much as Ben, but we're trying. Got to stay cognitively and physically in the game and improving ourselves slowly, quickly, whatever. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Through this journey, we need supplementation. Good news, Jocko has supplements. Called Jocko Fuel. First one I'm to talk about is the energy drink. New paradigm. I said it, paradigm. Mm. New era of energy drinks. No longer are we burdened, burdened with the poisons and the aftermath and the price of bad energy drinks. It's all good, all good. Tastes good, gives you the little boost we need and healthy for you. Has electrolytes too, by the way. Which is, is that ever a thing? Electrolytes yeah, and energy? Sometimes you need them. Yeah. Well, no, no, no. To, to have them is a thing, yes. Yeah. But I didn't know. I don't know if other energy drinks have no, electrolytes. The thing is, it doesn't no, even matter. They, they don't fit because there's too much poison in the other ones. Yeah, yeah. The Here's the interesting thing you look at the way the SEAL teams came to fruition, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. There was a gap. There's gaps. And right. some people enter the gap, but then they leave it, right? Yeah. They do that. Mm -hmm. But the SEAL teams are just there. The UDTs are just there. We're staying with it. Yeah. That's sort of like the, this whole situation we're finding ourselves in because right. there is a little gap. Oh, no, everyone wants to make poison because mm -hmm. it sells, put a bunch of sugar in it, put a yeah. bunch of caffeine in it, and just give people poison and don't care. That's the gap. Yeah, it's BS. The gap is like, hey, well, people might actually want something that's healthy. Yeah. And so I've seen now that we win in the gap, there's other people that are trying to get in there, but they don't believe in it. Yeah. So as soon as they realize how expensive it is, how hard it is produced. As soon as they realize that, they just leave the gap. So we're just there, solo operation. Just cruising in the Stand gap. Standing tall, like the damn SEAL teams. This is the freaking SEAL teams of, of drinks right here. <laughs> Jocko Discipline Go. <laughs> yes, yes, that's what's happening. Oh yeah, delivering. And that's the thing, and you know what? Accomplishing I the mission at all costs. I'm not telling anyone to be offended. I'm not saying that. Mm -hmm. In fact, I would never say that. I'm not telling people to be angry. I would never say that. I can't, I can't impose outrage on somebody. That being said, those other entities that created these old school, old era energy drinks, mm -hmm. they're kind of playing on your weekend. They're, they're taking us for fools. They're taking advantage they're of like, humans. Hey, yeah. They're like, hey, hey, this, is ta this tastes real good. You know the guy in the alley, you know, mm -hmm. with the red eyes or whatever. Giving away the crack. Yeah. yeah, yeah, hey, hey, take the, bro, tastes good, tastes good. Can you get a nice, life, nice little boost? Meanwhile, you're like, cool, you buy it, you drink it, you enjoy the whatever you enjoy, and then later on, when that guy's long gone, you're over here paying the price. Yeah. And it's not even like you're a monetary addicted price. To cocaine. Addicted, less healthy, all this stuff. This, and here comes Jocko. Give me something gaps. that's good. Good, finally, finally. There we go. All right, we're on discipline, it. Discipline, go. Mm -hmm. In the can, boom. Uh, yeah, so discipline, and also discipline, the supplement itself. There's powder. Yep. There's capsules as well. Just, you know, you're on the go, whatever. Different yeah. different deployment methods, you know. Also, joint warfare, krill oil. Krill oil, these are for your joints. Vitamin D3 and cold water, this is for your immunity. Milk, additional protein in the form of a dessert. God, it's so good. This will never change. It was so good. The only thing that will Once it hits the lips. evolve so good. with this is new flavors. I hear yeah. about new flavors. Maybe some cookies. I said it. <laughs> I said it. I'm not saying. I'm just saying I said it. Um, also, Jocko White Tea, if you know about that, that's the OG tea that Jocko drinks is in, in, and was and still is into. Yeah. It's good. Probably if you like deadlifting 8,000 pounds, you like that tea. Yeah, yeah, go, they go hand in hand, guaranteed. 100%. And you can get all these things at the energy drinks, wah, wah. Everything else, including but not limited to the energy drinks, jockofuel.com. Yep. If you subscribe to them, if you want them just to come to your house, mm -hmm. like like as reliable as a UDT frogman getting to the beach, yes, if sir. that's how you want your supplements to show up, mm -hmm. just subscribe. Yeah. 
jockofuel.com it'll come and be free shipping by the way because we're up against some some competitors we're up against the imperial japanese army and the nazis sure. <laughs> so we're gonna we're gonna have to sneak in under the radar here yep that's what we're doing i understand fully also vitamin shop you can get the stuff at vitamin shop yep so yeah you just want to pop in, grab something easy money vitamin shop also origin origin usa this is where you can get your American-made stuff. Look, not it's not just printed in America. It is printed in America, but not just printed in America. See what I'm saying? We go all the way back. OG, to the roots. Mm-hmm. The seeds. The seeds of the plant that made the seeds. All, all made and planted, grown, sown in America. Everything. American-made denim. There's some leather in there. A lot of a lot of awesome materials, but you got boots, you got jeans, you got um, jujitsu stuff. Yeah, you got a lot of stuff on there. Jujitsu stuff. I, there's a couple places where they mention that's kind of training was going on back in the day. Yeah, yeah, back there, yeah. like, can you just imagine these guys? Like, hey, we're gonna train you in demolitions, blowing things up, underwater swimming, small boat handling, jujitsu. Yeah. They're doing it all. Yeah. yeah. So get some of that. Also, OriginUSA.com. Pete, Pete busted out some boots at camp. Yeah, hey, look, yeah. I'm not gonna go into it. But those were some, you some like good those, boots. Huh? Yeah, impressive. I don't even really wear that many or boots on that many occasions, but that one was like, that could coerce me into wearing boots. Look at you. As far as coercion goes. Check. Origin, um, OriginUSA.com, by the com. way. Also, Jocko's a store. It's called Jocko's Store, and this is where you can get your discipline equals freedom stuff. Hats, hoodies, shirts. Also good. Also other stuff. There's some good stuff on there. A little development's going on over there. <laughs> Anyway, chocolatestore.com. Look at you like you're on the top secret mission, If bro. you like, like something. You can't get it out of the National Archives, <laughs> what Echo's creating over here. Look it's, at you. It's it's top secret until you go there, then it's like, boom, secret yeah, is revealed. It's real secret, just, but you can go on a website and look yes, at sir. it. Yes, sir. <laughs> Available to everybody. Uh, but hey, of, reveal your new uh, shirt. Oh, yeah? Your shirt locker oh, shirt. Oh, you like them. Yeah. Okay. Because right. so we're making the shirt locker, on YouTube. Right. the shirt locker. If you want a cool T-shirt, that and this is this is what I've leaned toward the whole time is shirts that are kind of tied to the podcast, mm-hmm. and this is one of them right here. The Sea Wolves, nineteen sixty six to nineteen seventy two. By the way, commissioned in combat, decommissioned in combat. That's the Sea Wolves. You heard about them today. If they will go and get the seals out of the worst possible situations, gunfire. Don't care. True. So, how do you get that shirt, shirt locker? Yes. What's up? The 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 one of the homages to the Sea Wolves. Yeah, very much so. Oh, you can get this at the shirt locker on Jocko Store. Uh, so yeah, you sign up for the shirt locker, you get a cool shirt. Cool. It's hard for me to explain how cool it is. Varying levels of creativity. Either way, it's a cool shirt. You get one every month. Free shipping on that one as well. This is just one of them. Mm-hmm. I got a new feature that we're working on. It should be done. should be done within the next, I don't know. But if you remember the shirt locker, hey, you, look, you missed a shirt last month, five months ago, whatever. You'll have the option to get it if you remember. Oh. Yeah, we're working on that one. Nonetheless, yes. Very nice this of you. This is a shirt. I'm glad you like it, Jocko. Uh, seems, you know, people seem to like the designs overall. Well, yeah. you know, this is just one of them. So, yeah, Jocko I, store. I bet people like that one a lot. I, because I, I like that one a lot. Well, because yeah. I'm a supporter of the Sea Wolves. Yeah, yeah. Scramble the Sea Wolves. Hey, subscribe also to this podcast. We also have some other podcasts unraveling that I do with my brother DC Daryl Cooper. We got the Grounded Podcast. We got the Warrior Kid Podcast. We also have JockoUnderground.com, which we release a little. Uh, what's it called? A little alternative podcast, a little complimentary podcast where we talk about some other adjacent items Mm -hmm. and uh, we do some Q&A and the reason we have that is in case these platforms which we do not control which we don't like we want to be in control so that we can deliver and if people start inserting advertisements into this podcast we we know you don't want that we don't want it Mm. we'd rather have you listen to a 74 minute advertisement at the end where Echo (laughs) Charles is talking (laughs) hey $8.18 $8.18 a month if you want to help us out with the Jocko Underground. Go to JockoUnderground.com. If you can't afford it, no factor. We're, we, we, we're in this together. Email assistance at JockoUnderground.com. We also have a YouTube channel. Subscribe to that. We make awesome videos where I am the assistant director and really the driving sort of creative force behind the awesomeness of most of the videos. And then Echo does some editing for it. <laughs> Red, you're doing great work. Thank you. Origin USA also. Origin USA. Cool uh, uh, 
channel, YouTube channel. Oh yeah, fully. Yeah, that's a good one. If you're interested in in an American company, their ups and downs, mm. challenges, successes. Yeah, that's a really good one. Really the good whole one. nine yards. Yep. Also, psychological warfare. What that is is an album with Jocko tracks on it. Tracks on the album of Jocko talking, give, getting us through our moments of weakness, which we may or may not have. You know, either way, you can get that uh, anywhere where you can get MP3s. Psychological warfare. It's a good one. If you want something to hang on your wall. Which you probably do. You don't just want to have walls that are just plain and black. You do. Well, I guess right? I do. But yeah. if I didn't, <laughs> then I would go to flipsidecanvas.com and I would get some cool stuff from my brother Dakota Meyer, who makes awesome stuff to hang on your wall. Got a bunch of books. Look, this book today, By Water Beneath the Walls by Ben Milligan. This is an outstanding book. It is an outstanding book. I, I can't, I don't know what else to tell you. Get this book. It's so good, so much information, so much history. If you have any interest, if you listen to this podcast, let me put it this way, if you listen to this podcast, you will freaking love this book. I love this book, it is awesome, get it. The It's just an outstanding. Um, also have Final Spin coming out. This is a novel, apparently, allegedly, possibly a novel written by me. It's a story, it's available now for pre-order. You want to get that first edition. I have people coming up to me now. They're they're apologetic because they're bringing me second edition of discipline equals freedom. They're bringing second edition of leadership strategy tactics. Brutal. Don't you don't want to be that person. You don't have that 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 sort of sunken look on your face. Mm-hmm. You want to say I'm in the game. Mm-hmm. Hey, we have a little connection. You got that first edition. We have a little connection. Mm-hmm. I'm not I'm not saying don't talk to me if you have a second edition, a third edition. It's okay. Mm-hmm. Look, I have an open mind. But if you want to. If you want to have that immediate connection, let's get that going. Leadership strategy and tactics field manual. The code, the evaluation, the protocols. Discipline equals freedom field manual. Way of the Warrior Kid 1, 2, 3, and 4. Mikey and the Dragons. About Face by Hackworth. Almost brought that up today. I almost brought that up today. But, you know, once you open that door, who knows when you're stopping. Because he's got, now that I think about it, he. I didn't even mention this. He's got it in here. What? Hackworth. Hackworth Hackworth was running the Tiger Force. Mm. I can't believe I didn't bring that up. I'm sorry, Ben. I I missed all. There's so much. Think about how much information is in there that I didn't bring up Hackworth. That's crazy. That's crazy. So he's got Hackworth, Tiger Force. What happened to them? Why did they come about? How did they do? Why did they get turned off? There's a whole story behind it. Once again, that's that's by water beneath the walls by Ben Milligan uh, about face. I wrote the forward to the newest version of that. We got extreme ownership and the dichotomy of leadership. I have a leadership consulting company called Echelon Front. We solve problems through leadership. Go to echelonfront.com for details on that. That's where you can find out about the muster, the field training exercises, EF Battlefield. We have a an event coming up in Las Vegas, October 28th and 29th. It's called the muster. Come and get it. We also have the FTX field training exercise. That's happening. Next one is in St. Louis, September 20th and 21st. Probably close to sold out. I think we had a group of people that couldn't make it, so there might be some openings. Check it out. Go to go to echelonfront.com. We also have online training, an online leadership training academy. You need to go to the gym to stay in shape. You need to go to extremeownership.com to keep your leadership in shape. Come and check it out. If you want to help service members, active and retired, their families, Gold Star families, check out Mark Lee's mom, Mama Lee. She's got a charity organization. She does all kinds of incredible things for veterans. And if you want to donate or you want to get involved, go to americasmightywarriors.org. And if you want any more of my monotonous, monotony, monotone, or you need more of Echo's mystified murmurs, You can find us on the interwebs, on Twitter, on the gram, and on Facebook. Echo is at Echo Charles, and I am at Jocko Willink. And Ben Milligan is on Twitter at Ben H. Milligan. And his Instagram is, what was it, Ben Mill 3? I don't know. Ben. Listen, rewind it. It's B Milligan 3. B Milligan 3. There you go. M I L L I G A N. Again, thanks once again to Ben for your service in the Navy, your service in the teams, and now your incredible service to the teams. 
by writing this incredible book that will solidify our roots, our culture, and our history. Can't thank you enough. And to all the military personnel out there on the front lines right now, thank you for defending our freedom and our way of life. And to police and law enforcement, firefighters, paramedics, and EMTs, dispatchers, correctional officers, border patrol, secret service, and all first responders, thanks for keeping us safe here at home. And to everyone else out there, how about we all take a little lesson from these frogmen? How about we develop and embrace a collective value system that emphasizes physical hardiness and courage, an attitude that can press on through pain and suffering, a humble intellect that can adapt and overcome, a discipline that's unbreakable, and an unwavering commitment to accomplish the mission. That is the way of the frogmen. That is an ideal example to follow and the one that I wake up and face every day to hold the line. And until next time, this is Echo and Jocko, out.